Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, to the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. I'll just take care of housekeeping before I make a brief statement. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr. President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I've got a brief statement. Senators, 50 years ago today, the Senate established a committee system that forever changed the role and work of senators in the Senate and the parliament itself. On the 11th of June 1970, after five hours of debate, the Senate adopted two important resolutions. One established legislative and general purpose standing committees to inquire into government activity and legislation in seven subject areas. The other established five estimates committees to examine government spending. The change in the work of the Senate was immediate and dramatic. Senate committees had produced around 120 reports in the 69 years prior to the change, and more than 5,500 reports in the 50 years since. Public hearings in the same period increased from 500 prior to the change to over 7,000 since. Through its committee work, the Senate became a force for inquiry and scrutiny in a way that was scarcely imagined in 1970, dare I say even in 1901 and in ways that reinforce the uniqueness of this chamber across the Westminster world. I have previously said that this chamber is the private legislative actor in the nation, with a direct mandate from the people, constitutional authority to press its case, and an electoral system that ensures the diverse voices across this nation are heard. But a substantial part of this standing is the direct result of the committee system that has operated over the last five decades and that brings these institutional features to life. I am pleased to inform the Senate that later in the year, the 50th anniversary will be marked by the launch of new website resources to visualise the work of the more than 250 Senate committees established since 1901. These will explore the history and achievements of committees and chart thousands of committee hearings in hundreds of locations around Australia. The launch will provide all of us with an opportunity to reflect upon and celebrate the work of the Senate's committees, and I look forward to providing further detail about that event in coming months. Finally, I cannot mention this anniversary without acknowledging the work of the staff of the Senate, and particularly those from various functions who have supported the work of Senate committees over the decades. The work we do as Senators is built upon these foundations and the support we have received from the thousands of staff who have worked here over the last 50 years. So on behalf of all Senators, to all the staff over the years led by all the clerks, thank you. I thank Senators. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr. President, and I seek leave to make a short statement in relation to, in, in response to your statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I thank the Senate, Mr. President. I rise to associate uh, the opposition with your reflections on this moment in our history, and I particularly note your remarks about staff, opposition senators, to greatly appreciate the skill and the diligence and the professionalism of the staff who assist us in our work, and we note that. On very many occasions, they are significantly more qualified than we are in, in so many domains, and they assist us humbly, and we are so very grateful for their contribution. The system of standing and estimates committees that was established on this day in 1970 has helped establish the Senate as a significant place for scrutiny and review. It's a signal achievement in the history of our chamber and of parliamentary democracy in this country. The arrangements that have evolved over the last 50 years and changed, but fundamentally the Senate's ability to hold governments to account would not be possible without this system. It is hard to believe, but prior to 1970 only three bills had ever been referred to committees, 
And Mr. President, I was reading through the Hansard uh, for how this debate commenced, and there are of course two motions that were adopted: a government motion moved by Senator Anderson and a Labor motion moved by Senator Murphy. And Murphy noted at the time that there was no copyright on the proposals to set up standing committees in a legislature, acknowledging the role of all contributors at that time. But as a Labor senator from New South Wales and a Labor senator from the progressive tradition that Murphy hailed from, I am of course particularly interested in his contribution, and he applied his customary energy and intellect to the task of reforming the Senate. And in introducing the motion that established the standing committees, he said, there is a demand for improved performance all over the world. It may be manifested in some places in riots, in demonstrations and in other ways in a less violent manner. But a demand for institutions such as ours to carry out their work efficiently is becoming apparent. And there is something about that contribution that speaks to our time also. A recognition that parliamentary chambers must hold ourselves to the highest standards must give voice to the highest aspirations of all of our people and always conduct ourselves with energy, dignity and a clear sense of democratic purpose. Mr President, I thank you for drawing this occasion to the Senate's attention and I look forward to the celebrations that you foreshadowed. Thank you. Senator Seward. Likewise, seek leave to make a short statement about the committees. Leave is granted. Senator Seward. On behalf of the Greens, I'd like to uh, add our name to support for the committee system. Um, it is uh, a system that people probably in this place will know that I have been uh, also very heavily involved with and chair one of those committees. And I'd like to also uh, support, particularly also uh, call out and support uh, the secretariat staff of all the committees. They are work. They just work and work and work. They never say no. Maybe sometimes they should learn to say no. Um, they, are, they are just uh, fantastic supports, endlessly polite, endlessly polite with our endless uh, requests. Um, I'd also like to note the outcomes of those Senate inquiries. Um, and of course, I know the ones that, that the most re the recent ones, but they have actually the committee inquiries have very significant outcomes. Not only do they expose uh, things sometimes, they also enable the community to become part of this place, and that's why I think they're so important. They allow the community to comment on legislation. They look at legislation. Um, drill down into legislation, enable community and the, uh, and the, uh, the broader Australia to comment and, and see how this place operates and comment on what we do, and in particular the reference committees, which are where the community really get to participate. They actually get to suggest things to us. Why don't you inquire into this? So that is, that is such an important role of committees. But when you think about the committee reports that have led to the apologies to forgotten Australians. The, for, the apologies to, f, for, to the, those that are affected by forced adoptions. And that's just two things that I immediately think of and spring to mind, but there's been many, many more. It is a vital part of what we do in this place. So thank you, uh, President, for reminding us of this anniversary. It's something that I think continues uh, as part of the work of this place. It's a vital part of the work of this place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Senator Seward. Uh, well, we will move on. I will call on the clerk to call on business. Government business order of the day number one, paid parental leave amendment, flexibility measures bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate and on the amendment moved by Senator Pratt. Senator Rennick, I believe you're in continuation. Thanks, uh, President. No. Senator okay. Rennick. The importance of making leave available for parents after the arrival of a child is well known, contributing to the health and well-being of mothers, babies and the stability of families. A 2016 Ernest & Young study of more than 1,500 employers showed that over 80 per cent of companies that offered paid parental leave reported a positive effect in employee morale and over 70 per cent reported a boost in productivity. If employees are happy with their work and home balance, then they are more likely to be satisfied at work, positively affecting their productivity. Under the current PPL system, 
the primary caregiver is given 18 weeks of, paid per, of parental leave paid in a continuous block within 12 months of the birth or adoption of a child. This bill seeks to amend existing legislation by allowing mothers or primary caregivers to split the 18-week leave block to better suit their situation. This reform will mean that the first 12 weeks of the PLP will remain as a continuous block within the first year, while the remaining six weeks can then be used at any time up until the child turns two. The purpose of the bill is to provide wider and more convenient options for families so that the PPL scheme can best meet their needs. This amendment will help women who are self-employed or small business owners who cannot afford to be off work for such an extended period as their 18 consecutive weeks. With the legislation as it now stands, women and primary carers who must return to work effectively lose the balance of their entitlement. With the support of the Senate and the passage of this bill, parents, and more particularly women, will retain their full PPL entitlement and be able to finally tailor, tailor their leave to fit their personal circumstances. Primary carers have a balance of up to six weeks, which, based on a five-day working week, equates to 30 workdays, to use as they wish after the initial 12-week block. For example, if a woman works from home running her own business and has a baby under the current legislation, she is entitled to paid parental leave, which she must take in a continuous 18-week block. During this time, the woman cannot return to work and run her business, or she will forfeit her remaining PLP. However, for women in this situation, being away from their business for such a long time has the potential to cause serious financial damage. Income and clients can be lost as well as valuable momentum, especially if, if the business in its infancy has not yet started turning a profit. If the women wanted to do any work to keep the business going, she wouldn't be able to do so without losing the remainder of her PLP. The new bill does away with some of this rigidity and, rigidity and will allow mothers to go back to work after 12 weeks while they retain the option of claiming a further six weeks later. They therefore have the flexibility of using the remaining six weeks as best suits them in their situation. Some may choose to take their leave over Christmas New Year period when many businesses slow down, while others may prefer to spend out, spread out their leave, taking regular breaks while they continue to manage their work commitments. As for employed women, the flexible leave can help support a more gradual return to work. Since paid parental leave is dispensed by the employer, employees can negotiate with their employer to work part-time. This could operate as an effective three-day working week by receiving PLP for the remaining two days. Alternatively, some women may also choose to use the six weeks immediately after the initial 12 making it 18 consecutive weeks of PPL as before. However, the leave is used. The point is that there is now flexibility of choice for women to make a personal decision about what is best for them and their family. It is anticipated that this reform will help ensure greater economic independence and improved career development as key aims of the Women's Economic Security Statement. The bill will also make it easier for mothers to transfer their leave to eligible partners who become primary carers, thereby encouraging the sharing of parental duties with fathers and secondary carers. This could lend itself to a shift in social norms whereby fathers take on a more active role in child rearing, giving both parents more opportunity to balance their work and home lives better to suit their situation. And as a stay-at-home father, I can thoroughly recommend it to all fathers who are thinking about staying home to take that option up. This bill makes a very worthwhile amendment to an important piece of legislation to support self-starting women to have the same advantages as those conveniently employed. It allows the government to help support women so they don't have to miss out on either a family or a career. 
Approximately 4,000 parents are anticipated to use the new flexible leave provisions, where currently around 2,300 mothers fail to use their full PPL entitlement before returning to work, in most cases simply because they couldn't afford it. This bill will ensure that women's employment, businesses and careers will be more secure and productive, leading to better outcomes for them, for them, their families and, in turn, the nation. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Walsh from the lectern. Thank you, Deputy President. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak on this bill and the subject of paid parental leave. Uh, it's an area that Australia could and should be doing a lot better in, particularly when you compare us to similar uh, other OECD countries. And of course, up until the introduction of the paid parental leave scheme by the Gillard Labor government in 2011, Australia was one of only two OECD countries that did not have a paid parental leave scheme, the other country being the United States. And while the scheme isn't perfect, 150,000 parents a year uh, do benefit from it. Nearly half of all new mothers benefit from the scheme. And this has allowed improvements when it comes to enabling women to continue to participate in the workforce, enhancing the health of birth mothers and children, and also critically in promoting equality between women and men. However, it's important to note that we do still have further to go on all of these. The flexibility measures that we're talking about today will hopefully go some way to improve uh, these indicators even further. Those flexibility measures, uh, this bill, will change the paid parental leave rules by splitting the 18 weeks of public paid parental leave uh, into a 12-week paid parental leave period and a six-week flexible paid parental leave period. The 12-week period will still have to be taken as a continuous block, uh, but will now be accessible by the primary carer at any time during the first 12 months. Uh, and right now it has to be taken immediately after the birth or adoption of a child. Uh, and the six-week flexible paid parental leave period will be able to be taken at any time during the first two years and doesn't need to be taken as a continuous block. So that's going to allow families to split their entitlements over a two-year period uh, with periods of work in between. Um, the changes are, are, are modest. Um, but they will hopefully allow parents more flexibility when it comes to sharing parenting responsibilities uh, in a way that works for them. Parents will now be able to use the leave when it suits them most, um, rather than it being entirely prescribed. Uh, now, in practice, the most likely use of this new flexibility um, will be parents spreading the new flexible paid parental leave period over a number of months to allow them to return to work uh, part-time. Uh, and while these changes are really positive, um, they, are, they are modest. They don't increase paid parental leave entitlements for families. Uh, and we do need to look at both the quantity and the quality of support that we're providing new parents in this country. Uh, because when compared with other OECD countries, we are uh, starting to fall behind. And unfortunately, um, the bill doesn't do anything to address that or change that. Um, for example, other countries are, are quickly increasing the support that they provide to fathers uh, and to partners, um, both to encourage them to spend more time uh, at home during a child's early years and to increase the flexibility for families as well. So again, this bill does provide more flexibility, but it's a small step and there are plenty of issues uh, that it doesn't solve that we as a parliament need to think about in the context of paid parental leave. Uh, and one of those critical issues is the persistent gender pay gap in this country. Um, female workers in Australia earn on average 14 per cent less than their male colleagues, um, which is an extraordinary figure um, to, to be citing in 2020. Uh, and this has been persistent over the last two decades. Uh, and the changes, the narrowing of that gender pay gap have been uh, really minor. Paid parental leave and providing families with flexibility uh, is a major factor in addressing the gender pay gap. Um, but you know, it's not enough on its own. With the current COVID-19 crisis ongoing, we're currently relying uh, on so many female-dominated industries to keep us safe and healthy. 
uh, our medical hospital and allied health workers, our social carers, aged carers and disability carers, and of course our early childhood educators who've done uh, such a heroic job over the past few months um, of continuing to go to work every day to care for and educate future generations and keep Australia at work. On average, um, all of these groups of workers are significantly paid less than their male uh, colleagues uh, in other sectors and indeed uh, within the same sectors. In healthcare services, the gender pay gap is a whopping 32 per cent. So these essential workers need a lot more than just our thanks at this time. What they really need is recognition in their pay packets uh, and the ability the ability to progress their careers with the respect and the recognition that they deserve. Paid parental leave is an important part of this. Uh, it's also an important part of the discussion around workforce participation and ensuring that women stay in the workforce uh, and in these critical industries. Something that my friend and colleague, the Federal Member for Bendigo, has raised, and certainly um, a pressing issue right now that needs addressing in terms of paid parental leave, uh, are those parents that could miss out due to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, because to be eligible for paid parental leave, you must have worked an average of one day a week for 10 of the last uh, 13 months. But right now across the country there are thousands of thousands of workers, and we know lots of them are women, who have been stood down from their jobs or had their industry shut down. And if they're stood down for too long, there's a chance that they'll miss out uh, on paid parental leave. Uh, and if that family loses both paid parental leave and dad and partner pay, um, they could be really significantly uh, in trouble. The government's suggestion that affected families should apply for other forms of income support, such as JobKeeper, um, is just not the right solution at this time. The last thing that any new parent wants is to have to worry about how much money they have in their bank account. Uh, so I'd like to take the opportunity to urge the government to address that issue um, as fast as possible so that new parents don't miss out. Um, so this bill that we're talking about today, uh, in conclusion, is a step in the right direction. Uh, it's small, it's, it's modest, but it's definitely in the right direction and it's going to benefit families by providing more flexible access to the paid parental leave scheme. By splitting up the 18 weeks of paid parental leave into a 12-week period and a six-week flexible paid parental leave period, families will be able to use their entitlements in a way um, that is more tailored to them and that suits them. So I hope the parliament continues to engage in a discussion about how to address some of the issues um, that I've spoken about today and that as others have spoken about, including the persistent gender pay gap and recognising our essential female workers uh, and also improving uh, the workplace participation of women into the future. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. <clears throat> I rise today to speak on the Pay Parental Leave Amendment Flexibility Measures Bill 2020. As Chair of the Senate Standing Legislation Committee on Community Affairs, I am pleased to make a contribution to this discussion on paid parental leave. This bill expands on the safety net already in place for working families with the Pay Parental Leave Scheme, but it makes it more flexible and therefore better. It means families are able to enjoy that special time in the first months of a child's life without having money worries. This is time our new parents deserve to enjoy with their newest family member. It may be hard to believe, but it's 32 years since I first took what was then known as maternity leave. In fact, 32 years ago today, I was at home looking after my first child, my son, who would at that time have been about six weeks old. Those first few months with your child, adapting to a new daily structure, bonding with them, loving and caring for them, and also experiencing the weight of responsibility of another human being to look after, are all very special, precious moments. I acknowledge that when I had my family, I was fortunate to work in a bank that was ahead of its time and offered staff paid maternity leave, combined with the opportunity to take additional unpaid leave for up to 12 months as well. I also had flexibility and was able to take leave, um, but returned to work on a part-time basis after about the 10-month period, and then later gave birth to my daughter only 16 months after my son was born. But once again, I was able to take that maternity leave and enjoy the precious time at home with both my children. 
Many others in the community at that time were not as fortunate. They had to use up their leave entitlements, take unpaid leave and in many cases simply resign when they decided they wanted to have a family. And even in the banking industry, if you were a man wanting to take paternity leave, <coughs> excuse me, you were offered just two weeks off. How things have changed, and definitely for the better. On the 6th of February 2020, the House of Representatives introduced the Paid Parental Leave Amendment, Flexibility Measures Bill 2020 to Parliament. It was referred to the Senate Standing Legislation Committee on the same day, and the committee tabled its report on the 19th of March, recommending that the bill be passed. The bill was introduced to the Senate on the 25th of February. In its report, the committee noted the clear and widespread support for the measures proposed in the bill. Submitters to the inquiry emphasising the positive impact the bill will have on the range of options available to working parents accessing paid parental leave and the flow-on consequences of this for women's workforce participation. The Paid Parental Leave Amendment Bill builds on the amendments made to the Paid Parental Leave Act 2010 by the Paid Parental Leave Amendment Work Test Act 2019. It also introduces additional key aspects of the Women's Economic Security Package, which were previously announced in the 2018-19 Mid-Year Economic and Fiscal Outlook. The Women's Economic Security Package measures have three key areas of focus improving women's workforce participation, economic independence and earning potential. The focus of the Paid Parental Leave Amendment Flexibility Measures Bill is to increase women's workforce participation and provide more options to families accessing parental leave pay. The latest statistics from the Australian Bureau of Statistics show there were more than 315,000 registered births in Australia in 2018. The median age for mothers is 31.4 years and 33.5 years for fathers. Considering the ABS also found the proportion of families with children younger than five, where both parents work full-time, rose to 21 per cent in the past decade. We can see working families are becoming increasingly more common. The Pay Parental Leave Scheme provides eligible working parents with 18 weeks of, of payment at a rate based on the national minimum wage, which is currently $740.60 per week. This equates to a total of $13,330.80 over 18 weeks. This bill is all about increasing flexibility for new parents, which will help those working families bond in the early weeks. We need to be able to balance the health and wellbeing needs of new parents and babies with meaningful workforce participation. Changes to the Paid Parental Leave Scheme aim to give mothers and primary caregivers the flexibility to split their 18 weeks maximum parental leave pay entitlement over a two-year period after an initial 12-week block is taken in the first year. When the Women's Economic Security Statement was announced in November 2018 by the then Minister for Women, the Hon. Kelly O'Dwyer, $119 million in funding was committed to improving women's workforce participation, economic independence and earning potential. Changes to the Paid Parental Leave Scheme were included in this announcement. Schedule 1 of this bill seeks to make amendments to the Paid Parental Leave Scheme so families can access their parental leave pay in a way that suits them. As it stands now, parental leave pay can only be taken as a continuous 18-week block within the first 12 months after the child's birth or adoption. However, the families of children born or adopted once the bill comes into effect will be able to split their parental leave pay into blocks of leave taken over a two-year period. This flexible plan allows for periods of work in between leave. The changes proposed in this bill mean parents can use an initial 12-week block of their entitlement any time within the first 12 months after the birth or adoption of their child before returning to work. This all-important time gives parents time to recuperate immediately following birth or adoption and supports health benefits for the child. It also allows time to settle into a routine and bond as a family in those first months. This initial time frame is called the paid parental leave period and the rules relating to this block are the same as the current 18-week period. Parents will be able to take the remaining entitlement of up to six weeks any time before the child turns two years old and can return to work any time during this period. These periods combined still total 18 weeks, which is the same time currently allowed but allows for greater flexibility. This second type of leave is called flexible paid parental leave. 
While we anticipate many families will claim their 30 flexible paid parental leave days straight after their 12-week period ends, we know others might want to use their flexible leave to support a gradual return to work. For example, a new mother might want to return to work at reduced hours after her initial 12-week paid parental leave has been used. The mother could return to work part-time at three days a week and apply for the remaining two days to be paid as flexible paid parental leave for 15 weeks. Families will be able to use their paid parental leave flexibly to support whichever approach works best for them. Of course, increased flexibility for claimants means it could work differently for employers, but the scheme will not create an additional or unnecessary regulatory burden for employers. The paid parental leave scheme is fully funded by the Australian government, not by employers. This is consistent with the current scheme. Eligibility criteria for paid parental leave and accessing flexible leave are generally the same. That is, the person must be on leave or not working, be the primary carer of the child, meet residency requirements and not be in a newly arrived residence waiting period. However, unlike during the initial paid parental leave period, parents and others will not lose eligibility to claim parental leave pay during the flexible leave period if they don't meet the eligibility criteria on days when they are not claiming payment. That is, days when they return to work or if they stop being the primary carer of the day, for a day. This scheme will start operating from 1 July 2020 and will be applicable to children born or adopted on or after that date. Children born or adopted before this date will be assessed under the current paid parental leave scheme and receive their entitlements in a continuous 18-week block. Parents are only eligible to claim parental leave pay on days they are on leave or not at work. In many instances, employees take a period of unpaid parental leave under the Fair Work Act 2009 during the period they are claiming parental leave pay. Eligible employees are entitled to take up to 12 months of unpaid parental leave associated with the birth or adoption of a child, but generally this leave is taken in a single continuous period and starts no later than the birth or adoption of the child. Under the existing framework, once an employee returns to work, they usually forfeit any remaining untaken, unpaid parental leave. These changes will help thousands of new parents, many of whom are now returning to work before they have used all, their, all of their parental leave pay. Each year, approximately 2,300 people access only a portion of their parental leave pay before returning to work. While this means they are losing valuable time with their child at a formative time, it also means makes them ineligible to receive further parental leave pay for that child. A primary carer can return to work earlier after the child's birth or adoption without compromising their overall entitlement to parental leave pay under this bill. We anticipate these changes will particularly support self-employed women and small business owners who cannot afford to leave their businesses for 18 consecutive weeks. For example, they can take their 12-week block of leave and then choose to take the remaining six weeks of entitlement at a time that suits their personal and business needs, such as at a quiet time for their business, like over the Christmas and New Year period, or during an off-peak season for specific industries. This change reflects the range of working demands and personal preferences that women may have in relation to their return to work after giving birth, or a primary carer may have caring for a child. The increased flexibility will also make it easier for mothers who are eligible for parental leave pay to transfer their entitlement to eligible partners who take on the role of primary carer where it suits the family's circumstances. The proposed changes to parental leave pay will give parents more choice, allowing them to tailor their payments to meet their family's needs and situation. In addition, in increasing the flexibility of parental leave pay could lead to a greater uptake of leave by secondary carers. This contributes to changing Australia's social norms around sharing care of children and encouraging men to take parental leave. It is anticipated that around 4,000 parents will choose to take their parental leave pay flexibly each year. As the Liberal member for McKellar, Jason Falinski, told the House of Representatives in February this year, the time between a parent and their child is sacred and this government will always fight to enhance that time. Research is now becoming more and more definitive that time parents spend with their children and children's improved developmental markers are highly correlated. As the nature of work changes, our legislation also needs to change. And on the same day, the Liberal member for Reid, Dr Fiona Martin, said, the value of the family unit remains central to the wellbeing of society. 
Dr Martin went on to tell the House of Representatives that supporting Australian families by empowering them through choice and flexibility strengthens the fabric of Australia as a whole. Making the paid parental leave scheme more flexible means families will have more choice. Parents can tailor their families to their families' needs and circumstances. This bill allows families to make the choice that best suits their financial and social needs. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Senator Askew. Uh, Senator O'Neill at the lectern. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the uh, Paid Parental Leave Amendment Flexibility Measures Bill of 2020. Um, and in my short contribution, I will acknowledge that this bill is an important step forward for the economic empowerment of women, as well as families who want to spend more time with their newborn children. Um, but I do want to recount a story just from uh, my time with my own family over the weekend. Uh, happily, I was able to see my mother on my birthday, which is not a common experience. And I uh, also got to spend the weekend with my own children. And uh, one of my daughters uh, spoke to me about uh, a conversation that she overheard with a young mum who, who was very judgmental about other women who were returning to work after six months paid leave. And I really hope that we are able to leave those judgments and attitudes behind. Um, raising a family, I believe, is the greatest work of my life and the greatest joy of my life. Uh, but um, 28 years ago, when I went back to work for six months uh, after the birth of my first child, let me tell you, it was a choice that involved a much uh, negative judgment from many people. I'm pleased to say that um, we still have a great mother-daughter bond, and we actually have pretty good father-daughter bonds as well. So this bill is important in the context of that changing discussion over the decades about what it is to be a great family, to be a great parent, whether you're a mum or you're a dad or part of the extended family, indeed part of the community that raises great children for um, your own personal satisfaction as a human being, but also ultimately for the benefit of the society and the community in which we live. Uh, that is why uh, the flexibility measures part of this bill is actually a really important part. Uh, the bill will indeed introduce far greater flexibility for parents looking to take time off to care for their newborn or their newly adopted child, and will also allow the role of the primary carer to change as well as allowing them to access six weeks of leave to be taken at any time in the first two years of a child's life. And this will approximately, uh, well, the estimations are that this should help about 4,000 parents per annum. Uh, the specifics of the bill uh, change the paid parental leave rules, and they do so in three critical ways. Firstly, they split the bill, split the 18 week period of public paid leave into a 12 week paid parental leave period and a six week flexible paid parental leave period. The 12 week paid parental leave period entitlement will only be available as a continuous block, but would also be accessible by the primary carer at any time during the first 12 months, not only immediately after the birth or adoption of a child. And given the complexity of people's lives and the variety of ways in which families manage, uh, families in business, families in uh, uncertain employment, families in between houses, families managing sickness across their family. All of those complex lived realities need a system that meets the messiness of life. And this is an important change that will help. The six week flexible, period, flexible paid parental leave period will be available at any time during the first two years and does not need to be taken as a block. And I can just imagine, um, you know, if I were to roll back 28 years and to have that sense of time available to help me manage uh, return to work and looking after uh, our daughter and sharing that responsibility with my husband more flexibly, flexibly, we would have had an even better time being parents than we already did. The bill attempts to make Australia's paid parental leave scheme, which is among the least generous in the OECD, somewhat more equitable. In 2010, Labor introduced Australia's first paid parental leave scheme. Till that point, we were one of only two countries in the OECD, the other being the United States, who didn't have one. 
And it's important to remember that, an important achievement by a Labor government led by Julia Gillard to make sure that we ended up with some access to paid parental leave. Under the Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison governments, that scheme was not removed, but it did stagnate. Um, apart from Mr Abbott's wildly extravagant thought bubble that he carried for five years and then dropped, there has been no real sign of change under this government, which is now in its third term. Australia today still has one of the lowest rates of investment in parental leave, and that stands at just one third of the OECD average investment in parental leave. Sadly, uh, despite the improvements that this bill will bring into play, the OECD uh, rankings show that we are still one of the lowest with regarding the length of parental leave, with 18 weeks being our maximum, as opposed to the average of 55 in other jurisdictions. And in that, uh, our system provides a flat rate instead of a wage subsidy like most developed nations. Um, given the significant changes uh, that Australians have undergone in recent times in the context of COVID-19, the understanding of a wage subsidy, no doubt, will be something that people understand in a very different way now than they did uh, before uh, the, the, the calendar turned into 2020. And hopefully this government might see further reform in this area as part of their agenda. Australian workers on average receive less than half the average wage as a result of our scheme. Experts have described it as a welfare subsidy for new parents rather than as an economic comp compensation for foregone income. A paid parental leave scheme is meant to be fit for purpose as it's a complex and incredibly important reform for the first iteration to have not received a significant update for, 20, for, for 10 years. So between 2010 and, and 2020, 10 years of no reform in this space is really a blight on our nation's uh, advancement with regard to how we support parents and families. Nearly half of all new mothers benefit from the paid parental scheme, um, almost 150,000 new parents in total. And we are clearly slipping behind comparable nations, and it's the working families of Australia that are suffering. Currently, the scheme remains to a degree inflexible and out of step with modern work and home practices. The bill, as it's drafted, will allow some tangible flexibility for those families in terms of when and who takes that leave, but it still leaves the rate of pay unchanged. Once again, I remind people listening to this debate that the pandemic has shown us that work can indeed be more flexible and that it can be uh, highly productive to work remotely. And this bill is actually a, a timely connector with that growing reality. The bill doesn't do anything to change another critical uh, element of Australian life that needs review, and that is the ongoing wound, the festering sore of the gender pay gap in Australia. Nor does it do anything to address the way in which women's work is remunerated in Australia. The best thing this government could do to address this would be to reverse the penalty cuts that it waved through. These cuts disproportionately affected uh, heavily female workforces, and indeed they have exacerbated the pay gap. It's appalling in this day and age that women in Australia still earn only 86 per cent of the same pay as men, and reforms of the paid parental scheme should take this glaring problem into account. These uh, acting deputy president are not normal times. There has never been a more crucial time for this government to focus on the economic and practical needs of women. Last month's ABS jobs data highlighted the detrimental effect the COVID-19 crisis has had on women with regard to the scale of job loss. On top of that, women are overrepresented in jobs affected by the ongoing need for social distancing, such as in the retail and hospitality trades, and in high rate and the high rate of casual employment that is a phenomenon in those sectors. 
Now, the federal government is ending its fee-free childcare relief package on the 12th of July, and childcare centres will lose access to the JobKeeper wage subsidies. This decision by the government absolutely impacts families, families with new babies that this legislation is seeking to support. And this is the anomaly that, that, that is this uh, government taking with one hand, trying to give with the other, and it's hard for people to keep up with which government they've got in, in place today, one that's looking to help them or one that's going out to hurt them with things like robo-debt and the removal of subsidies that they promised would be with us until September. We know that the government's changing policies have a huge impact on families, with many still struggling financially, and childcare's fees out of their reach on the, is very much a part of the image for many families as they look to their personal financial horizon this year. It's also incredibly concerning that the government has chosen the female-dominated childcare sector as the first sector to remove the job seeker sub, job keeper subsidy from. Women, indeed families, but particularly women, rely on childcare to be able to work. And women make up 97 per cent of the employees in the childcare sector. You couldn't have targeted a weapon at women better than what the government has done with regard to the childcare sector and the reverse of promises to support wages and offer wage subsidy. Childcare was already unaffordable before COVID-19, and we've only just started to come out of the crisis. And the Federal Liberal National Party are already winding back vital support, which will disproportionately impact the women that they will crow about supporting with this particular piece of legislation. If we make childcare unaffordable for women, if we make it unaffordable generally for women to go back to work, their ability to participate in the workforce will be curtailed, impacted in ways that have flow-on effects, particularly in regional areas of Australia, like the Central Coast and all of the regions of New South Wales, which I support as a duty senator, in the seat of Parks, the Riverina, in Farrah, in Hume, and dare I say in Eden Monero, where a battle is underway for a decent representative who understands a woman who cares about that community in the shape of Christy McBain to come to Canberra and stand up for a community that was ignored during the bushfire crisis and is still suffering failures of policy making that puts people at the centre. That is the hallmark of this government. Paid parental leave acknowledges that having children and starting a family is indeed a very critical part of the normal cycle of life. But undertaking the great uh, challenge and opportunity of becoming a parent shouldn't leave you economically disadvantaged. It shouldn't leave you locked out of the workforce and it shouldn't mean you have to choose between caring for very young children or having a roof over your head. Yesterday we had Donata workers outside this building many women there raising their very real concerns about how difficult this time is, them, is for them because of the government's hard-heartedness. If the government can acknowledge that flexibility is needed in this bill, indeed if they can headline it as the Paid Parental Leave Amendment Flexibility Measures Bill, surely the government can find sufficient flexibility with a signature at the end of the pen of, of, um, the pen of Mr Frydenberg to do the same for the Donata workers, to ensure they can receive JobKeeper. That impacts families as well. Finally, these sensible reforms, 10 years after the initial delivery of paid parental leave under a Labor government, this government has finally come to a point to update the current Act by introducing a degree of flexibility to the provisions that are more in keeping with contemporary Australia. However, I hope in my contribution I have made it clear that there are far more reforms that are needed in this sphere to provide more support for working families, and Australians should not congratulate themselves in isolation, but we should look to our uh, comparator countries in the OECD and acknowledge the fact that we are far from the mark in terms of proper financial and practical support 
for families who need the support of this nation for them to do the best they can at raising their families. We must end the gender pay gap. We must ensure that Australia's scheme is first, not last, in the OECD. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Madam <coughs> Acting Deputy President. Um, I really have missed this place. I've missed, I've missed the chutzpah that comes from this chamber. I've missed in the last three months the hypocrisy uh, that uh, is, is given with a straight face uh, so often um, in, this, in this chamber. It's something I haven't had to experience too much in the last few months back home in, in North Queensland, where you don't really get away with that kind of stuff. You, know, you, you don't really get away uh, uh, with, uh, with, with two-faced kinds of statements, what we just heard from Senator O'Neill. Because Senator O'Neill, she made some, some useful contributions, but they were undermined, Madam Acting President, undermined by the fact that she's trying to criticise this government, the, the Liberal National Government, for not doing things that the Labor government that she was a member of didn't do when they were in government. Uh, they, 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 they introduced the paid parental leave scheme we have. I, I recognise that. And, and it's a, it was an important reform that we have maintained. Uh, but Senator O'Neill just then said, well, because you haven't changed it from what we did and when we were in government, you're, 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 you're culpable. You're, you're, you're worthy of criticism because you haven't done what I'd like to do. And as I said, Senator O'Neill made some, some useful contributions. But uh, she, her arguments would be much more forceful, Madam Mac Deputy President, if, if she applied the same test to the government that she was a member of uh, not that long ago, uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, um, uh, so it's a bit late now uh, to start uh, criticising just one side about those things. Uh, uh, fortunately, I, from what I heard there, that uh, Senator O'Neill and the Labor Party will support these sensible changes. This is a common sense bill, really. You could sum it up in those words. It's a their common sense changes to a system that is a good one. It's good that we offer and provide paid parental leave. I recognise we can't provide it as, as far and as expensive as what Senator O'Neill uh, uh, would like. It, with these things, are always a balance, a balance that the Gillard government had to uh, weigh up and that what uh, all governments have to weigh up uh, in terms of government spending and the provision of welfare we can provide to Australians. Uh, but these changes are very sensible, sensible because they will ensure uh, that, uh, that mothers and, and fathers, parents who are, who are seeking to take, take paid parental leave can do so in a flexible way uh, over the first uh, 18 months of their child's life. Uh, uh, my understanding is currently the paid parental leave scheme has to be taken in a block, so to speak, of a consecutive number of 18 weeks. These changes will allow, uh, will allow um, uh, mothers, uh, primarily mothers, I presume, taking the paid parental leave to to do so in 12 weeks after the, the birth of the child uh, and then at other times within 12 months of the birth of the child. The remaining six weeks can then be used within two, weeks, two, two years sorry, of the birth or adoption uh, in blocks as small as a day over time to allow flexible working arrangements and that's all a common sense change. It's the kind of change that, well, why didn't we think of that earlier? Why didn't uh, we think of that when it came in? Um, some of these things can be missed. but. I believe it seems to have well, be well supported across this chamber, which is uh, very, very good. Um, I think it is very important that we do support uh, family formation in this country, that we do support uh, people having children uh, in Australia. Uh, we are fortunate not to have the, the seriously low fertility rates in, in North European, country, European countries, uh, but our, our, our fertility rate is below replacement level. Uh, and keeping in mind of the next few years our migration program will be uh, very much curtailed. It's important that Australians continue to have children and we continue to grow and develop um, our country and our nation. We should support families to do that. Uh, we should also support uh, those, that, those families that are in the workforce and have to juggle that. And that's, uh, this scheme helps do that. But I do want to stress that I think the most important reason to provide uh, paid parental leave, to provide this assistance, is for the child not for the parents, uh, not for the mother or the father. Uh, the, 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 the reason I uh, strongly support uh, schemes like this is because it's incredibly important for the children's welfare to, to have and spend time with their, uh, their mother or father, particularly their mother, obviously, for reasons of, of breastfeeding and, and etc. in those early, early years of life. I'm fortunate um, uh, to have had five uh, children. Um, it never gets tired, and, and it's uh, always a, a journey. 
uh, 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 it's been a, been a more interesting journey the last few months, spending more time with them. Um, uh, but uh, we were very fortunate for my wife to be able to take time off work uh, and for her first two children, and then after that uh, she was staying at home anyway. But uh, uh, I shouldn't say that because I was getting in trouble. She was working at home, not staying at home. Uh, very much uh, hard working at home, uh, looking after our children. It's very, very important, I think, to spend that time. And it's not—it's not just from personal experience. This is—this is laid out in evidence. In evidence, uh, there was an OECD report, a little dated now, but I don't think children have changed much since 2007. Uh, the OECD said that taking stock of the evidence, it seems that child development is negatively affected when an infant does not receive full-time personal care uh, for at least the first six to 12 months of his or her life. Uh, a study by the Productivity Commission in 2009 it was into child care uh, and paid parental leave issues. Actually, I think it might have been the study that helped lead to this, this, this scheme. Uh, it quoted, it said, the Productivity Commission said that most of the more recent evidence tends to support the view that the use of non-parental child care, usually necessitated by maternal employment, when initiated within the first year of a child's life can contribute to behavioural problems and, in some contexts, delayed cognitive development. And the Productivity Commission quoted a, a range of different scientific studies there to, to back that, that evidence up. So it is important that we do try to support um, parents to, to, uh, uh, to, to be able to look after their children. I think that's the primary purpose of, of, of getting behind these schemes. It's sometimes I find sometimes the debate seems to be more about encouraging more female employment in the, in the workforce. Uh, I think that that is important, but sometimes the claims of the needs for that are overblown in the Australian context. We have about average female labour force participation rates across developed countries, across the OECD. The countries that have higher, um, fertility, higher sorry, uh, labour participation rates for females almost solely are in countries with much lower fertility rates than ourselves. Uh, so, of course, countries that have, have higher fertility rates are going to have lower female workforce participation because parents are going to choose, because of the evidence I just read, our parents are going to choose to spend time with their children if they're having children. There are a couple of exceptions in Canada and New Zealand have higher female workforce participation rates, uh, although Canada does have a, a, a lower um, fertility rate, not as low as some of those European countries, but lower than ourselves. Um, but one, the one thing that's not, never actually mentioned that I think is really important is that the way we count female labour force participation, workforce participation, is very different from almost every other country in the world, including Canada and New Zealand, who are often held up as, as comparators to, to our, our, our workforce participation rates. When a female is on, when a mother, sorry, is on paid or, or, or non-paid parental leave in Australia, they are not counted in our workforce. They are not counted as being in, in our workforce. In Canada and New Zealand, as in the case of most other countries in the world, if a mother is on uh, uh, paid or non-paid parental leave, they are counted in the workforce. And that gap, that difference, that statistical quirk uh, accounts for apparently, again according to a different Productivity Commission study, of about a two to three percentage point difference, about half the gap between Australia and Canada and New Zealand is accounted for in that. And when you drill down further and you look at female labour force participation rates in, in child rearing age groups. Uh, uh, I think from memory, usually from around 18 to through to, to sort of 45, uh, um, uh, uh, the female workforce participation rates is about the same between Australia and New Zealand. About the same. We depart when it's above 45, and no one can really explain that. But it's hard to say that this potentially or possibly, if if we increase paid parental leave schemes, that gap would close because we've already got the same gap at the at the years or the ages that uh, mothers have have children. I think one thing I do, as I said earlier, I think Senator O'Neill made some, some useful contributions, albeit uh, partisanly applied. It would be good. It would be good to try and support families to, to take more time off to look after their children, particularly at very young ages, at the ages particularly below the age of one, as, as was um, stated in those studies that I, that I mentioned. The, ke the question here, though, is who should fund that? Who, 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 who should or who can? Uh, we call on to pay for that benefit. And yes, there is a role for government as we're doing through these schemes, but you know, I also think that it would be better if we could help support families themselves to help fund uh, that, uh, those choices in life, if they would like to choose, because they're in the best place to make these choices. And all families are different. Some families have great grandparent support and you know, don't necessarily need to take the, the time off work. They've got other support mechanisms. 
uh, others don't. So, so all families are different. So if we could provide more choice, more flexibility to, at the family level, that would be a good thing. Unfortunately, in our country, uh, the way our tax system works, we don't provide particularly easy choices for families that would like to say uh, 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 to take more time off uh, to look after a child. Our tax system is based on the individuals, not based on the family. So you put in a tax return individually, you are taxed individually. About half of other OECD countries actually have a family-based taxation system. They have, a, have certain arrangements that allow for the spreading of income between uh, parents or between uh, partners. Uh, to, 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 to allow for the fact that really, really most families do their budgets, they spend their money on a collective basis. <laughs> uh, and a lot of our welfare schemes are based on that. The family income is the test for the home builder scheme that's coming in. Family income is the test for family tax benefit, uh, at least family tax benefit A. But for the tax system, it is on the individual basis. On the individual basis. And uh, an OECD study from 2012 showed that Australian families Australian single-income families, I should say, pay, the, pay more tax, uh, uh, have a greater gap between the tax they pay and a double-income family pays, uh, uh, which is the fifth highest gap in the OECD. So only four other countries have a higher gap between the effects of our tax system on single-income and double-income families uh, than in Australia. And I just updated some calculations. I did quite a, a lot of work on this in the past. And I just had a look, got out the, uh, uh, the ATO tax calculator before and had a look at what the current situation is. And so if you're, if you're on a single income, and, and so if you're a family um, with a couple of kids and, and only one of, your, one of the parents is working and so they, they earn $100,000 just for round numbers, um, according to the ATO, that person, that family would be liable for $24,497 of tax. Right, um, in a year, so their take-home pay would be about 75 grand. The, if, if, a doubly, if there's a, a family with, say, a couple of kids and both parents work, and let's just say they earn 50,000 each, you could put in different numbers, but let's say they earn 50,000 each, 100,000 dollars in total, same family income as the other family, they would individually pay 7,797 dollars, where the tax in total uh, uh, family they pay 15,594 take-home pay of about 85,000. So an $8,900 difference between those two families. Same incomes, same family income. They're on 100 grand a year, which is not much more than the, the, the average um, full-time full -time wage currently. So they're about an average family in this country. And a $9,000 difference in tax. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And it doesn't particularly support families making choices uh, to look after their own children uh, and potentially have just one breadwinner at least for a period of time uh, while they have young children in the household. Because they, if they make that choice, if they decide, yep, one of us should stay home and look after the child, uh, uh, they are at $9,000 disadvantage a year. And when you've got a young child and you've got the costs of having a new family, that is a big, big hit. That is a massive hit and it's going to influence and change decisions. So uh, while I support Senator O'Neill's sentiment that we should help support um, more families in, in, in these times of their lives, I think it would be better if we, if we tried to move to a, to a family paid parental leave scheme rather than a government paid parental leave scheme, because that would help support a family choice. That would help uh, support uh, 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 potentially better outcomes for ch children's development uh, based on the best interests of that family and the choices of those mothers and fathers, not the government, not some bureaucrats, but give families the flexibility to make those decisions. And we could and should have a better tax system based on family needs, not just on individual needs. Senator McLaughlin from, from the lectern. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to support the Paid Parental uh, Leave Amendment Flexibility Measures Bill 2020. Uh, this bill seeks to further support Australian working mothers and families by providing for more flexible access to paid parental leave arrangements. This bill will allow the mother of a newborn or adopted child to elect to initially use 12 weeks of their 18-week paid parental leave entitlement prior to using the remaining six weeks at any time over the preceding two years. 
In contrast to the current scheme, this amendment to the provision of paid parental leave entitlements ensures that those mothers who wish to re-enter the workforce before the expiration of their 18 weeks can do so whilst also retaining access to the remaining period of their entitlements. Once passed by the Parliament, this bill will give access to parents of their children born on or after 1 July 2020 to, those, to these new flexible arrangements. These changes add to the amendments already made by the Coalition Government to the Paid Parental Leave Act late last year. Further, this bill will also allow mothers who choose to return to work the flexibility to transfer their remaining entitlement for paid parental leave to their partner who takes on the role of the primary caregiver or, alternatively, use the remaining paid parental leave entitlements to support their return to part-time work by, for example, returning three days per week and receiving paid parental leave for the other two other days of the week when they would not be working. The new provisions outlined in this bill are focused on outcomes from the Women's Economic Security Package released in 2018, specifically to increase female participation in the workforce. Presently, almost half of all new mothers are accessing paid parental leave in our nation every year. That's 179,000 mothers, and it is expected that approximately 4,000 of these will now access this new flexible option. This is critically important because we all know that no two families are the same. Our support for working mothers and families must be accessible to each and every Australian family's individual circumstances. That is why the provisions of this bill are designed to encourage a greater uptake of paid parental leave entitlements by secondary carers who, but for this support, would likely not have the opportunity to spend quality time with their children during the, those import, important formative years. In my view, there is nothing more important than, than family, howsoever it is defined. Family members provide the unconditional support and comfort necessary for, for the nurturing of a child. In reflecting on the intent of this bill, I'm reminded of what Heniel Long wrote in his book, A Letter to St Augustine. So much of what is best in us is bound up in our love of family, that it remains the measure of our st stability because it measures our sense of loyalty. All other packs of love and f or fear derive from it and are modelled upon it. The Liberal Party firmly believes that the family is the foundation stone of a strong and vibrant Australian society. Even as we face the unprecedented times of the present, family remains a constant upon which those of us fortunate enough can rely. That is why, by enabling working mothers, including those who are self-employed or own a small business, to access a more flexible paid parental leave arrangement, the Coalition Government is supporting mothers to manage the responsibilities of work and raising a family. I want to pay special tribute to those working women who run a small or family business. This bill will allow them to tailor their paid parental leave to their own circumstances and enable the business they have worked in so hard to build to continue to operate. It provides a further support for families who face the competing pressures of parenthood and enterprise, because these two important endeavours, wherever possible, should never be mutually exclusive. I remind honourable senators of the attempt some years ago of a paid parental scheme, leave scheme by those opposite, which resulted in significant addition workloads for those thousands of businesses as they struggled to work their way through a myriad of regulation and red tape. This coalition government is committed to providing an important safety net for Australian mothers, supporting the health and well-being of their children and providing the flexibility to allow families to decide how best to care for their children. Not only do the changes outlined in the bill provide more flexible arrangements for families, they assist business to retain their valued staff in the workforce. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much. I rise today in support of the Pay Parental Leave Amendment Flexibility Measures Bill 2020. Uh, this bill introduces changes to the paid parental leave scheme aimed at better supporting working mothers and families and working fathers to access their payment more flexibly. 
There are around 300,000 births in Australia each year, with nearly half of all new mothers accessing paid parental leave. Our government understands the important role of paid parental leave in supporting the health and well-being of mothers and babies and encouraging workforce participation. To this end, the measures in the bill introduce greater flexibility to support working women, including self-employed women and small business owners who cannot afford to leave their businesses for 18 consecutive weeks. The Pay Parental Leave Scheme provides an important safety net for nearly half of all new mothers, supporting them to take time off work to spend with their newborn or newly adopted children. Under this measure, we will continue to support the important objectives of the Paid Parental Leave Scheme, whilst offering families flexibility and choice about when to access the, their payment in order to support them to find a better balance between family and work. So these changes support thousands of working women and men who cannot afford to leave their employment or business for 18 consecutive weeks. Currently, if a parent returns to work before they have received their full entitlement of parental leave pay, they lose eligibility for the remainder of the payment, and that's fundamentally unfair. We will continue to support women to, to rest and recover in the months immediately after the birth of their child by allowing them to use 12 weeks of their entitlement within 12 months of the birth of their child. Then the remaining six weeks can be used flexibly any time within two years of the birth or adoption in blocks as small as one day at a time. So these measures will provide much greater flexibility and will in particular benefit self-employed women and women who are small business owners by providing greater flexibility as to when they can take time away from work. This increased flexibility and ability to balance work and caring responsibilities uh, will, I am sure, encourage greater uptake of leave by secondary carers, in turn contributing to changing social norms around sharing care and also encouraging more men to take parental leave. We know that not all families are the same, and this bill makes important improvements to the paid parental leave scheme that provides inherent much greater flexibility to ensure that we can continue to support that great institution in our society, uh, the family, no matter what form or shape uh, each person's family comes in. So I uh, commend these changes to the Senate and, of course, this reflects uh, the ongoing work of our government in improving women's economic security, which has been a very, very key focus of the Liberals and Nationals government for the last six and more years. As we know, we're in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic and it's a, a very challenging time for so many families, but our government is working around the clock to ensure that uh, we focus on saving lives and livelihoods and, of course, by rebuilding our economy as soon as we possibly can. There's been a bit of discussion in the Senate this morning about the gender pay gap, which I am pleased to report is moving in the right direction, down to a record low of 14 per cent from 17.2 per cent under the previous Labor government. And while, of course, 14 per cent is not good enough, uh, we didn't hear from Labor senators this morning uh, any acknowledgement that it was actually uh, quite considerably worse under Labor when it was in government and we are in fact making some real um, strides under our government. Despite this progress, so there are of course some significant challenges. There are still around two million working age women not in the labour force. Women are more than twice as likely to work part-time as men. And nearing retirement age, there is around a 32% gap in superannuation balances. The new uh, childcare subsidy is making childcare more accessible and affordable for around one million parents, and that's obviously a very um, important um, change that we have brought about. 
providing much greater equity and much greater support for families. And of course, um, at the moment, we know uh, we are offering, as a government, uh, free childcare. The childcare subsidy has been suspended uh, during the coronavirus pandemic, and that is, of course, to support as many families as possible, along with childcare centres at this very difficult time. Uh, but I do want to place on the record that the Morrison government is investing record funding of some, something in excess of $8 billion this financial year and increasing this investment to $10 billion in the coming years to support childcare. And this has seen, on average, families who use childcare a 4.2 per cent reduction in out-of-pocket costs since June 2018, and the typical family is around $1,300 better off per child per year. Uh, there are a number of other very significant ways in which we are supporting women in particular. The Parents Next program, which is supporting vulnerable parents, mostly women, to break the welfare cycle and get back into work. Of course, there has been enormous investment in women's safety, uh, and we are very, very proud of our incredible investments in women's safety. Some $852 million has been spent since 2013 to support women and children, and, and of course I also acknowledge some men who are victims of or at risk of uh, domestic violence. And that comes uh, in a whole lot of different ways, from improving frontline services to uh, supporting and funding specialist domestic violence providers. Uh, of course, there is uh, a very significant investment in our national housing and homelessness agreement, uh, huge investments in improving the legal system, including in very important initiatives, one that I was a huge supporter of, and that is banning the direct cross-examination in family law proceedings where there are allegations of family violence. And there's also been uh, enormous investments in uh, the better use of technology to keep women and children principally safe, as well as we now have a national domestic violence order scheme. So uh, enormous amount of investment has gone into uh, supporting women and children. And I don't want to be gender specific, specific on that, of course, some men also suffer family violence, but enormous investment has gone into this issue uh, to really improve the lives of all families. I, I also just want to acknowledge that our government has guaranteed a minimum entitlement of five days unpaid family and domestic violence leave per year for six million employees covered by the Fair Work Act. So this, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, support and commend this bill. This is a very significant change, which obviously brings about much greater flexibility and support for working parents. Uh, and I commend this bill to the, to the Senate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, and I thank senators for their contribution to the debate. Uh, the Paid Parental Leave Amendment Flexibility Measures Bill 2020 introduces reforms aimed to better support working mothers and their families access paid parental leave more flexibly to support choice about balancing work and family. Currently, parental leave pay can only be taken as a continuous 18-week block within the first 12 months after the birth or adoption of a child. From 1 July 2020, families will be able to split their parental leave pay into blocks of leave over a two-year period, allowing for periods of work in between. Parents will be able to use an initial 12-week block of their entitlement any time within the first 12 months after the birth or adoption of their child. This gives parents a period of rec recuperation and bonding in the months immediately following the birth or adoption. Parents will then uh, be able to take their remaining entitlement of up to six weeks any time before their child turns two years old and can re return to work any time during this time. This totals the 18 weeks currently allowed, but with much greater flexibility. The changes will help thousands of new parents who currently need to return to work before they have used all of their paid parental leave. Instead of losing unused leave, these families will now have greater flexibility to take their leave at a time that suits the needs of their family. 
The government recognises that not all self-employed uh, women and small business owners can afford to leave their businesses for 18 consecutive weeks. The increased flexibility will also make it easier for mothers who are eligible for paid parental leave to transfer the entitlement to eligible partners who take on the role of primary carer where it suits the family's circumstances. Importantly, this increased flexibility and ability to balance work and caring responsibilities may encourage greater uptake of leave by secondary carers, in turn contributing to changing social norms around sharing care and encouraging men to take parental leave. Uh, we know that not all families are the same, and this bill makes important improvements to the paid parental leave scheme that gives families more flexibility to balance work and caring responsibilities in a way that best suits their needs. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you. An amend second reading amendment has been circulated, so the question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. Is the division required? Call, ring the bells for four minutes.
Right. Stop the bells. Oh no, sorry. The hourglass is behind the clock again. Now stop the bells. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart to tell off the ayes, Senator McGrath tell off the noes, and I ask senators to keep it a bit quiet so they can keep their distance from the clerks as they can tell. The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to paid parental leave and for related purposes. Do I just do this, Rachel? Sorry. The committee is considering the paid parental leave amendment flexibility measures bill 2020. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. As a number of requests for amendments have been circulated, I advise that, as required, Senators proposing requests have circulated statements of reasons for framing them as requests, together with statements by the clerk on whether the amendments would be regarded as requests under the precedence of the Senate. Is it the wish of the committee that the statements accompanying the circulated request be incorporated in Hansard immediately after the requests to which they relate? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill be agreed to without amendments or requests. Minister. Uh, thank you. I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill. Do you want me? Minister. Uh, I seek leave to move uh, government amendments sheets one to seven, or sheet PP 105, one to seven together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, thank you. Um, 
Uh, parents are able to make a claim for paid parental leave up to three months before the expected date of birth or sorry I move the uh, amendments um, parents are able to make a claim for paid parental leave up to three months before the expected date of birth or adoption the bill originally had a provision for pre-birth claiming between 1 April 2020 and 1 July 2020 to ensure the claims could be made in the three months leading up to the commencement date. Due to COVID-19 and the change of the parliamentary sitting schedule, it was not possible to have this bill passed the parliament before 1 April. The start date of the changes has not moved uh, from 1 July. However, pre-birth claims will also only be possible from 1 July 2020 instead of the intended date of 1 April 2020. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Uh, the opposition supports this amendment uh, because we understand the need to change the start date in terms of those applications. However, we do think it's unfortunate that the parliament was unable to sit earlier to deal with um, this legislation as we had called to have happen. Uh, are the amendments agreed to? Aye. The ayes have it. Okay, those amendments were agreed to. So, Senator Pratt. Thank you. I've got a question for the government. I note these are relevant to our own second reading amendment as well as amendments moved by uh, the Australian Greens. Um, can I ask the government, please, how many people are not going to get paid parental leave because they no longer meet the income and work participation tests because of? coronavirus? Minister. Thank you, Senator Pratt, for the question. I am advised that uh, that figure is not available at this point in time. As the data that we have, uh, there is a lag effect. Okay. Senator Pratt. Uh, are you able to advise the chamber? please, how you will go about calculating that number of people? Minister. Uh, thank you. I'm advised, Senator Pratt, that the lag effect itself is in approximately 12 months' time, uh, so the calculation won't actually happen until then. Senator Pratt, thank you. The call. <laughs> how do you how do you calculate the number of people under the existing circumstances that will get it? How do you forecast it using the usual formula? And therefore, at which point does that lag effect? come into account. Just tell me how you work it out. Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Pratt. I am advised that it is based on population trend. Okay. Senator Pratt. Okay. Can you please tell me, if you are unable to account for the lag effect um, taking, which will kick in as of the 1st of um, well, when do you expect the impact of that eligibility to first start impacting? Clearly people had COVID job losses starting as early as uh, March and they could become pregnant, they could be pregnant before that or any time uh, into the future in which um, uh, they might have a child in you know, nine months' time from now, but have that period of time impacted by coronavirus in terms of their employment. Can you just give me an overview of how you intend to calculate that, noting that lag effect?
Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Pratt. I'm advised that from the 12th of March uh, we would be able to have an understanding based on the employment data in terms of the proposition that you have put forward. Senator Pratt. So, can I ask in that context if you've got employment data from the 12th of March and you'll have employment data for every month after and your usual method of calculating how many people have, are going to claim paid parental leave is based on population statistics. Why is it that you can't? Why is it that you're saying in that lag effect you can't calculate that until next year? Uh, because um, that doesn't really make sense to me. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister Pratt. I'm advised uh, the time period that we are looking at is from the 12th of March, but this is an unprecedented event. It obviously uh, has not occurred before, and we would hate to see it happen again. Um, and as such, that is the reason. Senator Pratt. Uh, so, because of the unprecedented nature, you don't know, as at this point in time yet, how many people are not going to meet the work test uh, in relation to their eligibility for PPL. Um, that's, ex that, that's essentially... Okay, do you have any estimate of what that might be currently? Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Pratt. I am again advised that because it is an unprecedented event, they don't yet have an estimate. Senator Pratt. Is this, is this the case for all kind of workforce participation issues in terms of estimates of who's, who's working and how much work people are currently doing that, that you don't know? Or is there something intrinsic to, I don't know, being an expectant parent and families that make this particularly difficult. Minister. Uh, Senator Pratt, I am advised that it is slightly different for uh, PPL because at this point in time we don't yet know how many people will actually be qualifying for the work test. Senator Pratt. Are you tr truly trying to tell me that you are unable to project what the existing impact of coronavirus has been on people's employment participation and therefore have a look at how many people are likely to have their work test impacted for the purposes of PPL eligibility. Minister. Uh, Senator Pratt, I'm advised that as the work test period goes for 13 months, the answer to the question is yes. Senator Pratt. Okay, so it's okay to rely on data for the purposes of, um, in, uh, you know, population growth statistics, but you are unable to um, translate the impact of that work test because it goes over 13 months. Do you have an indication of how many people who might be about to commence? maternity paid parental leave in the next couple of months who would have already have been impacted in terms of not meeting that work test. I have certainly been contacted by constituents. That is not a 13-month period in which, you're, which is contingent on how much the economy picks up or doesn't pick up and therefore uh, in, impacts on how much of the work test impacts on your, you know, work test modelling. What is the current impact as of now in terms of those who would otherwise have been receiving PPL if they were commencing their PPL um, now or in the next couple of months? Minister. Uh, 
Senator Pratt, again, at this point in time, they are unable to tell why a person currently does not work, hence the previous answers I have given you in relation to when the calculations may be done and the data may be there. Senator Pratt. Um, with respect, Minister Cash, I, I don't understand the reference to 13 months. We do understand that eligibility is forecast over a 13-month period, but we certainly know of families that are looking ahead now to a couple of months' time where they know they have lost their eligibility because they have lost work recently and therefore they don't meet the I think it's the 10 out of 13 uh, months eligibility for that work test. I really don't understand why you don't have any indication of the data that might give you an indication of the number of people affected. Like, you've said the data hasn't come in. Yep. But is that data calculated on general unemployment data and, and extra extrapolated? Um, how do you usually calculate who you ex how many people you expect to be uh, receiving it? Are you, are you really saying you don't calculate that for another 13 months' time in the past? Because if you said you can't calculate it for another year, that's not an estimate of how many people are about to receive it, which clearly the government needs to be able to do. Minister. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Pratt, in answer to your question, in the normal course of events, the estimate would be undertaken based on previous data. However, because this is an unprecedented event, any such estimate may not be a correct estimate. So at this point in time, is unable to be undertaken because the reason for not working is not yet known. So in the normal course of events, you are right, it would be based on previous data, but because of the nature of the unprecedented event, this has not yet been able to be done. Case, uh, Senator Cash, for all your workforce participation issues. Clearly, we know coronavirus has had an unprecedented impact on workforce participation. We know it's had an in unprecedented impact, in particular, on women's workforce participation. And um, even the government has been able to acknowledge, to some extent, that that's an issue. Um, have you not made any attempt yet to quantify what the what that impact actually looks like and to translate it into frankly all the various eligibility thresholds for whether it's for job seeker payments or you know other kind of uh, where people uh, change their family tax benefit status because they uh, have lost work and therefore they've lost income Clearly, the government has to be grappling with these issues now to be able to look at what um, the debt and impact uh, of the policy decisions and the economic crisis we're currently in is on households and the Australian economy. Minister. Uh, so, Senator Pratt, in response to your question, um, we're currently dealing with a bill in relation to paid parental leave, so I can only provide you the response that is given to me by the department in relation to that aspect uh, of your question. And again, it goes to the information that I have already provided that in terms of paid parental leave, we're only at the very early stages of the impact. Uh, as I've said to you, in the normal course of events, the estimation would be able to be done, but because of the unprecedented nature of the event and the fact that we were only in the early stages of it, this has not yet been undertaken. Okay. Senator Pratt. Thank you. So, Minister Cash, the government could work it out. Um, because you need to work out what these early stage impacts are, clearly for uh, the whole economy and for those impacted. 
Um, will you work out, um, or will you just tell us as you go how many people would otherwise have been eligible that have missed out? Minister. I, again, Senator Pratt, I go to my previous answers. This is not a normal course of events. This is an unprecedented event, and as such, I'm advised that uh, there will be continual monitoring of this situation. Um, and when there is a clearer picture as to the information that you are seeking to elicit because of the impact of COVID-19, um, that information will be provided. But this is an unprecedented event. With respect, Minister Cash, you're glossing over the fact that families and parent, expecting parents will be missing out on payments that they otherwise were planning to receive because they no longer meet that eligibility test. And that is happening to them here and now. And you are trying to tell me that this government has no idea how many of these families uh, are being impacted uh, by um, the, the loss of employment uh, because of COVID-19 in terms of their eligibility for paid parental leave? Minister. Uh, in response to the general premise of your question, the answer is no. Um, and in terms of the detailed response to your question, the government, as you would be aware, has made amendments to the JobKeeper payment so that it would count for the purposes of the work test for paid parental leave. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Um, Minister, can I ask, please, how many people will get paid parental leave because the rule has been changed to allow JobKeeper to satisfy the work test for paid parental leave. Minister. Uh, Senator Pratt, I am advised that that figure at this point in time is not available and we won't have that information until people actually formally submit uh, the actual paperwork and claim. Senator Pratt. Um, is there any reason why you can't? Um, is that because you don't know how many people are claiming JobKeeper? Uh, or. Okay. Is there a reason that you haven't yet calculated how much of that cohort might be a likely draw on paid parental leave yet? Minister. Yeah, no, again, Senator, um, it, it goes to the answer is obviously yes, we know how many people are claiming JobKeeper, and Treasurer are able to work out that estimate. But in relation to the specifics of your question, uh, the department will not have that information until people formally lodge that claim. Senator Pratt. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Can I ask why the government exempted JobKeeper? Um, uh, included JobKeeper as a means to um, acquitting the requirements of the work test, noting that many of those people on JobKeeper they might be doing a little bit of work or they might be doing no work. Um, and uh, why is it that the government won't extend that same uh, right to acquit the paid parental leave? workforce participation requirements for people who now find themselves on JobSeeker or who find themselves dependent on their partner because they don't meet the income thresholds to be eligible for JobSeeker payments? Minister. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Pratt, I'm advised that the rationale behind it was uh, because G Job Keeper is all about maintaining that important connection with employment, and that is what paid parental leave is, that is the rationale for utilising Job Keeper. Senator Pratt. Okay, so Job Keeper is relevant in the sense that you want to maintain that workforce participation connection uh, using job keeper but you know these are women who are about to take a pause from their uh, uh, work uh, or, or um, dads that are about to take a pause in their work because they're accessing paid parental leave it is of course an objective to keep um, parents who have children connected to their employers um, is that not also an important objective for um, people on who've also been dislocated from the workforce but might be in casual roles? Minister. Well, well Senator uh, Pratt, in response to the question again, you asked for the rationale in your previous question. The, the answer to that question was the rationale was based on the premise of maintaining a connection to employment. In terms of casuals, you'd be aware that casuals who have been in continuous period of employment with their employer for 12 months or more, based on the definition of the Fair Work Act, they are entitled to JobKeeper. And as such, there will be some casuals uh, which are afforded um, the benefit of this rationale. Senator Pratt. Can you confirm, uh, Minister, that the government could indeed change the work test rules for PPL by regulation at any time to make sure that families don't miss out uh, in a, meeting their work test requirements, uh, their p workforce participation requirements, uh, to get PPL because of coronavirus? Minister. Uh, Senator Pratt, I am advised that the answer to your question is no. It cannot be changed by regulation because it is in the, the actual Paid Parental Leave Act. Senator Pratt. Well, if that's the case, how is it the JobKeeper makes those keeps those requirements, but um, uh, surely all you need to do is to capture those people within a JobKeeper payment? so that they do have workforce participation that would enable them to do that. Minister. Again, Senator Pratt, I'm advised that the JobKeeper legislation amended the Paid Parental Leave Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister Cash. Can I now please ask um, what advice you would give to the families that had otherwise planned to have banked on having this income because they were going to meet the work test? They've lost their jobs recently. They're about to have a baby, uh, and many of these families are now looking at needing to draw down on superannuation because they've lost employment. Um, what advice do you give these families who are now managing an insecure economic future at the same time as expecting a baby? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, Senator Pratt, I am advised that uh, they may be able to test their eligibility for other types of payments, uh, including job seeker uh, or family tax benefits. Senator Pratt. Can I just confirm, if you are um, a working woman who otherwise who lost her job, you were pregnant, um, but you have a partner who is working full time and earns $100,000 a year, you've got a very large mortgage, um, would that woman be eligible for a job seeker payment? She's going to be assessed as dependent on her spouse 
and she won't meet the income test requirements to be eligible for a job seeker payment, will she? Minister. Uh, well, in response to your previous question, uh, the advice I was given that, and I again reiterate it, they are able to test their eligibility for other forms of payment, including job seeker or family tax benefit. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, um, Acting Deputy President, or Chair, I should say. Um, it's to this very issue that the Greens amendment goes and, in fact, would, would fix the problem that we've been discussing. Um, as has been articulated, if you lost your job because of COVID but you weren't eligible for JobKeeper for whatever reason, now you're not eligible for paid parental leave. Now, we think that's unfair and it's very easily fixed. So, Amendment uh, uh, 1 and 2 on sheet 8927, which I now move, does just that. And it says if through no fault of your own you've lost your job because of COVID-19, um, you expected to otherwise remain in employ and otherwise be eligible for PPL, then you should still be eligible for PPL. Now, importantly for the number crunches over there, that won't increase the budget draw because those people were projected to be eligible for PPL anyway. So the whole lengthy discussion we've just had, actually I think it boils down to the fact that those projections won't have changed. If you're basing it on population projections, then those projections will be the same. The same people that would have been entitled to PPL once their employer existed, unfortunately, because of coronavirus and they now know, have no work, will miss out. Um, it's an easy fix. It won't have any budget implications. So I guess I am interested in the rationale for why the government isn't supporting, I understand isn't supporting this amendment, because it won't cost you anything more than it otherwise would have anyway. So if you could answer me that, Minister, before we move to the deal with the amendment. Uh, just before you, I call you, Minister, uh, Senator Waters, I'm just checking. Are you seeking leave to move both those amendments together? Sure. Okay. Is leave approved? Yes. Leave's approved. Okay. Minister. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, Senator Waters, I will respond uh, to the amendment uh, that you've moved. Uh, you would be aware uh, that in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the government moved quickly to introduce amendments to the Paid Parental Leave Act to allow the time that people spend on the JobKeeper payment to count towards the paid parental leave work test, um, as I have responded in questions from Senator Pratt. The proposed amendment that you have moved has the potential to allow people with a non-genuine claim to be eligible for paid parental leave. For example, people who may have already been planning to leave work irrespective of the impact of COVID-19. The uh, proposed amendments that you have moved uh, would also increase the evidence required for submitting a claim for paid parental leave, adding to the administrative burden, including for employers who may be called on to speculate about the work intention of claimants and what amount of work they would have asked claimants to do but for the impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, there would be no independent way for Services Australia to verify these claims. In terms of the amendments that you have moved, um, they also add a new provision that would allow the Secretary to determine that a person would have met the paid parental leave work test if it was not for the impact of an emergency services event. The amendment also allows the minister to declare an event such and the coronavirus outbreak an emergency circumstances event. In these situations, a person would be deemed to be working the hours they would have been working pre the COVID-19 impacts. The approach is similar to that currently applied for people who do not meet the work test due to a pregnancy-related complication or illness or a premature birth. However, these events are relatively rare and easily verified. The amendments that you have proposed would also require assessments on a significantly greater scale, creating additional administrative burden, including uh, for employers. And on that basis, the government will not be supporting the amendments that have now been formally moved by the Australian Greens. Senator Waters. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, 
uh, Acting Minister, uh, well, Minister representing, I just want to take you up on a few of those points. Um, firstly, the claim that there would be non-genuine claims. That sounds a lot to me like you're just saying women are going to lie. We do hear that from your side of the chamber quite a bit, but it's still not okay and it's also not right. So I ask you to perhaps reconsider whether you really want to assert that women are going to make up the fact that either they're pregnant or they're going to make up the fact that they were otherwise going to leave the job or stay on the job, because that's just playing into a trope that's very unhelpful and is actually quite dangerous, as I would hope you know. Um, you, you then talked about a speculation on work intention. These people have a contract, so there's no need for speculation on their intention. They are employed. Were it not for COVID, they would be entitled to receive paid parental leave because they are employed. So I, I, don't, I genuinely don't understand how you think there's some speculation required as to their employment situation or their intention. And lastly, on that same point um, that this would somehow require additional paperwork, these are the same people that otherwise would have been eligible for PPL. They might now have to put in a different form. It's not like there's going to be additional people. The only thing that's changed is the pandemic. The number of people has not changed. Just their eligibility to get any support from this government is what's changed. Now you noted that you've extended, uh, you've made JobKeeper count for the purposes of PPL eligibility. I'm aware of that. And we welcome that. But there's actually no real reason for you not to also extend PPL eligibility to people that would have been eligible for, were it not for the pandemic. It gets a bit confusing, but I think people understand the point. It's not their own fault that their business has either gone bust or has chosen not to offer JobKeeper, um, or that they are not eligible because your government won't extend JobKeeper to the number of people that it should, namely casuals, people on temporary visas, international students, the works. So, I mean, this, in a sense, is you, you're hoisting them on your own petard, and then you're trying to use that as an excuse to say, well, they don't deserve help. They do deserve help. I don't accept your premise that women are going to lie about their employment situation or their reproductive health status. Um, and so I'd just like one further um, response on why you're not simply going to do the right thing here and give people the money they would have otherwise been entitled to. Minister. Thank you. Uh, Deputy President uh, and Senator Waters, in relation to everything you have just said, uh, your analysis of the response that I gave uh, in terms of the government not supporting the amendments put forward by the Australian Greens was completely incorrect. In fact, you verbaled me, and I would like the Hansard to formally reflect that that is what um, has just occurred in your summation. Uh, in the first instance, though, can I thank you uh, for acknowledging that the government did move quickly uh, to introduce amendments to the paid parental uh, leave scheme to allow the time that people spend on the JobKeeper payment to count towards the paid parental leave work test. Thank you for acknowledging that. Uh, in relation to, though, uh, the verbaling of me in my response in terms of your proposed amendment, that it has the potential to allow people with a non-genuine claim to be eligible for PPL, uh, the example given was people who may have already been planning to leave work regardless of the impact of COVID-19. This is about ensuring the accuracy of the system. Uh, you also responded uh, in terms of the additional uh, or significantly greater scale um, of the assessments and the additional administrative burden, uh, including for employers. Uh, in response to that, uh, while the approach is similar to that currently applied for people who do not meet the work test due to a pregnancy-related complication or illness or a premature birth, these events are relatively rare and easily verified. The amendment that you have put forward would require assessments on a significantly greater scale, as such creating additional administrative burden, including for employers. Senator Waters. Thanks, Chair. You did say that already. I, I did hear it the first time, but thanks, I guess. Um, so, just in relation to the savings that you will now make, you're making savings off the back of pregnant women. 
When did that become okay? People that otherwise would have been eligible for PPL, were it not for the pandemic, that are now not eligible, you're not going to let them have the PPL because you think they might have been intending to leave work anyway. It sounds an awful lot like making savings off the back of pregnant women. Can I get an explanation on how much money you're expecting to save by denying those people the payment they would have otherwise been entitled to? Minister. Uh, Senator Waters, again, um, I don't agree with the propositions that you have put forward. Uh, people who do not meet the work test are not eligible for the PPL payment. Senator Waters. Yes, that's why we're suggesting the work test be changed, because it's not their fault that the global pandemic happened. I think we're going nowhere. I'll leave it there. I, uh, I move the amendment. Uh, Senator Pratt. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, this discussion has highlighted for me uh, another significant issue in relation to pregnant women meeting the work test. Um, pregnancy discrimination is, of course, known in Australia to happen. Clearly, if you uh, have a permanent contract and you're employed, then you have some protections. However, if you're a casual employee and your shift suddenly drop off, uh, because of that pregnancy discrimination. Has the government done any assessment of the issues around someone meeting the work test when they otherwise would have met it? They're not leaving a job or dropping shifts of their own uh, accord by choice, uh, but rather are experiencing pregnancy discrimination, uh, insecure work rights, and therefore do not meet the work test. Minister. Oh, sorry. Minister. Uh, I'm, I'm advised that the answer to your question is no, but Senator Pratt, you also did, um, in the statement that you made, acknowledge that pregnancy discrimination is unlawful, and in the event that someone was experiencing pregnancy discrimination, um, they would be able to, be take, to able to take action under the relevant legislation in relation to uh, that alleged discrimination. Senator Pratt. Yes, indeed, Senator Cash, that is the case. However, the extent to which those rights are exercisable are um, much more limited in the case of people who are casualised, uh, because you might simply uh, stop getting shifts uh, rather than, um, uh, and you know, we know that this uh, commonly happens uh, when people have discriminated against at work. I've seen many examples of it. Uh, and it's very difficult to mount uh, a discrimination case under those circumstances. Minister. Well, again, if you're looking for a response, my response, um, I refer to my previous answer, which is if someone believes that they are experiencing discrimination on the basis of pregnancy, uh, it is unlawful. It's made unlawful by legislation, and they are able to take action under that uh, relevant legislation. Senator Pratt. Uh, Minister, are you able to recognise that the casualised nature of women's work relative to men in our economy um, uh, makes them more vulnerable to this kind of discrimination because it's harder for them to exercise those rights? So the question is that the amendment is moved by Senator Waters that the request uh, for the amendments to be agreed to is agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Aye, sir. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Oh, yeah, cut my, uh, stop the bells. So the question is that the request is moved by Senator Waters, uh, one and two on sheet eight nine order on eight nine two seven uh, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciaccone as teller for the ayes and Senator Drake Brockman as teller for the noes. Yes, sorry. Senator Brockman. Order. There being 30 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is negated. No, one more. Senator Griff. 
Thank you, Chair. Look, I, uh, I move request one on sheet 8959. Now, this request is framed to increase the classes of persons who can claim parental leave pay. It is fully costed and it would allow the biological father of a child or the partner of a child's birth mother to make a primary claim for parental leave pay for a child if the child's birth mother does not or is not likely to satisfy the income test of the, at the relevant time. As I noted in my speech, the inequity between two families on the same combined income uh, would be eligible if the man was the higher income earner, but not eligible if the woman was the income earner, which is just unfair, or the higher income earner. The current rules just don't reflect the realities of modern parenting, with more dads staying at home to care for children. The number of stay-at-home fathers has grown to 80,000 in 2016, Order. based on the latest census data. It is time to move away from models that assume children will be cared for by a primary carer who is the mother. Modern parents don't define themselves in this way, and it's time the legislation didn't either. And I do have a, uh, a question for the minister. Minister, do you concede that the rule which unfairly penalises high-income earning mums and stay-at-home dads by tying eligibility to the birth mother is a discriminatory and sexist rule? Minister. Thank you. And, uh, Senator Luger, if I will respond uh, to the amendments that you have, or the amendment uh, that you have moved in total. Uh, the time critical nature of this bill, uh, which, as you are aware, provides critical flexibility in the paid parental leave, precludes the government from considering other changes to the scheme at this time. Any changes to the means testing arrangements would require consultation and investigation to ensure we strike the right balance. The government is committed to delivering on measures that were announced in 2018 as part of the Women's Economic Security Statement that improved the flexibility of the paid parental leave scheme. The proposed amendment uh, that you have moved on behalf of Centre Alliance seeks to enable biological fathers or the partner of the birth mother to claim paid parental leave where the mother does not satisfy the paid parental leave income test. This would have the effect of enabling partners of high income mothers, that is of course above the $150,000, to access paid parental leave subject to the partner meeting the income and work tests. Whilst the proposal would address, as you've said, uh, perceived gender bias in the PPL scheme, uh, it would come at a cost to government um, and be providing increased support to higher income families. Women who are on a higher income and are primary, care, primary carers are generally in a stronger position to obtain family-friendly benefits as part of their conditions of employment. Further, the requirement in the PPL scheme for a mother to have primary eligibility for parental leave pay reflects that the payment is primarily designed to assist mothers to take time out of the workforce to care for their newborn or recently adopted child, to enhance the health and development of the child and to allow time for the mother to recover from the birth. Whilst we remain open to discussion about further opportunities for improvement, our critical and immediate concern is delivering on the commitment for increased flexibility that has been widely supported. Senator Griff. Uh, Minister, your, your statement confirms that government does not have an issue with a sexist and discriminatory rule. Um, whilst I appreciate, as you said, that <coughs> it may take time to consult with others, um, this change is very minor and, in fact, uh, it is fully costed by the PBO and it's, it's around 27 mil in the, in the forward estimates. I mean, it's, this is a very, very minor, has a very minor cost impact on your budget, but it just sets everything straight, sets everything right, removes this 
sexist rule. Can you advise, uh, given that you, it, part of your statement also said that you know, it is something that perhaps should be looked at, but then it slightly contradicts itself as well a bit further on, can you advise whether um, government is looking at options that will actually take into account either combined family income or looking at this very issue uh, in the reasonable future? Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, Senator Griffin, in relation to the costings, uh, I am advised that it is $27 million per year um, as opposed to just $27 million. Uh, in relation to the comments you made about uh, sexist discrimination, that is not what I said, uh, and that I am being verbaled in that regard. I will again outline the statement that I made. The requirement in the PPL scheme for a mother to have primary eligibility for paid parental leave reflects that the payment is primarily designed to assist mothers to take time out of the workforce to care for their newborn or recently adopted child, to enhance the health and development of the child, and to allow time for the mother to recover from, my birth, from the birth. Uh, in the opening statement that I provided in response to your first questions, I stated the time critical nature of this bill which provides critical flexibility in the paid parental leave scheme, precludes the government from considering other changes to the scheme at this time. Any changes to the means testing arrangements would require consultation and investigation to ensure we strike the right balance. I also stated, whilst we remain open to discussion, about further opportunities for improvement in answer to the question that you have just put. Our immediate concern is delivering on the commitment for increased flexibility that has been widely supported. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you. I've just got a, a question that follows on from um, Senator Griff's questions. How many men have taken paid parental leave each year since the scheme commenced? And if you don't have that data, perhaps you can find a way of giving me an overview of it. Um, and do you have an indication of how many of those, how many families or men would not have been eligible for PPL if they had been subject to the same income test as women? Minister. Uh, Senator Pratt, in terms of the information that the department have been able to provide me right now, um, the information that they have to hand uh, is details in relation to the number of dads and partners under dad and partner pay uh, that received the payment last year. And the figure I am instructed is 91,762. That's the figure that I've been provided by the department. Senator Griff. Minister, uh, my previous question was, are you considering or looking at um, any other form of uh, legislation to incorporate combined family income or uh, fix this particular issue that I've referred to? That's my first question. And the second one is, you made a statement that the cost was $27 uh, million a year. That is incorrect. The PBO costing um, comes out to 2022-23 to total 27.3, but on uh, each individual year it's around uh, seven to nine million dollars. Now I can actually table this PBO uh, document if that is appropriate, Chair, but it is not uh, 27 million dollars a year. Oh, beg your pardon, Ms. Leaf Granty. Are you able to circulate it, Senator Griff? Uh, we, can, we can circulate it, but it was actually provided to government. It was provided to the opposition. Yeah, and it may uh, well complaints. be the minister hasn't seen it. So if okay. you circulate it, the minister can have a look now. Yep. Minister. Uh, Senator Griff, just in terms of um, 
the information that you are seeking to table. Uh, I'm advised that we can take it on notice and give you a res formal response in relation to the costings, but the information I was provided in response to your question was as I provided. Okay, so um, the question is that the request is moved by Senator Griff on sheet 8959, request one be, ag be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. Order. So the question is that the request on sheet 8959, request one, as moved by Senator Griff, 
be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint uh, Senator Ciccone as teller for the ayes and Senator Brockman as teller for the noes. Order, there being 30 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is negated. I shall now report out of committee. I'm jumping ahead of myself. So the question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. And the question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So the committee has considered the Paid Parental Leave Amendment Flexibility Measures Bill of 2020 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the. I the uh, report of the committee now be adopted. Thank you. We're both jumping ahead of ourselves. Uh, so the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I now move that the uh, bill be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to paid parental leave and for related purposes. Um, I was going to ask you. Just before we move to the next bill, I'll just seek advice from the government as to whether the document that Senator Griff. Uh, uh, okay, so that's uh, fine to be um, tabled. Thank you. Um, I call the clerk. Order. Government business order of the day number two. Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Amendment, enhancing Australia's anti-doping capability bill 2019. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Deputy uh, President. Um, uh, I seek to uh, speak uh, in respect of this uh, proposed bill. Um, the past few months have presented unprecedented uh, challenges for Australia's sport sector. The appropriate and necessary public health measures put in place to stop the spread of COVID-19 have forced the shutdown of very nearly all sporting activities at all levels from the grassroots to our elite competitions. Over the past fortnight, we have started to see the staged resumption of certain activities, including the return of sport. These small but important steps are encouraging the Australian sporting clubs and organisations. But just like uh, other aspects uh, of our lives, 
We know it will take some time for the Australian sporting landscape to look anything like it did before this global health and economic crisis hit. The ongoing impact on sport makes it uh, more important than ever that we do everything we can to protect the integrity of sport. Uh, this uh, bill seeks to do that by strengthening Australia's capacity to prevent, detect and deal with doping in sport. Australians love this sport and many of us can't wait uh, to again be inspired by our favourite teams and athletes in local and national competitions uh, and the international sporting uh, stage. And my team is resuming this Saturday night. Uh, no, the Adelaide Crows will will wipe out uh, Port Adelaide, I'm sure, at Adelaide Oval, in front of the 2,000 lucky people who um, are, uh, are uh, going to uh, going to be there. <coughs> uh, only 500 Crows supporters, unfortunately, because it's a Port Adelaide Port Adelaide home game. Yes. <coughs> um, see the contribution from the former <coughs> sports minister there. Um, <coughs> So they love their sport, uh, and when sport returns, uh, these achievements will again uh, bring us together, uphold the reputation of Australian sport, and make us uh, love it even more. With those things uh, that we hold dear and have sorely missed over the past couple of months are threatened whenever revelations of doping are reported. Australians value fair play and expect uh, a level playing field in sport. Our confidence in integrity of sport is undermined by doping. Doping leads us to question whether the sporting event we love to watch are really being contested on a truly level playing field. In government, Labor recognised the need to upgrade and update Australia's anti-doping anti regime to keep up with new and evolving risks. For instance, in 2012, uh, federal, uh, the federal Labor government established the National Integrity of Sports Unit and in 2013 we passed legislation to strengthen the Australian Sports and Anti-Doping Authority powers. Now, sports doping uh, threatens uh, to continue uh, to uh, constantly involve, evolve um, so that it's important that Australia's protective measures are regularly reviewed and, if required, updated. In response to those ever-changing risks, um, in August 2017, the government announced a review of Australia's sports integrity arrangements. The review panel was chaired by uh, Justice James Wood, and its report has come, uh, become known as the Wood Review. After receiving the Wood Review report in March 2018, the government released its response in February 2019. The review was uh, detailed and extensive, uh, nearly 300 pages containing uh, 52 uh, recommendations. Uh, one of those recommendations directly relates to this bill. Uh, recommendation 18 states, and I quote, that the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority's regulatory role and engagement with sports in relation to the audit and enforcement of sports compliance uh, with anti-doping rules and approved policies be enhanced by establishing regulatory compliance powers exercisable by the proposed National Sports Integrity Commission in collaboration with and at the request of the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority CEO. This bill seeks to implement Recommendation 18. The review also recommends retaining ASADA as Australia's national anti-doping organisation. However, the government has decided to bring anti-doping operations under the umbrella of a new agency, Sports Integrity Australia. This legislation to establish the agency passed both the House uh, of Parliament, both Houses of Parliament, in February this year, and was given assent in March. Asada has said it supports the inclusion of anti-doping <laughs> activities in the remit of the Sport Integrity Australia, and that move is supported by the majority of Australia's sporting organisations. Labor supports measures designed to protect the integrity of Australian sport and supported the passage of this bill through the House of Representatives last year. <coughs> However, stakeholders, including the Australian Athletes Alliance, the AAA, have uh, raised concerns with us about the impact some sections of the bill might have on individual rights. In response, Labor has worked closely with stakeholders towards a better balance between 
stronger anti-doping capabilities and the, uh, the uh, athletes' individual rights. Initially, we sought detailed briefings um, on the first version of the bill from the office of the uh, former Minister for Sport, Senator Mackenzie, and uh, <coughs> that was uh, willingly provided and officials involved in drafting the bill. We continued that uh, process uh, with Senator Colbeck, uh, who took over the portfolio after the last election. Labor initiated the referral of the bill <coughs> by the Senate to the Community Affairs Committee for a short inquiry, which reported earlier this year. We did that to give stakeholders an opportunity to outline issues relating to certain specific aspects of this bill. Concerns raised during the inquiry and with uh, Labor directly have largely related to the potential for some aspects of the bill to unfairly impact on individual rights. One of the most consistently raised stakeholder concerns has been the lowering of the threshold for the disclosure notice from reasonable belief to reasonable suspicion. Athletes uh, groups have uh, suggested that lowering the threshold would effectively deny athletes protections that are offered to criminal suspects. Stakeholders have pointed out that complying with disclosure notices, including accessing legal advice, can be costly and time-consuming. Many athletes, particularly those in Olympic sports, are not on six- or seven-figure salaries like those attracted uh, by the stars of some of our local codes, uh, for example. They don't have the resources to secure legal representation for complicated processes, which under this bill, in its current form, could be initiated with a lower threshold than that required for serious criminal investigations. Representative bodies argue that putting athletes in a position where such costs are incurred merely on the basis of reasonable suspicion is unfair. The Scrutiny Committee has queried <coughs> the need for the changes and asked why a reasonable belief could not be formed on the basis of intelligence gathered while investigating a potential anti-doping breach. Labor flagged during the debate on this bill <coughs> in the other place that we might seek to move amendments to this bill in the Senate. If we believe that the matters raised in the committee uh, <coughs> inquiry required changes. And we do think that change is needed. Let me be clear, Labor supports strong anti-doping measures in sport, but we also support the intent of this bill to strengthen Australia's defences against doping in sport and look forward uh, to continuing our commitment to that goal. But if the balance between the necessary new and enhanced powers and the rights of individuals can be improved, then uh, they should be. Stakeholders believe maintaining the current threshold would lessen the potential for unintended uh, cumulative impacts on individual athletes' rights that could result from the combination of a lower threshold and other sections of the bill. That's why it, uh, it's uh, Labor's intention to move an amendment to this bill that would maintain the current threshold of reasonable belief for the issuing of the disclosure notice. We have sought to work constructively uh, with stakeholders and throughout the parliament to improve the balance of this bill and hope to gain the support of the Senate to do that, while still ensuring that strong anti-doping regimes uh, to protect Australia's integrity in sport. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator Dean Farley. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I rise today to speak to the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Amendment Bill 2019. Now, when we think of ourselves as Australians, we often think of ourselves as a sporting nation. There's a lot to be proud of there. 14 million of us participate in sport annually. Uh, almost 2 million people volunteer each year in a whole range of different ways that might be involved in their local football club, soccer club, netball, cricket, rugby league, rugby union, basketball, swimming, athletics, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, we love our sport. Now, we need to do everything we can to protect that wonderful sporting culture. We've got to make sure that we support community sport, but we also have to ensure that, we, uh, that, that there is integrity at the highest levels uh, in sport. We know that that trust can be shattered when we learn that uh, a high-profile athlete, someone that the kids look up to, has been found cheating 
um, what they do is uh, they undermine people's faith in uh, a really important institution to all Australians. That's not fair, and Australians want a level playing field when it comes to engagement in sport. Of course, there are lots of things that can challenge the integrity of our sporting culture. Uh, this bill addresses uh, the issue of doping violations, but uh, the Wood Review, as was mentioned in the earlier contribution from Senator Farrell, went well beyond anti-doping violations to uh, the whole issue of the commercialisation of sports and, for example, the rise in sports betting, which has resulted in the manipulation of outcomes and, again, further undermining the integrity of sport. So, I want to say from the outset, uh, it is absolutely critical uh, that we see a level playing field, that we make sure that all athletes who are participating fairly, uh, that are doing what they do because they love what they do and they're doing it honestly, that they are able to compete in a level playing field. And uh, we need to do everything we can to stop people who game the system, who manipulate the system and who cheat. But we do have to think about it as a system. It's not just uh, an athlete in isolation. As I've said previously in this place, modern sport's an industry, it's big business, and athletes uh, don't compete on their own. I often listen to Ash Barty, one of Australia's uh, most, I think, significant figures in Australian sport over the past decade. You rarely hear Ash Barty talk about herself as Ash Barty, the individual. It's always our team. And high-profile athletes are, are almost always part of a much bigger team. They're surrounded by coaches, by trainers, by nutritionists, by physios, a whole range of other support staff. Um, I said this when we were debating an earlier a bill. Uh, it's true that athletes will always bear ultimate responsibility for what goes into their bodies and pay the price when mistakes are made. But if athletes and entire teams are found to have wandered into the doping grey areas and beyond, it's as much an organisational failure, a systems failure, as a case of individual cheating by athletes. Mm -hmm. So we need to consider that context. That context is absolutely critical. I've actually heard from a, a range of former athletes um, uh, when I previously was engaged in, in this portfolio and, and was uh, prosecuting a, a previous bill. Uh, what we've heard is that athletes find this system very invasive. It's intense. Uh, it exposes them to a level of scrutiny that very few people can imagine. They're required to frequently report their whereabouts. Holidays are really hard to organise. They have to be available for testing. They basically have to have their sport control all aspect of their lives. Their diary has to be absolutely coordinated with any potential for testing. And it makes life difficult. Most people do it and they do it voluntarily and willingly because they love what they do. But it does provide a huge challenge for many athletes. Of course, most concerningly, we've heard from uh, athletes uh, who've received anti-doping violations for missing an appointment for absolutely valid reasons. We've heard from them, uh, who, athletes who provide a sample but leave uh, competition because they need to get home uh, and receive a sanction for not providing a second sample, even though the first sample might have been clean. And if you had enough of those warnings, it has a huge impact on an athlete's career, even though They've participated honestly but with integrity, and there's no question about whether they've actually engaged in cheating. So, given the concerns we've had raised with us, it's important that we scrutinise all of the proposed changes with regards to this bill and understand what their impact is on decent people, on the athletes who do what they love and do it so that we can enjoy watching them excel in their chosen sport. In 2013, uh, I was successful in securing amendments to a, a SADA bill that protected the athlete's right to science, silence. And at the time, I said that it was my view that the privilege against self-incrimination is fundamental in a democratic system of justice, and that forcing an athlete or support, per support personnel to give evidence, even if it could compromise their own career, does fly in the face of this principle. And Senator Farrell said this earlier. I mean, this is a right we afford to 
criminals, to people who are fa facing criminal charges. If it's a right that's afforded uh, to people who are facing criminal charges, uh, then surely it's a right that should be afforded to athletes. It's a fundamental legal principle. So we do support a better system, a fairer system, but we do have to scrutinise the detail of this bill very, very clearly. And we do have some concerns uh, about some of the matters that are reflected in this bill, and uh, it's for that reason that we'll be proposing some amendments shortly. I want to take a moment to, to talk about uh, some of the processes in Asada's work. And an important process in legal terms is its use of disclosure notices. As the bill's digest explains, Asada has power to issue a disclosure notice to compel certain persons to attend for questioning and to produce documents and things. ASADA can enforce its disclosure, no its disclosure notices with civil penalties. <clears throat> it's an important part of the investigative power that ASADA uses. And that's why there are very clear parameters around disclosure notices. Because the use of those disclosure notices has a very direct impact on the lives of athletes uh, and their experience, experiences of interacting with what is a very complex system. Now, one of the changes in this bill is that it would lower the threshold that's required for the CEO of ASADA to issue a disclosure notice. So at the moment, the CEO has to have a reasonable belief that a person has, and I quote, information, documents or things that may be relevant to the administration of the National Anti-Doping Scheme before issuing a disclosure notice. We think that's appropriate. But what this bill does is it changes the notion of a reasonable belief to a reasonable suspicion. Now, what's a suspicion? A hunch? If someone's performance has improved over a period of time, or we've got a hunch they might be cheating, we might issue a disclosure notice. What, uh, we are very concerned uh, that lowering the threshold for disclosure notices to a reasonable suspicion is actually setting the threshold for the use of what is a very significant power, it's setting that threshold far too low. Now, you only have to talk to the various key stakeholders to know just how um, concerned they are. The Australian Athletes Alliance, a notice, uh, uh, the Australian Athletes Alliance noted, and again I quote, the breadth of the information that can be requested in a disclosure notice is broad. Given that compliance may place a significant burden on the person receiving a disclosure notice, it's reasonable that the CEO actually believe that the disclosure notice will, real, will yield relevant information. Now, a suspicion which is tantamount to a hunch, even if reasonable, is not enough to require an athlete to provide their personal data, their phone, computer, bank accounts and other private information. That's the view of the Australian Athletes Alliance. And I think it's one that is absolutely reasonable. There's also a second aspect of the changes to disclosure notices that we've got concerns about. The bill will make it harder for athletes to access a document retained by the CEO, changing their rights to access it from uh, and I quote, at such times that the person would ordinarily be able to do so, to, and again I quote, at such times and places as the CEO thinks appropriate. So we think it's reasonable that if, this, if Fasada has significant powers to issue these disclosure notices, that there's some transparency and that athletes have the right to access that information. My colleague, uh, Senator Rice, has also spoken uh, to many of the people who have struggled with this system uh, and knowing what information is being, being relied on as they navigate what's a very complex process. They've had their phones accessed, they face significant bureaucratic hurdles just to find out what information was taken off their phones. Now, of course there's a role for appropriate investigations to make sure the system's fair, but it should be fair, it should be transparent, and it's reasonable that athletes be able to access information that's provided via disclosure notices. Uh, again, uh, when we secured the changes I mentioned earlier in the previous legislation, we also secured the right to silence um, 
uh, in that legislation. And this bill removes that right. That is, athletes would no longer be able to refuse to answer questions under a disclosure notice because it would self-incriminate. Uh, Again, that's something that we afford in the justice system to people accused of criminal charges. But since then, the governing bodies, despite the fact that we secured that in previous legislation, what we're finding now is the governing bodies are using contracts as a way to impose a requirement that athletes self-incriminate in response to a disclosure notice. And, and what that effectively does is it takes away their right to silence. So uh, what you're seeing is an undermining of what is uh, legislative protection via the use of contracts. Athletes lose their right to silence when they sign a contract to play a particular sport. Uh, it's a separate question, and it's not one really for this bill, but it's something we are concerned about and something that should be addressed. Another part of the process uh, that is, um, uh, is that currently the ASADA CEO has to have the approval of the anti-doping -dop rule violation panel. Uh, from, um, we, before issuing the disclosure notices, now we're persuaded by the views of stakeholders that the panel hasn't added much in the way of oversight, but we think it's important that athletes retain the right to appeal to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. So they might not, uh, might not be able to appeal, to the panel, uh, the, appeal the panel's decision to the AAT, but we think they should retain the right to appeal the ASADA CEO's decision to the AAT, and we're going to move an amendment to that effect. Another amendment ensures that there'd be some protection for national sporting organisations from civil liability where the uh, actions are in line with the national anti-doping scheme. That protection would extend more broadly. And again, I'd like to quote the Australian Athletes Alliance, who say, and I quote, we oppose this amendment because it would deny an athlete any recourse if they suffer a loss as a result of their national sporting organisation's breach of its duty of care. Even for an athlete who's exonerated, the ramifications of an anti-doping matter on their career, on their mental health, on their reputation can be substantial. Accordingly, a national sporting organisation must be required to exercise due care, and if it fails to do so, an athlete should be able to hold it to account. We've heard of athletes who are not able to compete after circumstances beyond their control, such as not being able to provide as I said earlier, a second sample because they had to catch a flight even though their first sample was clean. Look, there are lots and lots of stories. There, some of them are from people with household names, people who have competed internationally, uh, some are competing in their spare time on top of full-time work. Uh, work. Um, there's an example of uh, one that's in the news at the moment. The um, sample taken from Bronson Zeri in November 2019 where the results weren't released until months later in 2020. Now, of course, where there's a reasonable suspicion, it's appropriate to conduct an investigation, but surely it should be timely and transparent, given the impact it's going to have on that person's life. Uh, finally, uh, there's an amendment that would establish an ombudsman to support athletes. Uh, we think that's important. The legislation that's been passed by this place is significant. It will result in major changes to the sports integrity framework we think there should be uh, an athlete's ombudsman established. Again, we want a clear system, we want a level playing field, but it also has to ensure some basic fundamental rights for athletes who are under investigation. So we support the overall objective the government's pursuing, but we will be moving amendments to make the system fairer. Senator Natale, your time's expired. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I, like probably Senator Di Natale and Senator Farrell, are wrapped that the true code starts again tonight and we've got AFL uh, back on our TVs. Uh, so the southern states are very, very excited about that. Um, and haven't we missed it? Haven't we missed it? Um, you know, and just thinking about the impact of COVID on community sport, uh, on our representative uh, athletes, who were hoping to head off to Tokyo Olympics uh, with Miss Wimbledon this year. So there's been a whole uh, raft of things that are part of our daily lives, if we're involved in community sport, but also part of our national identity and, and the international stage. So um, I'm very much like everyone else uh, who's contributed to this bill, looking forward to um, community sport and, and our international sporting 
arrangements getting uh, back on track. Enhancing Australia's anti-doping capabilities is an incredibly important issue when it comes to sporting integrity. Uh, our young Australians look up to our athletes and our sporting stars as model citizens of how to conduct uh, themselves, to understand sportmans sportsmanship, uh, fairness, how to play in teams, key skills and characteristics that they actually need for life. And as others have mentioned, sport is also big business. Huge number of people are employed right across our economy in, uh, in sport. Volunteering levels are through the roof, and sport also um, and activity levels. Sport participation assists with great health outcomes uh, and, and social outcomes. And as I said earlier, it also instils national pride, as we see Australian athletes and teams uh, always <laughs> punching, riding, swimming, or running uh, above their weight which makes us very, very proud. But we also are known globally not for just being hard at it on the track or in the pool or on the field, uh, but also being champions of fair play and a fair go and integrity. Sport has shaped our culture and identity as Australian and it reflects our broader values uh, of sportsmanship and respect for the umpire. It unites our nation like nothing else, bringing diverse political views together, people from different geographies, different cultures, to come together and celebrate our success uh, as one. From grassroots to the world's iconic grass courts and arenas, sports gives us our heroes. And we celebrate Stephen Bradbury not only because, because he won a winter gold medal, Winter Olympics gold medal, but because he was there against all the odds and stood tall as those around him fell. Uh, from Betty Cuthbert to Louise Sauvage, we share Australia's victories as we, and we expect a level playing field. This bill really puts us as Australians as leading the world in setting up a sports integrity system. On August 5, 2017, the then Sports Minister Greg Hunt announced a review into Australia's sports integrity arrangements to be led by uh, Justice James Wood, QC. I had the great privilege to release that Wood review in August 2018, and it was a key component in the development of Australia's first comprehensive national sports plan, Sport 2030. I want to thank uh, James Wood and his fellow panel members for their efforts in producing the most comprehensive review of Australia's sports integrity arrangements ever conducted. The Wood review found doping is much more prevalent and widespread than ever among athletes at all levels. And we often think of the high-profile examples that have been mentioned in contributions thus far. But what the Wood review found was that uh, issues in teams at amateur levels, in junior competitions, were being affected um, and that we really needed a strong system of monitoring and compliance uh, right across the sporting landscape to ensure that those young athletes were protected. The Wood Review also found serious and organised crime was involved in match fixing and the supply of performance and uh, performance enhancing drug. Under our nation's first sports plan, Sport 2030, we now have a clear path to know what is needed to ensure we build a more active Australia, that we can achieve sporting excellence and back community uh, grassroots sports at the same time. But we must safeguard the integrity of sport, which this bill seeks to achieve. The election and subsequent introduction of this bill into parliament um, post-election last year has allowed for additional consultation with stakeholders in both private and public sectors, and as a result uh, we now have greater clarity and context to the proposed amendments in the bill. Since the bill's first introduction in the previous parliament, uh, changes have been made to allow ASADA's secrecy provisions to be included uh, within Schedule 3 of the Freedom of Information Act, and very minor and consequential amendments to harmonise operations within our Sports Integrity Australia Bill. The proposed amendments will streamline administrative procedures in relation to anti-doping rule violations and reduce the burden on sports athletes and support personnel. <coughs> These amendments are supported by the feedback of stakeholders and include the removal of the anti-doping rule violation panel from the rule violation process and the removal of a pathway for review uh, by the Administrative Appeals Tribunal of a preliminary anti-doping rule violation decision of the RSADA CEO. 
These amendments, along with the previously introduced National Sports Tribunal Bill, are a complementary package of reforms. The ultimate decision as to whether a person has committed a violation will be made by a fair, independent, impartial decision maker. This government is implementing vital reforms to safeguard the integrity of Australian sport and to combat present, emerging and future threats, including doping, match-fixing, illegal betting, organised crime and corruption. These reforms include establishing a new single national sports integrity agency, Sport Integrity Australia, <coughs> which brings together ASADA, the National Integrity of Sport Unit and national sports integrity functions of Sport Australia. Legislation establishing Sport Integrity Australia was passed by the Senate in February this year, uh, and it stipulates the start of the new agency on 1 July 2020, and that will be headed by David Sharp, uh, OAM. Sport Integrity Australia will focus on regulation, monitoring and intelligence, policy and program delivery, including education and outreach. Sports betting integrity capabilities will be maintained with ongoing support of the world-leading sports betting integrity unit within the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission. The government has established the National Sports Tribunal, which began operations in March this year. Uh, that's been created to provide a transparent, independent and cost-effective resolution to sports disputes. The National Sports Tribunal will be trialled over two years and comprises of an anti-doping division, general division and an appeals division. Our government's record on safeguarding sport is there for the world to see. In February last year, on behalf of the Australian government, um, I signed the Makolin um, Convention, and it's great to see the foreign minister uh, who was there on the day with me, uh, Senator uh, Maurice Payne. It's the only multilateral treaty specifically aimed at combating match-fixing and other related corruption in sport. Because what we do know is organised crime uh, doesn't restrict itself to state boundaries or national boundaries. This is a worldwide problem, and we need to work with other jurisdictions uh, to actually uh, mitigate uh, the impacts and to ensure that sport is fair for all. Uh, and, the, and the Macalin Convention actually um, is a great step forward in that, in that effort to protect uh, the safety, fairness and integrity of the sporting competitions we all enjoy so much. Membership of the Macalin community enables Australia to obtain formal, ongoing access to international counterparts and meetings to work together and drive these measures to combat sport corruption at a global level. Signing the convention supports national match-fixing, criminal legislation and complements similar laws where they exist within our states and territories to protect sport from wagering-related corruption. The integrity of sport is of paramount importance and our athletes expect to compete on a level playing field. We want them to compete on a level playing field because we know uh, we do all right on a level playing field as, Australia's, as Australians. As I said earlier, sport keeps us fit and healthy. It's the social glue that binds us together. It creates communities and underpins much of community's life, and especially for those of us that live in the regions. Boston Consulting Group uh, actually did a review of Australian sport in 2017, and it showed that every year 14 million Australians participate in some form of sporting activity. And, as I said earlier, sport generates in excess of $40 billion of economic activity, making upwards of 3 per cent of our GDP, equivalent to our agriculture sector. So we're not, actually, we're not only just good at it, we, it underpins um, a lot of our economic activity, and a lot of Australians are employed uh, within our sporting industry. Each year, the Australian government invests more than $300 million to support our high-performance athletes as they uh, prepare for a variety of international competitions uh, and the pathways for younger athletes as they seek to uh, aspire to the very highest levels of sporting prowess. I'm very proud of our government's record of investing millions to encourage greater participation at a community and grassroots level in sport. Um, we had a raft of measures under Sport 2030, including community infrastructure investment to help sporting clubs uh, build those change rooms that they need to ensure that young women and girls who are seeking to participate in NRL, in, who are 
seeking to participate in traditional male sports such as rugby union, AFL, cricket, etc., have somewhere where they can safely get changed uh, for the game. And that's been a great boon for so many sporting clubs out there in communities. Another program to increase participation focused on senior Australians. Once you get a little older and the and I'm in that category and you don't run as fast as you used to, you might give up participating in your loved sport. But what you also then end up missing out on is the social connection uh, that you have from engaging in that community activity. So a, a raft of money focused on ensuring we encourage senior Australians back into their local community clubs, whether it be soccer or netball, with modified game plans to ensure that they're also staying physically healthy. Uh, we also had a raft of measures that support sort of that increase in participation, um, which I'm incredibly proud of uh, our government backing the National Sports Plan and working with our state governments uh, to really find those pathways for young athletes, um, whether they particularly are growing up in rural and regional areas, uh, getting to that state level competition, financial support to get to the national competitions, uh, which can often be a barrier for them to really pursuing their dreams. Sport plays a fundamental role in Australia's life. Uh, we have obligations under UNESCO's International Convention Against Doping in Sport to abide by the principle of the World Anti-Doping Code. To that end, the Wood Review recommended a range of enhancements to the capabilities of ASADA. And our government is committed to delivering on those recommendations. The Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Amendment, enhancing Australia's anti-doping capability bill, will assist in combating the complex and evolved, evolving nature of doping in sport. I'm very proud to be part of a government that takes these matters seriously because sport is powerful and uh, we want people to be safely participating in it so that we can all be rightfully proud of Australian athletes on the international stage and be comforted that the juniors that are making their way uh, through the ranks um, on their way to that elite level uh, are equally protected from uh, undue influence from organised crime and, uh, and other, other sort of uh, negative influences. Our response will protect our cherished Australian sports for generations to come and have a lasting effect on the lives of all sport-loving Australians. I'm sure those sitting opposite share that aspiration for safe, fair, inclusive sport underpinning thriving communities, and it was a pleasure to work with the opposition uh, whilst I uh, was the sports minister in evolving um, our integrity arrangements. And I know, um, Senator Farrell, uh, as the shadow minister, you have enjoyed equally productive conversations with the current sports minister. This bill will help safeguard Australian sport and combat current emerging and future threats of doping, match-fixing, illegal betting, organised crime and corruptions. Parents and guardians of junior athletes will know their children are protected from sport integrity th threats and be confident the sports in which they participate are clean, safe and fair. I would like to think uh, there's a lot of bipartisan goodwill around to make sure that that, 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 that that aspiration is achieved, and I've been very buoyed by the contributions thus far. Uh, I support the bill. Being that it is 12.44 and 45 seconds, we will now move to Senator's statements. Uh, Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. In the last few months, I have been inundated with calls from concerned constituents as to how Australia will move forward after <laughs> the coronavirus lockdown. As the saying goes, no wind blows in a favour of a ship without direction. To ensure we head in the right direction, it is important to lay out a clear path that will encourage the Australian people to be innovative, productive and, most importantly, independent. To do this, governments must stand up for Australians who try to stand up for themselves and provide essential services that individuals can't provide for themselves. All Australians should be given access to a fair, efficient and level playing field on which to succeed. After the protests last weekend, it is evident that state governments have failed to do this, and I condemn them for their failure to enforce laws that have had a devastating impact on our small business community. 
Their lives and livelihoods matter too. The first measure that must be addressed is monetary policy. Australia does not need foreign capital, and the cheerleaders who advocate this should actually take the time to understand what real capital is. Our people and how they exploit our nation's untapped wealth for themselves and their children. The father of modern Australia, Lachlan Macquarie, knew this when he introduced the holy dollar as a means to fund the building of new infrastructure. Quite simply, a country cannot protect its sovereignty or manage its economy if it doesn't control its currency or its critical infrastructure. The Reserve Bank must fund an infrastructure bank that will underwrite nation-building projects. An infrastructure bank is where monetary policy meets fiscal policy, and it is the link that governments need to grow our economy. If there has been a fundamental flaw in the Western government's response to the GFC, it has been propping up inefficient companies and banks instead of building productive infrastructure, like China whose economy has grown strongly because of its commitment to nation-building infrastructure. Let's not forget, 50 years ago, China was coming out of the Cultural Revolution, yet today it has managed to pull out a billion people out of poverty because its central bank, and not foreign banks, funded the development of infrastructure. A recent report by Goldman Sachs estimates that the G10 central banks have printed $16 trillion in the last two years. This free capital given to foreign corporations should not be allowed to invest in Australian infrastructure or government bonds. Why? Because it's a monetary tariff that gives foreign corporations a com competitive advantage over Australian companies. It's time monetary policy manipulation was called out by the World Trade Organisation. The next policy that must be addressed is our taxation system. While too numerous to mention all areas of reform, I will touch on a few. The first of these is the rate of tax on above-the-line profits, such as royalties, rent and interest, paid offshore. Onshore profits in Australia are taxed at much higher rates than profits sent offshore thanks to our tax treaties, which have lowered the offshore tax rate to as low as zero. Australia to needs to retain its own capital before increasing foreign debt. To encourage this, withholding taxes on profits sent offshore should increase to fund a cut in income tax for low-income workers. Of all the taxes that government levy, few cause more collateral damage than payroll tax. It is compliance-heavy, with numerous exemptions, rates and thresholds across multiple states. It is like a sledgehammer to productivity. Payroll tax exists in present-day Australia for one reason and one reason only. The state governments simply can't afford to give it up, but they should. In the 21st century, due to advances in technology, labour has become more mobile, enabling the offshoring of Australian jobs. Reducing payroll tax would encourage Australian companies to keep jobs onshore and stimulate the rebirth of Australian manufacturing. If the federal government could nationalise the Corporations Act in 2001, then it should reform payroll tax, which is effectively only levied on companies. Of course, to do this will require federation reform. The fact that a federal system conceived in the final decade of the 19th century, designed to encourage competition and productivity, delivers perverse outcomes in the 21st century suggests our federation is no longer fit for purpose. Australian business and innovation cannot compete in a global market under our current, current model of federation. The communist process and our dystopian bureaucracy continually undermines our individual freedoms and impedes progress at every step. It is time to hold the Constitutional Convention to clarify the responsibilities of the states and remove the fiscal imbalance between the state and federal government. Australian people and entities should not be subject to multiple sets of rules and regulations. The ambiguous responsibilities are confusing at least, and as we saw with the Ruby Princess, tragic at worst. The overregulation of multiple governments 
of multiple government levels impedes our liberties, destroys innovation and suffocates inspiration. If this process doesn't mimic communism, then I don't know what does. I propose that the federal government take full responsibility for funding the entire national health system, including most significantly the public hospitals with regions such as Brisbane Metro North to take direct charge of operations. Currently, the federal government funds Medicare, has substantive control over aged care, the NDIS, public health insurance, pharmaceutical benefit scheme. So why not quite simply run the lot? In reality, health care is not a service with, with elasticity of choice and what will not readily respond to competition which could be relevant in other government service areas. By contrast, education, particularly school education, is an area where competition can play a part. It is retrograde to, su to suggest that a bureaucrat or a politician sitting in Canberra knows best on how to ta tailor a curriculum or support services to suit the needs of kids in Toorak, Tennant Creek or Townsville. If Australia were to adopt this suggestion and end the current Frankenstein communist funding model, this would deliver a net annual windfall of approximately $45 billion to state governments. This could then be used to effectively underwrite the abolition of payroll tax, which amounted to approximately $25 billion in the 2018-19 year alone. The current funding model of distributing GST also needs to change. The current model is opaque and encourages inefficient states to stay that way rather than become more productive. Just as the old white building down the hill is no longer fit for purpose and ultimately became a museum to another time, so too much of the federal architecture that defined that building has now outlived its ability to serve our Commonwealth in the 21st century. One final but not exhaustive measure would be to make superannuation voluntary and not compulsory. Hard-working Australians need access to their hard-earned incomes today. Overpaid fund managers, super tax breaks and industry funds are an $80 billion cost to the economy this country cannot afford. In concluding, I would like to pay tribute to all, of, all Australians and their response to the coronavirus. In particular, I would like to mention our small to medium business owners who have had to endure an enormous amount of stress and financial hardship. Our party's founder, Robert Menzies, described you as the backbone of this nation, and his words still ring true today. In the same, you carried, in the same way you carried the nation on its back, it is time for our political class to help you back on your feet. Without your motivation, innovation and persistence, Australia cannot succeed. As Menzies said, men without ambition readily become slaves. As Australia's elected leaders, it is time to capitalise on the mood for change amongst Australian people and drive the recovery from the coronavirus. Thank you, Dep Acting Deputy President. Senator Stirl. No, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Um, my contribution this will not come as a shock to you or myself, but I want to bring this to the attention of the Chamber. Now, I'm going to quote from the Channel 9 um, news article uh, a truck driver by the name of Saman Deep Singh was driving a truck in Melbourne. And he knew his brakes were faulty, but he drove on anyway before hitting and killing a Victorian police officer. And the report says that Singh and I want to pay the greatest respect firstly to Constable Dion De Leo and her family and her loved ones. And in no way am I going to tend to Victor, uh, to uh, uh, single out Mr Singh, but he was in charge of the truck at the time. He, uh, he smashed into 45-year-old First Constable Diane De Leo's motorbike in suburban Melbourne as she was riding to work in January of 2017. Now, this is the worst part. This is the report that said, and I've watched the video on, on the uh, internet too, that the truck wasn't roadworthy. Singh knew the rear brakes were not working and the front brakes were compromised because the vehicle was loaded incorrectly. The TV report from Channel 9 clearly said that the driver had no experience. He was a young 30-year-old man. I don't know what pain that poor 
fellow's going through now. Obviously, um, he's in a very, very uh, difficult position. He's in jail. He's been jailed for four years. We have not only the life of a constable on their way to work been snatched, but this young man's life, I don't know how he could put it back together. He's covered himself in tattoos to honour the police constable, or the, uh, the, the, the police, the first constable that unfortunately he killed. <laughs> tattoos with her police number and the date of the accident. I mean, my God, the pain that must be going through a number of families because of this accident that should never have happened. And what pains me even more, Mr Acting Deputy President, is you and I did a lot of work through the RAT Committee, the Road Safety Inquiry. And a lot of that work in the road safety inquiry was channelled towards the poor conditions of a lot of our trucks, the vehicles on the road, the heavy vehicles. Not only that, the corruption that we uncovered in training, and we'll call it training, where uh, unscrupulous rat bags had lied, cheated, stolen, done whatever they could to take money and fork out cheap or not cheap. Uh, very poor training and then have a connection where they could get these drivers their licences and you know where it went from there. And Three years later, Mr Acting Deputy President, as the chair of the RAC committee, I'm still waiting for the government to come back and respond to the report that we wrote, that you and I and other senators put the work into. Now, to go back to Mr Singh as he was coming down the, the road, and I'll quote what he says. He said, I started trying to brake from about a kilometre away. Now, as an ex-truck driver, and this was a 12-tonne truck. I never drove 12-tonne. I was road trains. But a kilometre away, and the truck wasn't slowing down fast enough. He told a witness after the January 12 crash at a one turner intersection. The 14-tonne Isuzu truck, sorry, I said 12, it was a 14-tonne Isuzu truck, a rigid truck, was owned by ERMS Transport, E-R-M-E-S, ERMS Transport and they had a record of shoddy maintenance by an unqualified mechanic. I can't believe in 2020 I'm reading this, even though the accident was back then. No, I can believe it, because there is, there is no rules around in this nation to go after the root cause. The poor truck driver, when all is said and done—I say the poor truck driver because, as I said, the pain he must be going through—but the family of the victim don't wish any ill, Ill uh, towards Mr Singh, and that's, that's a very big call. But can you believe the trucking company was not investigated? Now, I've Googled Erms Transport. I've spoken to people in Victoria. I said, who the hell is Erms Transport? But typical of this nation, you go on the ATSIC register. Oh, we can't find out who the name is. Can't, I can't find out who it is. You can't Google. There's no website for Erms Transport. It was loaded. Whose freight were they carting? Were they subcontracting to another transport company? And I'm not blaming that other transport company at this stage. I'm just, I've got to highlight this. Or were they cutting directly for a client? When you lose, and we lose 1,200 lives a year in road accidents, and we manage to injure and maim another 30,000. But a young man's life has been completely ruined. And I don't know if he was forced to do it. Uh, I've got no idea. It pretty much sounds like it. But the owner of the truck has walked scot-free. How many other trucks does this company own? How many other employees have been forced or driving trucks that they knew work was done by a shoddy mechanic? Not my words. That's the, that's the, that's the quote in the report. How many other drivers were uh, virtually uh, uh, told, just get in the truck and go? I can't believe that this trucking company, for all I know, could still be out there. They're still registered. I don't mean a thing. I mean myself, and I'm sending a message out to all Australian trucking companies. Erms Transport, whoever that is, and there are sickos in this nation that get rewarded by changing their company name, and I'm going to save that because I've got a list of them. They're all going to get named in this Senate before I leave. Must be put on a do not use register. There is no way known that any decent man or woman in this nation would want to engage Erms Transport. And yet the sadness is the police, the police could not investigate that company. 
because the oh, Senator Gallagher, you know, you and I can get wound up pretty good and pretty quickly. But under the chain of responsibility, now I'm sick of that crap, that chain of responsibility. We've been talking, how long have we been talking about this, Senator Gallagher? 30 years, the chain of responsibility. This was going to be the thing that fixes everything. What's it done? It's done five eights of stuff all. I think there's been four, four prosecutions. But Erms Transport could be running around, the man who owns Erms Transport or the manager that directed the driver to go out there and drive the unworthy truck, even though you've got a licence but you haven't been trained, you're not qualified. Where did the licence come from? How did that man get his licence? Who did this supposed training? Who passed him? How does this happen? But also to the, the uh, owner of Erms Transport. How you can sleep at night is I don't even know who you are, who, how many of you are, but to allow a man, the man's off and there, he's doing four years jail. A family have lost a loved one. And the police could not prosecute. This is just absolutely incredible. And what I'm trying to get back to is every time I, in this chamber and in Senate inquiries and all around this nation, alongside Senator Gallagher, we raise the issue of road safety all the time. And we say that it should absolutely be front and mind of all of us in this chamber and the other place over there. Deaths at work, in trucks or on the road should not be a price of doing business. Where is it in our psyche that it is wrong to crunch down on those that are doing the wrong thing when it comes to heavy vehicles or any vehicles on the road? Who in this chamber or that chamber thinks that it would not be right to go all the way down that rabbit hole and find out who the hell Erms Transport are and where are they now and who were they carting for and are they still carting? And where are the other employees, if there are, and I don't think for one minute it was only one truck, Just couldn't, I don't think that for one minute. Who would support that? No one. And yet, when Senator Gallagher and I raise all these road safety issues around an industry that us too, with the greatest of respect, Senator Gallagher and I, have forgotten more about heavy vehicles and road transport than anyone else. And that's not being rude. That was our background. That's where we came from. And yet every time we go to raise the issue of how qualified are our truck drivers, this is before we start, to, I'm not even talking about wage theft or anything else yet, how safe are those vehicles on the road? Now the majority of the road transport industry, majority, majority, not all of them, are very decent, hard-working men and women. But unfortunately we have a minority like the grubs at Erms Transport, just one, and I'm coming back with more. And yet they can allow lives to be destroyed or taken away, and they can walk off scot-free. I can't think how annoyed the police, the Victorian police would be about this. And there's another incident going on where other police were killed too. So I want to send the message, I don't know how many more times I have to say this, I cannot get it through the Deputy Prime Minister's head. He loves to have a photo taken with a high-vis jacket and a camera with some bling on, and we love our truckies during the pandemic. Well, you know what? When is the Deputy Prime Minister going to answer or respond to that hard-done report that Senator Gallagher and I wrote three years ago? Thank you, Senator Stirl. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a statement on Black Lives Matter and our work for justice. Over the last couple of weeks, a global anti-racist movement has re-emerged to fight for racial justice and against police brutality and institutional racism. The Black Lives Matter movement has been led by black and indigenous people and supported by people of color and allies from all backgrounds. I was pr proud to join the huge rally at Sydney Town Hall. This protest memorialized the violent and brutal deaths of George Floyd in the United States and David Dange Jr. at Long Bay Prison in Sydney, both while in custody. It called for an end to black deaths in custody. Dozens of other huge rallies and gatherings were held across the country over the long weekend as well, from Wagga Wagga to Wollongong, from Alice Springs to Toowoomba. There has been a great deal of bluster this week about whether these rallies were appropriate during COVID-19 restrictions, but to me, the choice was clear. There's no doubt that the virus is dangerous. We are all making sacrifices to stop the spread. 
But systemic racism is also very dangerous. It kills and contributes to many deaths in this country. The rallies are part of a global movement. I can't help but notice that in other countries, such as the United States and England, which have been hit hard by COVID-19, there are serious, long overdue conversations about racism and discrimination happening in the wake of these protests, and even some institutional changes as well. In Australia, though, we're still stuck in whether the protest should have happened at all. The question we should be asking is what has prompted tens of thousands of people to come out onto the streets demanding justice, demanding recognition from the state that black lives matter, demanding simply that First Nations people have the same right to live as others in Australia. Just earlier this week, after many days of charged protests and rallies, it was announced that Minneapolis City Council would defund its police department and invest in new models for ensuring community safety. On Sunday, the City Council President pledged to ending policing as we know it and recreate systems that actually keep us safe. Calls for police abolition have deep, decades-old roots in anti-racist movements. This idea has again come to the fore in the last few weeks and is being discussed in public. In Australia, we should be having the same conversations about the viability of a so-called justice system which perpetrates violence on indigenous people. We should not be afraid of a conversation about rethinking the very idea of policing and incarceration and looking at systems of community safety that do not inflict harm upon racial and cultural minorities. The criminal justice system is an obvious harbor for systemic racism. At least 437 indigenous people have died in custody in Australia since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody report was handed down in 1991, according to the Guardian Australia's tracking project. This is a shocking number in itself. It's made much worse by the fact that no one has been found criminally responsible for any of these deaths. Further reporting by The Guardian this week brought to light new evidence of the way the police and the criminal justice system discriminate on a daily basis. In New South Wales, over the last few years, police have chosen to pursue more than 80% of Indigenous people found with small amounts of cannabis through the courts. Meanwhile, non-Indigenous people are being let off with warnings, a classic case of police discretion being used in a discriminatory way. We don't need to look too far to see discrimination of indigenous people and other people of color within our institutions, including health, education, and social services. It is a national shame that Aboriginal life expectancy is so far below that of other Australians. And this is a direct result of institutional racism in many ways. We must stamp out racism, discrimination, marginalization and violence. And the reality is that to do this, our police forces and criminal justice system needs to be radically overhauled. Decision makers overseas are actively listening to the protesters. Hard conversations are happening. Change is happening. People are thinking and talking about systemic racism in a way that perhaps they never have before. What has happened here? The government is more interested in attacking me, in attacking Senator Rice and other MPs and the tens of thousands of people who attended the rallies than actually talking about the substantive issue at hand. And now the Prime Minister is trying to blame the impacts of a slow return to normality on First Nations activists and their allies who are marching and fighting for black lives. Mr. Morrison has said if protesters show up to another rally, they should be charged. This is not leadership. This is myopic and reactionary malice. This is complete failure to listen. This is our chance. This is our moment to talk about justice, to make the radical changes 
needed to upend a system that has failed, fa failed First Nations people on all levels and killed many. An essential poll this week found 80% of Australians believe there is institutional racism in the United States. But only 30% of the same people believed Australian police had a racism problem. This is why people are marching. Institutional racism, police brutality, and systemic violence against black people is not a thing over there. It is happening right here in our own country. In fact, it's a reality that indigenous people live with every day. It's a reality Latona Dange lives with every single day of her life. Like George Floyd, her son, David Dange's last words too were, I can't breathe, just before his horrific death in custody. This happened in Australia, not overseas. We can't proclaim how great a multicultural country we are, how we don't need to worry about racism as much as other countries, while refusing to even try to understand the tens of thousands of people who showed up last weekend to support Black Lives Matter, dismissing the extensive evidence of rising and very much real racism in this country and looking away from Aboriginal people who die in custody. This is not a great multicultural country if we can't even do that. But I guess, according to Liberal Minister Alan Tudge, we have Asian Australians on MasterChef, so we have nothing to worry about, right? Government ministers have been falling over each other to make disparaging statements against the activists who marched for Black Lives Matter, calling the protests self-indulgent and reckless. If there's anything that has become clear in the last two weeks, it is that the government has its head deeply buried in the sand, and willfully so, to ignore the violence perpetrated against indigenous people in this country. Let me tell you, you won't be able to hide for much longer. If Black Lives Matter has shown us anything, it's that there is an enormous appetite in the community for a radical change in the way our society works. I acknowledge with great humility the hard work of Black Lives Matter organizers and activists across the world who are pushing so tirelessly for change. And I offer my heartfelt condolences to the families and loved ones of all those who have been killed due to racist violence. We will continue to fight for justice. Senator Hume. Acting Deputy President, this is a time of crisis, unprecedented in the history of the nation and under conditions never before paralleled in this country. Now, I would like to take credit for those words and that sentence, but sadly, I cannot. I know you could be forgiven to think, for thinking that potentially I was its order, author about to deliver a speech to the chamber about the health and the economic implications of the coronavirus epidemic. But in fact, those were the words first recorded in Hansard, spoken by a female voice in this chamber. And it was a very different moment in time, six long decades ago, during the Second World War, when Dame Dorothy Tangney was the first woman elected to the Australian Senate, and she rose to, gave her to give her maiden speech. Her words, though, are eerily relevant today, and particularly this week, in this very strange, socially distanced sitting of the parliament. And, of course, they're also more profound knowing that tomorrow, when the Senate sits, we will in fact mark the anniversary of Australian women first earning the right to vote and to stand for federal elections. In June 1902, the Commonwealth Franchise Act was passed, and that was the law that granted most Australian women the right to vote and therefore also to stand in Commonwealth elections. 
In April 1902, it was Senator the Honourable Richard Edward O'Connor, who was at that stage the Vice President of the Executive Council, who introduced the Commonwealth Franchise Bill into the Senate with the intention of creating a uniform franchise for the Commonwealth. The original bill actually sought to extend the franchise not only to all women over 21 years of age, but also to Indigenous Australians. The government at the time estimated that around 725,000 new voters would be added to the electoral roll as a result of this reform. That, in today's terms, is around the population of Tasmania and the Northern Territory combined. As you would imagine, the bill at that time provoked considerable debate. Uh, in both in the new Commonwealth Parliament and also in the media and around the dinner table. It was reported in the newspapers of the day there were plenty of opponents to women's suffrage who made various claims, including that women didn't actually want the vote and that they already exercised considerable influence through their domestic roles. The bill was, however, successful, however not in its orig original form. The Act stated that all persons not under 21 years of age, uh, sorry, all persons under 21 years of age, whether male or female, married or unmarried, would be entitled to vote in Commonwealth elections, but it, in the end, excluded Indigenous men and women unless they were eligible to vote under state laws in accordance with Section 41 of the Australian Constitution. It would actually take another six decades until Indigenous women and men were fully included in the franchise. So across Australia, men, uh, women, I, I should say, voted for the first time in the second ever Commonwealth elections held on the 16th of December 1903. And four women actually stood at that first election as candidates that year. They were, in fact, the first women to nominate for any national parliament within what was then the British Empire. None were elected. And indeed, another 22 women followed between 1903 and the Second World War, and they too were unsuccessful. It was over 40 years that passed between the royal assent of the Commonwealth Franchise Act when Dame Charity Tangney and Dame Enid Lyons took their seats in the Senate and the House of Representatives, respectively. And 235 women have since had the honour of representing their state or their electorate in this place since then. Despite the hurdles, despite the stumbles, despite its opponents and its inadequacies, particularly when seen through a contemporary lens, the passage of the Commonwealth Franchise Act is an important moment in Australia's history which needs to be noticed and is a time for us to pause and to reflect. From my own perspective, although the Act passed 118 years ago, I was astounded to find that I was in fact only the 14th woman to represent Victoria when I was elected to the Senate in 2016. Like so many of my predecessors, it took four rather bruising attempts at pre-selection over many years before I was given that honour. I don't resent this. In fact, I wear it as a badge of pride, for it is indeed a rare honour to serve. My only regret is that I didn't put my hand up sooner. I should have backed myself earlier. Today, there are more women serving in parliament than ever before, more women in cabinet than ever before. And I'm very proud to see so many very talented women that are at the helm of portfolios that play a critical role at this time, particularly throughout COVID-19. Ministers like Maurice Payne, Linda Reynolds, Anne Ruston, Karen Andrews, Michaelia Cash, just to name a few. These are women at the front line of Australia's successful response, and they are supported by so many. There are also many women across the, um, on the other side of the chamber, those opposite and on the crossbench, who I may not always agree with, in fact, I may disagree more often than not, but whom I genuinely admire for their tenacity, their strength, their intellect and their patriotism. They are indeed all patriots. The diversity of backgrounds of the women who have entered here is striking. From my own side of politics, we've had lawyers, accountants, small business owners, academics, doctors, farmers, real estate agents, nurses, tourism operators, housewives, public servants, company directors. Over six, over six decades, we've seen married women with large families and single women with none and every permutation and combination in between. They've come from the city, they've come from the country, from privilege and from poverty, from political families or, like me, those who were the first in their families to enter the political life. Backgrounds are important because they provide a unique perspective and that is where the wisdom of crowds comes from. So what then for the next generation? Because there is still work to be done and I encourage women at any age and at any stage and from any background and any walk of life to consider public life. It's crazy and it's demanding and it tests your intellect and ability and it can be very challenging but I think every woman in this place would agree 
that to be part of and to contribute to something, to meaningful change, is by far the most fulfilling thing that anyone can do. And I think my colleagues would also attest that even as a rookie backbencher, you can have a very powerful voice in the party room. I promised in my maiden speech that I would not pull the ladder up behind me and that I would reach down my hand to those who come after. It's the best way, I think, to honour not only those trailblazers who have come before, but to the women who have also tried and not made it, for whatever reason that may be. You often hear that women are our own worst enemy. Well, I beg to differ. In fact, I think that's a truly banal platitude, largely used to foment division and suspicion among female colleagues. My experience could not be further from the truth. We need more women to put their hands up and to take the plunge. And as women like Dorothy Tangney and Enid Lyons proved, good government and good policy and good politics depend on this. So tomorrow I will move a motion to acknowledge the anniversary of the Commonwealth Franchise Act, and it will be co-signed co by all my colleagues, my female colleagues in the coalition. And I will ask any senator here, uh, whether they be male or female, if they would like to also co-sign it. But I would particularly like the female, my female colleagues from the opposition and from the crossbench to join me in this. I'm very pleased to hear it. Thank you. Do you know, it's commonly assumed that you become an adult on your 18th birthday. Now, I'm a mother of an 18-year-old boy, so I think I could potentially question that assertion. However, what is the milestone that we reach when we hit 118, for indeed that is the age of the Commonwealth Franchise Act? As uh, all parliamentarians, regardless of gender, enter their respective chambers tomorrow, I hope that they will acknowledge that particular anniversary, this particular milestone. Earlier, nearly, than every other country in the world did we reach 118 years where women could not only vote but enter parliament. And I hope that as they enter the chamber, that whether they be male or female, they are genuinely proud of the achievements of women from all sides of politics, all sides of the chamber, and all parts of our history, all parts of today, and all parts of the future, for they us have been so important in shaping our nation in the past, today, and in the years ahead. Thank you, Senator Hume. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I'm very mindful in this time in making my first substantive con contribution about matters topical that's provided in this forum to acknowledge um, the, the COVID crisis and how that's changed how business has been operating here in, in the parliament and how people want consensus and they don't want division. But I want to assure the Australian people, hundreds of thousands of them who received a robo-debt, that I will not be silent on their plight, that robo-debt is an egregious breach of trust between the Australian people and this government, and it is an unforgivable, unforgivable act by an Australian government. The government want to sweep the issue under the rug for a while, and the issue is that they unlawfully established debts that they sent out to the people of Australia. And at the very end of Friday, the 29th of May, Minister Stuart Robert announced an end to this program of taking money from Australians raised by debts that were uh, uh, the result of averaging by the ATO. He finally came out after denying and hiding and denying and hiding for many, many months the fact that he'd sent hundreds of thousands of Australians erroneous debts. He finally admitted to it. But there was no apology, Acting Deputy President. There was no admission of guilt and there was no acknowledgement that what this Liberal National Party government that has been governing this country for seven years had done was wrong. No grief, no apology, no sorrow. But I want to make clear who should bear the blame for the design and the implementation of this unlawful attack on the Australian people by its own government. There are three key players, Mr Morrison, Mr Porter and Mr Stuart Robert. It is indeed the Prime Minister who was the Treasurer scraping for dollars in his budget uh, management who absolutely without care for the people he was targeting in 2016 announced the robo-debt scheme. 
There have been iterations of it since, but the architect who made the announcement, the man who went after Australians' money illegally, was Mr Morrison. He started it all off. If you've got a robo-debt, please remember there are hundreds of thousands of Australians out there. Remember, it's Mr Morrison who set that system up and sent you that debt. Now, we have the Attorney General, Mr Christian Porter, who was absolutely intimately involved in the design of the scheme. He is now the first law officer of the, the land, the Attorney General for Australia, and he should have been seeking at the time legal advice about what they were proposing to do to change the way in which they were to account for Australians receiving support, uh, short-term support, and they changed it in such a way that did not allow for any human oversight. The current minister, Stuart Robert, has shown all the promotional qualities that the government relies on. He has been able to deflect blame. He has been able to deny responsibility. Uh, in fact, he became a master of it with regard to the, uh, the, the failure of the Centrelink, uh, the Centrelink um, uh, computer system. At least he said sorry for that in a sort of perverted way when he agreed it was his bad, my bad, he said, when he attributed the failure of the Centrelink system to uh, an attack, a cyber attack, when in fact what the failure was, a failure of himself as the minister and his own department to prepare for the scale of need amongst Australians. But that's what you get from these three men, Mr Morrison, Mr Porter and Mr Stuart Robert, a set of choices that are characterised by arrogance and greed. This government could have pursued multinational tax avoiders. They could have pursued those who had capacity to, play, to pay, but instead they made a choice. They made a choice and announced in 2016 that they would hound and kick down the doors of the most vulnerable in our community and unleashed debt notices for thousands and thousands of dollars, with private debt collectors chasing them up, driving people into despair and, in some cases, driving them to a point where they could no longer bear the burden of the attacks from their own government. And in the case of the very sad case that was reported over the weekend of Mr. Rhys uh, Cowzo, his mother had these words to say: "The government need to apologise, not just for the likes of myself and obviously many more families in that situation, but for people who had, put, had to put their life on hold to try and scrape back thousands of dollars. It wasn't right, and they knew that in the beginning." Apologise so that we can move forward, but don't think you're going to get out of anything. That is the voice of a mother who buried her son because he could no longer withstand the hounding of this government who sent him an illegal debt. An illegal debt. A government that knew this in September, a government that denied it, a government that refused to answer questions in the Senate at estimates and in the hearings of the Reference Committee of the Community Affairs. This government is in denial about what they have done to this country, and it is a great shame. It is a telling indictment. So where are we now? We've got more than 470,000 unlawful debts, according to evidence on the public record from the government, who are supposedly going to receive three quarters of a billion dollars in repayments. But that's not going to happen straight away, even though the government knew this was going on. They're delaying the return of that money that should never have been taken from Australians until July. Here we are in the worst economic crisis that living Australians have experienced, and the government who took money unlawfully from those Australian citizens refuses to return it in a timely way, having denied and denied and denied that they were doing the wrong thing for years, for years under questioning. The thing that concerns me is the numbers that the government throws around are so bad and their practices with regard to, to robot are so unconscionable that I'm not even sure that that's the correct number. Is it 470,000 or is it 740,000? I mean, this is the government that lost 60 billion just a couple of weeks ago. They're not really good at the numbers. What they're good at 
is creating false debts, hounding and pursuing Australian citizens literally to their death or demise. This is a stain on the nation, a stain on the nation led off by Mr Morrison, Mr Porter and backed in, backed in at every opportunity by Minister Stuart Robert. We know that the government has only come to this point of public acknowledgement of failure because the matter is to be debated in the Supreme Court. And in some perverted effort to try and contain any further information coming to public light, this government is attempting to try and keep their ministers out of the witness box. The robo-debt scheme always was and is to this day indefensible. It cannot stand up to legal scrutiny. The government have sought in estimates hearings to use public interest immunity, to say it is against the interest of the Australian people for them to tell the truth. They hid behind that. It's a just, a just a disgrace, the level of obfuscation that's going on. The Attorney General, Christian Porter, says that robo-debt was legally insufficient. But it wasn't legally insufficient for him when he was a social service minister and used that scheme to hound Australians into poverty. How can you be the nation's top legal officer when you are actually an architect of an unlawful scheme that allowed theft to run under your nose for years and years? And in some perverse use of language, the three uh, efforts that this government made to change some of the most egregious parts of the robo-debt scheme, they simply called refinements. Refinements. All they were doing was creating sharper tools to torture the Australian people. As hundreds of thousands of Australians were forced to seek job seeker during this unprecedented economic crisis, they did so in good faith that the government was there to support them. The last thing they want as they struggle to get back into the job market and struggle to keep their lives together is to be further harassed and victimised over bogus debts. The scheme was unlawful. It remains unlawful now. And uh, news uh, on the 2nd of June that the government intends to consider bringing in legislation to re-establish the veracity of their disgraceful robo-debt program is an absolute embarrassment. Australians need support from this government, not the continuation of the practices that they have so egregiously inflicted on the nation through the robo-debt scheme. The, the robo Senator O'Neill, thank you very much. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak about the potential closure of Springbank Secondary College, a unique school located in the federal seat of Boothby in South Australia. A review commissioned by South Australian State Education Minister John Gardner into the future of the school is currently underway. News of the review, of the review has most significantly distressed the students, their parents, and caregivers. This is because so many people involved with the school value its strong commitment to providing a fully inclusive and positive school environment for the 37 students in the disability unit and the many more students on the autism spectrum in the broader mainstream student cohort. The review goes against commitments the minister made just a year ago to invest $10 million in the school. It will be very disappointing if the economic needs of the state are prioritised over the educational and social benefits that Springbank Secondary College provides to its unique and much-loved cohort of students. The best needs of children must always be the paramount consideration. Having such a unique cohort of students within the broader mainstream cohort is invaluable. It allows for all students to have a greater understanding of compassion, empathy, diversity and inclusivity. To seek to end this cohesion would be cruel in the extreme. There are currently around 167 students enrolled in this school, up from 144 last year and with projections prior to the announcement of the potential closure for 200 students in 2021. Contrary to media reports and statements made by the minister, the school population is actually growing. 
It is attracting students from outside its zone because of what it uniquely offers that is not normally available at a larger campus such as Unley High School, which is already well and truly oversubscribed. One of my constituents has a son who was rejected by Unley High School last year. The deputy told the family, and I quote, we can't educate your son and we are extremely embarrassed, end quote. Fancy hearing that if any of us would like to hear that um, from the deputy principal of a school. The family was then referred to Springbank Secondary College and were told that the college could cater for their son. Their son was subsequently enrolled there and is now thriving in a welcoming, inclusive and specialist environment, which understands that children with a disability and children on the autism spectrum are well and truly worth being educated. Springbank Secondary College invests the time and effort in giving all children with disabilities fair and equal treatment, like their peers. If these children are forced to enrol in schools that don't want them, and in much larger, less welcoming schools, they will fall through the cracks. We cannot let this happen. Madam Acting Deputy President, the recent shocking death of South Australian Anne-Marie Smith shows only too tragically what can take place when people with a disability are seen as a number, forgotten and neglected by the system that is meant to care for them. Anne-Marie's death has left us all deeply shocked and reeling. She died on April 6 from severe septic shock, multi-organ failure, severe pressure sores, malnutrition and issues connected with her cerebral palsy. To be clear, it was not her disability that killed her. Her manner of death was entirely preventable. Shockingly, Anne-Marie died after being deposited in a, a woven cane chair in her living room for 24 hours a day for over a year. The cane chair operated as both her toilet and her bed. Anne-Marie or Haxley, her last year was a life confined to that cane chair surrounded by filth. She was malnourished and suffering from horrific pressure sores. No one, absolutely no one, should ever have to endure such pain, suffering and isolation. As a South Australian and as a father, I am appalled by what happened to Anne-Marie. It brought home that fear that grips many parents who have adult children living with a disability, the fear of what will happen to their child when they die. Who will love and care for them? Who will advocate and protect them? My heart goes out to these parents whose fears have now intensified after learning of the sickening details surrounding Anne-Marie's tragic death. Ms Smith had loving parents who made provisions for her. She was diagnosed with severe cerebral palsy and needed significant assistance for toileting and hygiene. They had cared for her all of their lives. She lived in a house that had been set up to enable her to be well looked after long after her parents' death, a house that ultimately became her prison. She had not been seen outside for many years. She lived alone at her Kensington Park home in Adelaide's eastern suburbs and had to rely on a carer for all her needs following her parents' death. That carer was employed by the ironically named Integrity Care SA, who has subsequently confirmed the termination of employment of Ms. Ms. Kira five weeks after her death. Five weeks after her death. The directors of Integrity Care must also be held to account. After Ms. Smith died in the Royal Adelaide Hospital, a complaint was made to the Health and Community Services Complaint Commissioner about her care by the doctors who treated her. Ms. Smith's death, death has been declared a major crime with the South Australian Police, investigating how she was unable to move from the cane chair for more than a year, with no access to a toilet or fridge containing food. No doubt the police will uncover more despicable facts as the investigation unfolds. Further, it was revealed that the South Australian Minister for Human Services, uh, Michelle Lessing, only became aware of Ms Smith's death after SAPOL called for information from the South Australian public. Her shocking and preventable death has highlighted significant and stark gaps in the NDIS system, 
with respect to the oversight and safeguarding for people living with profound disability. It is unfathomable, unfathomable to me that there was no line of sight by state or federal agencies over the care of Ms Smith when there should have been. They have failed in their duty of care to Anne-Marie. She was receiving services which were funded and regulated by the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission, and these failings must be investigated independently. So many questions remain which must be addressed. How does this happen under our watch? How do these things happen under the National Disability Insurance Scheme? The NDIS is set up so that we have multiple levels of support, multiple levels of check. Where was the Quality and Safeguards Commission? Where were they indeed? The Minister, Stuart Robert, has said that checks were done in Anne-Marie's case but refuses to provide any detail by hiding behind an investigation. Clearly, there have been many failures in her care at a state and federal level. People like Anne-Marie should not have just one person coming to their house. They should not be kept inside a house in a cane chair for years. They should not be denied a fridge, denied love, denied care, denied respect and denied dignity. The South Australian coroner will conduct an inquest into Ms Smith's death, death following the SAPOL investigation. There are also other investigations into her death announced by the South Australian government, albeit a task force that will report in only a matter of weeks. I wrote to the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability, requesting that it conduct its own investigation into the death of Ms Smith. This is very much important given the Commission's statutory independence from government and that it has been specifically tasked with examining the very issues at the heart of her untimely and preventable death, particularly the protection of people with disability from experiencing violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. Before I close, I want to publicly honour Anne-Marie's life today. Every individual, every human has intrinsic value. And when we fail to care for the weakest and most vulnerable amongst us, it diminishes us all. Thank you, Senator, Senator Griff. Senator Dunningham. Thank you very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Before I start, I want to acknowledge uh, the heartfelt words from Senator Griff on a matter uh, which is very distressing. And when I um, did hear the news of um, Ms Smith's death, uh, I must say I was particularly moved about the situation and the circumstances, and um, I commend him for raising it in those terms here in this chamber. So thank you, Senator Griff. But uh, I want to talk about Tasmania today, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, something I'm very passionate about, representing it in this place. And I know all of you would like to represent Tasmania because it is the best part of our federation. And I know Senator Green would agree with me. But I'm particularly proud of Tasmanians for how they've conducted themselves throughout this uh, health crisis that our country, our world, has uh, grappled with. Um, Tasmanians, like everywhere else in the country and everywhere else in the world, have had to deal with the restrictions that come with trying to manage. Uh, and suppress this virus so that we can get ready to deal with uh, living with it as we build up uh, hospital capacity uh, for hospital admissions related to COVID um, and respiratory illnesses, as we boost testing capacity and uh, as we developed the app to uh, trace contacts um, for those confirmed with infections. But through this whole time and all the sacrifices made by households, by businesses, by communities, Tasmanians have conducted themselves in an honourable way. Um, they've abided by the rules, and we can see that, uh, like most other jurisdictions, with the uh, downward trend in the number of uh, infections, the infection rate plummeting, and um, I think all uh, state and territory jurisdictions have done a commendable job in managing uh, exactly how they've handled 
the restrictions and uh, indeed the health implications. But while I commend Tasmanians for what they have done, uh, that's not to say it's been easy for them, particularly in small business. Uh, businesses that on one day were thriving, particularly in the tourism and hospitality space, uh, they had full dining rooms, accommodation uh, full to the brim when it came to particularly our peak season, uh, to going to be completely empty, as we know. Uh, restrictions were very, very uh, tough and they were brought into effect immediately. And so as restrictions started to ease, one thing I think, uh, and it's probably the same right across the country, I was pleased to see uh, were Tasmanians helping one another out, particularly when it came to supporting Tasmanian small businesses, something I took to doing. Uh, my small contribution to trying to help uh, Tasmanian businesses was to give shout-outs to small to medium enterprises that needed the business. As restrictions started to ease, as uh, cafes and restaurants could begin to trade again, as uh, certain retail establishments were able to reopen, uh, I thought it was a good opportunity to be able to shout out to some of these small businesses that employ a great many Tasmanians, particularly in regional communities where these jobs are needed. Businesses like the Rustic Bakehouse in the beautiful town of Cressy, Green Hill Nursery in Leslie Vale, which is a terrific establishment run by David Drysdale, Skippers in St Helens, which do a great job and a very, very good lunch, Whimsy Florist in Hobart, Frog's Bakery in Deloraine, and not just books in Burnie. Just a few of the businesses I've shouted out to, all of them, great contributors to their local economy, uh, great employers who employ a great many Tasmanians. So I commend them for what they're doing. I know uh, they've done the best they can in the circumstances they have. I know most of these businesses are very grateful for the support they've received, the cash stimulus packages where applicable, the job keeper support to keep their employees on the books and connected with the workplace. Uh, throughout this time until they, they could open their doors again. But I commend all of the proprietors of these businesses for what they do and for the people that work in those businesses. Some of those businesses, of course, uh, were our zoos and wildlife sanctuaries. In Tasmania, uh, we have um, quite a few uh, of these establishments, and they, like any other tourism or hospitality business, struggled with the fact that they had to shut their doors immediately. And just because they shut their doors and had zero dollars coming in the gates, it didn't mean that the costs stopped. And so that was why I was pleased uh, to join with Greg Irons from bon Bonorong uh, Wildlife Park uh, just outside of Hobart to announce the $94.5 million package to support our zoos, aquariums and wildlife sanctuaries to meet some of the fixed costs associated with running these very expensive entities. In Tasmania, we have around 160,000 visitors to our zoos and wildlife sanctuaries each year. So they're a significant contributor to our visitor economy. They are one of the uh, premium tourism uh, attractions in our state. Uh, as I said, there are eight uh, to name them. They are Bonorong Wildlife Park, um, just outside of Hobart, East Coast Nature World, Devils at Cradle, Tasmania Zoo, the Tasmanian Devil Unzoo, Trawana Wildlife Sanctuary, Wings Wildlife Park and, of course, Zudu, also um, in the south. Uh, all of these businesses do a great job, not just because they showcase something so special about Tasmania in terms of our native wildlife, but because they do provide that local employment. But when I was able to go to Bonorong Wildlife Park and uh, have a tour and make this announcement with Greg Irons, uh, he was also able to tell me that they, of the money that they earn from their admissions, run the uh, animal care um, hospital. Uh, on site there, completely off the proceeds of the visitors uh, to their uh, wildlife sanctuary. Uh, no handouts, no grants, purely funded by them and, of course, uh, donations uh, from the public who do care and want to ensure that our wildlife are looked after. Uh, so I commend Greg and his crew at Bonorong. Uh, it was great to go to Tasmania Zoo with our candidate for Rose Veers, the upper house uh, election in Tasmania, coming up soon. Uh, to talk to the crew there about how much it costs to feed their lions and their tigers. But they were truly thankful for the support that's being provided, and it means when we do get through this properly and our borders are open and our restrictions are gone, they will be able to continue to operate and provide the tourism offering that they have uh, so proudly done for so long. Um, I'd also like to just briefly mention Rural Youth Tasmania, the group that behind our uh, flagship event, uh, flagship rural event, 
in Tasmania Agfest, uh, which is held annually in the month of May. Obviously, this year, sadly, uh, because of coronavirus and the restrictions that have been put in place, they were unable to hold Agfest, a huge drawcard for tens of thousands of people. Uh, they congregate in a place called Quirkus Park, just outside of Launceston in northern Tasmania, uh, in the electorate of Lyons. And, uh, farming businesses, uh, producers of fine food and wine, all sorts of goods are on offer at this show. Uh, but because they weren't able to hold it this year, it didn't mean they didn't do anything. And so rural youth took it online. And so literally from the paddock to the cloud, uh, they were able to hold Agfest uh, on the internet in effect. And over the period of time that they were um, exhibiting, the, the 400 exhibitors uh, who were part of this initiative, um, with the thousands of products, deals and services that were available, uh, we were able to see that more than one million page visits occurred, more than one million views of AgFest online. Uh, we had people from the US, from New Zealand, the UK, Germany, India, Japan, the Philippines, uh, all um, paying particular attention to AgFest online, all wanting to get their hands on something uniquely Tasmanian and special about our state. Uh, and it was great that Tasmanians, who never let uh, circumstance stop them or get them down, they were able to take advantage of this situation to continue to trade so that they can continue in to employ their workers uh, and pay the bills and be a participant in the economy when we get through this crisis. Um, so I commend Rural Youth Tasmania for their initiative. I think it's fantastic that they were able to do it. Uh, and I hope we never see a repeat, but certainly it shows that uh, young people in our primary industries are, ingen uh, they are ingenious when it comes to finding ways to get around the problems that they face. Mm -hmm. Lastly, I'd like to talk about uh, the government's commitment to um, our, our high-end producers of primary produce. Uh, in the Tasmanian context, uh, our seafood industry, and in Tasmania we employ more people in the seafood industry than any other state or territory in the Commonwealth. Um, and how we were able to support this industry through our freight support mechanism. Uh, the $110 million uh, program that was able to get our wonderful premium seafood and other horticultural pro uh, products like lamb and, uh, and abalone and uh, beef and the like, berries, to our international markets, even though the flights had stopped flying. Just because the flights had stopped it didn't mean the demand had. So once China, Japan, the Middle East, the US were ready to reopen and, of course, purchase our products, we were ready to go with our support mechanism. The first flight that took off was full of Tasmanian salmon, an industry that employs 5,000 Tasmanians, something I'm very proud of, and I was proud to support this and other industries through this mechanism. I commend the participants in the seafood industry and, as I say, I'm very proud of my fellow Tasmanians for all they've done. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. We know that some of the biggest decisions that will determine the long-term economic recovery of the Cairns region and other tourism towns in regional Queensland will be the decisions of this government. This government will need to make a decision about whether they taper and target JobKeeper to support heavily impacted tourism regions. And we know in Cairns it is the hardest hit area in Queensland, and they are pleading for certainty on JobKeeper today. This government will also need to make a decision about whether to provide support to our aviation sector because we know that without a second national airline, without Virgin flying to the regions directly from our cities, our tourism industry will not recover in the long term. But this is what we know about this government's support for the tourism industry. They have shown a complete lack of urgency to support tourism industries. They have dropped the ball on Virgin when, and risking regional tourism. And the Prime Senator Minister Green. is now insisting on snapping away Senator support. Senator Green, just one moment. Interjections are disorderly. I know that this is a topic that raises um, people's feelings, but if we could have here Senator Green in some silence. Thank you. 
And the Prime Minister is now insisting on snapping away support and taking away JobKeeper when we know that the economy won't snap back. When the travel ban on Chinese travel was put in place by this federal government in February, I said at the time that the crisis would hit Cairns first and worse, and I was right. In December, we saw the first signs of the outbreak in China, and on the 1st of February, the federal government banned international travel from China. This ban had an immediate and significant impact on the Cairns region, who were expecting Chinese New Year travellers that week. And I called for direct support for the tourism industry in this place. And in Cairns, I called on the Prime Minister to visit Cairns and see the impact firsthand and deliver support. The Prime Minister was asked in a press conference if he was considering financial assistance to the university, tourism or hospitality sectors, and in February he said no. There were warning signs, cancellations and yet no support from this government. When assistance finally did come, it came in the form of marketing money redirected from a $76 million crisis package already announced for areas struggling in the wake of the bushfires. They redirected bushfire money, and that's all that they could come up with to support the tourism industry back in February. Assistance in the form of JobKeeper to those businesses that have been impacted finally came, finally came when the government adopted Labor's proposal for a wage subsidy scheme. But we know, we know that those payments didn't start hitting the ground until the first week in May, February, March, April, May, that is how long it took this government to do anything to help the tourism industry. And we know that this government has failed to act to stop our second national airline going into administration. In extraordinary and unprecedented times, the government failed to step up to the plate and is still refusing to work with an administrator to support the Virgin, what Virgin needs to survive and bring tourists to regional Queensland. They have sat on their hands as regional economies have pleaded for the government to step in and to help Virgin. All they've done is deliver stopgap measures. They need a long-term plan now and certainty for the industry, but they can't get that from this government. And finally, Treasury figures released today confirm what we already know, that the Cairns economy is not going to snap back to normal on September the 27th. The data shows Cairns will be one of the hardest hit areas in Queensland if wage subsidies end on September 27. There is more than 500 businesses registered in Cairns than there is in Brisbane. And Scott Morrison's comments this week that JobKeeper would run until the end of September as legislated and no more shows that this government has no plan to keep regional economies afloat. Cairns Regional Council and Far North Queensland tourism operators have called on the federal government, that's you guys, to provide certainty, but there are no Order. signs that this government will act. Order. We know that the less done to protect jobs— Order on my right. We know that the less done to, to protect jobs and support vulnerable workers, businesses and communities in the coming months will make the economic reco recovery harder and longer. It's clear to tourism operators and businesses in Cairns that the economy has been hit hard. And it is not unreasonable for the government to take circumstances like this into consideration and give those businesses some certainty about JobKeeper. So maybe instead of coming in here with their daggers sharpened to the state government, instead of drafting motions about what other governments should do, those opposite Order. in here might want to consider doing Order. their job and doing what it is within the realm Order of their own responsibility right. and their own accountability as, as members of this government. Give businesses and employers some certainty around JobKeeper. Do that. It's your job. Senator McGrath. Save our second national airline from collapse to protect regional tourism. Step up to the plate and do something to save Virgin. And while you're at Order. it, while you're at Senator McGrath. And while you're sitting at your desk and drafting motions, why don't you draft a motion to protect the Great Barrier Reef? Because it suffered another bleaching event under this government. The Great Barrier Reef protects 64,000 jobs. 64,000 jobs. And this government has done nothing, no climate change policy, Order. to protect Senator one Green, single time job. time for the contribution has expired. Order. I'll allow senators to take their seats.
that was a good warm up. Um, Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yesterday, the minister refused to accept that it was wrong to hand Nadia Sievright over an illegal robo debt uh, when she was eight <coughs> months pregnant. Kath Madgwick's son, Jared, was issued a robo debt under Mr. Morrison's illegal scheme. Jared tragically took his own life after reading a letter from Centrelink about his robo debt, and Ms. Madgwick believes the letter, quote, tipped him over the edge. Does the Prime Minister now accept it was wrong to hound vulnerable Australians like Jared as a result of the illegal robo debt scheme he designed and implemented? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, as I've indicated uh, to the Chamber yesterday, uh, we received advice at the time that the government, that the program was put together, uh, that it was lawful. Many governments have, in fact, used ATO averaging data over many years, Labor and Liberal. Services Australia makes $180 billion in payments every year. Uh, and uh, as I've also put on the record in the Senate yesterday, Ms. Plibersek, Mr. Shorten and Mr. Bowen have previously supported uh, debt recovery uh, in the context of overpayments having been made. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. <coughs> Rachel is a 64-year-old woman living in a remote Aboriginal community. Her son passed away in tra traumatic circumstances in 2018. The next year, Centrelink sent a letter to her son's estate demanding payment of $3,300. Rachel then received a letter to her late son asking him to verify his employment records from five years earlier, leaving her distraught. Does the Prime Minister believe that Rachel deserves an apology? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I refer Senator Keneally to my first answer and to the uh, statements by Ms. Plibersek, Mr. Shorten, and Mr. Bowen in support for debt recovery in relation to these payments. Order. Uh, have you conclu he's concluded his answer, Senator Wong. I'll call Senator Keneally for a final supplementary question. Does the Prime Minister, does the Prime Minister think the suffering experienced by Rachel, Jared, and more than half a million Australians was worth it. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I refer Senator Keneally to my first answer. Order. Senator, order. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Can the Minister inform the Senate how Australia's economy is leading the developed world in its recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic-induced economic crisis. The Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator Brockman for that very important question. Uh, Mr. President, the uh, Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development has released a very important report overnight, uh, which shows the devastating effects uh, of COVID-19 and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, is having on the world economy. Importantly, what the OECD report shows is that Australia is leading the developed world in our economic recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. The OECD expects economic growth in Australia to rebound to dis despite the global economy facing, and I'm quoting the OECD, the deepest recession since the Great Depression, with the loss of income exceeding any previous recession over the last 100 years outside wartime with dire and long-lasting consequences for people, firms and governments. Uh, the OECD is forecasting global growth to fall by at least 6% in 2020, and that is in the absence of a second wave of infections. To put this in context, global growth fell by just 0.1% in 2009 during the so-called global financial crisis and is now forecast to fall by at least 6% as long as we can avoid a second wave of infections. According to the OECD, the outlook for Australia is the third best among all OECD members. The OECD forecast for Australia's for GDP to contract by 5% in 2020 before bouncing back to 4.1% growth in 2021. Australia's economic outlook for 2020 compares remarkably well with other countries. The United Kingdom is forecast to contract by 11.5%, France by 11.4%, 
Italy by 11.3 per cent, New Zealand by 8.9 per cent, Canada by 8 per cent, the United States by 7.3 per cent, and indeed the OECD average uh, is the OECD average Order. contraction Senator of 7.5 per cent. The answer has expired. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Mr. President, and thank the minister for the first answer. Can the minister inform the Senate of the dangers to our economy if a second wave of COVID-19 hits Australia? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Yes, I can. The OECD report makes it very clear that the economic consequences of a second wave of infections would be dire for both the Australian and the world economies. In the event of a second wave, the report said the global economy would likely contract by a further 1.6%. The Australian economy would, would contract by a further 1.3 per cent. That means our economic contraction would jump from 5 per cent to 6.3 per cent under the second wave scenario, which would be an extra $25 billion blow to our economy. But it wouldn't stop there. A second wave would also hit our forecast recovery in 2021 by 3.1 per, by 3, uh, per cent, which would mean an $80 billion blow to our economy over two years. That, is, that would cost thousands of Australian jobs. That is why every Australian has a patriotic duty to do everything they can to help minimise the risk of a second wave. That is why every Australian must heed the health advice and not attend mass protests at this time. Order. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate about what else the OECD has said about Australia's response to the COVID-19 crisis? Order. Order. I'll call Senator Cormann when there's silence. Senator Cormann. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Brockman for that supplementary question. The OECD has praised Australia for acting quickly to close our borders and put in place the necessary health restrictions, which helped us to successfully flatten the curve. The OECD had praised Australia for its massive macroeconomic support. That economic support was only possible because we entered this crisis from a position of economic and fiscal strength. Growth was increasing at the end of last year. Unemployment was falling in February. We had returned the budget to balance for the first time in 11 years. Because of that strength, we have been able to provide support of $260 billion, or 13.3 per cent of GDP, in support of workers, households and business. There is still a long way to go in recovering from this once-in-a-hundred-year global pandemic but we're heading in the right direction. It is important that we remain vigilant and that all Australians do everything uh, they can uh, to uh, avoid a second wave of infection. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Internal Centrelink documents show that the government ignored warnings to Services Australia as early as March 2016 of a, quote, major risk that automated Centrelink robo-debts could be inaccurate. Throughout 2017, the government ignored warnings when the Administrative Appeals Tribunal repeatedly found that the basis on which robo-debts were calculated was wrong and unlawful. On what, date, on what date did the government first become aware that its robo-debt scheme was illegal? The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Kitching, for your question on this matter. Um, can I state at the outset of this question that, given that this matter is currently before the courts, I am extremely mindful that anything that I might say could have legal implications, and so I cannot Order. provide any further comment uh, in specifically in relation to uh, anything in relating to the legal uh, aspects of this matter. But what I can say, what I can say is that this government is acting to repay these people. Uh, and in fact, uh, I think uh, if I remember correctly, uh, the Minister for Government Services, uh, Stuart Robert, did a press, uh, a press conference on the 19th of November last year, where he made an announcement that the intention of the government uh, was intending to pause its debt recovery using income averaging as its sole reason for raising the debt. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Attorney General has claimed that the government had legal advice supporting the robo debt program designed by Mr. Morrison during his time as Social Services Minister. It has been reported that the only advice was about procedural fairness under administrative law from a junior legal officer. 
Is this correct? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I draw the senator's uh, yeah, draw the senator my uh, answer to the previous question in relation to any comments that I uh, intend to make, or for that matter, not make, in relation to uh, this particular matter. However, what I would say, um, following um, my response to the primary part of your question, is that. Um, Last November, we did make changes in relation to this particular program uh, on the back of uh, the decision by the government at that time that we would cease uh, pause, or pause the recovery of debts in relation to the income compliance program. But I think the most important thing that's worth the Chamber uh, um, understanding is that um, since my time as the, the Social Services Minister and, 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 and also during the time uh, that uh, Minister Fletcher was the member of the Minister for Social Services. We also embarked on some significant reforms in the social services area um, in relation to single touch payroll uh, and also um, for the change of assessment. Order, model. Senator Rustin, time has expired. <coughs> Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. It was reported yesterday, yesterday that the total value of unlawful debts issued under the scheme may total $1 billion. How much exactly will the government's failure to listen to the warnings about Mr Morrison's robo-debt scheme cost the Australian taxpayer? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And once again, Senator Kitching, um, as I have said to the answers to the principal question and the first supplementary question, I will be not making any comments in relation to this matter uh, because it is currently before the courts. Um, however, as I said, uh, as I was uh, attempting to, uh, to advise the, the Senate um, of some very positive initiatives that have been put in place uh, in the last 12 months in relation to making sure, first and foremost, that people don't incur debts in the first place. And by using technology such as single-touch payroll and the change of assessment model, which sadly Order. won't be able to come into play uh, on the 1st of July as it previous, but hopefully we'll get it in in August, to make sure that Australians um, who are reporting income are reporting their income accurately because we give them the tools to do so. Because by simplifying the model by which people are able to report income, we hope to be able to reduce the amount Order. that people are incurring in debts. Order. Order. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on the state of the government's health response to the COVID-19 pandemic and how Australia is leading the world in health recovery? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Chandler for your question. Mr President, over the last few months, Australians have worked together to suppress COVID-19, giving us time to prepare our health system to live with the virus. As a country, we have used this time well, sourcing additional ventilators and personal protective equipment and making plans for our hospitals to respond to a surge in cases. We have, as we know, expanded our testing regime, developed our capability to respond quickly to new cases and outbreaks, and we've improved our ability to identify quickly people who may have been exposed to the virus. Working together, we have now reduced the number of people in hospital with COVID-19 to 20, and the number of people in ICU because of COVID-19 has now been reduced to three. Yesterday, there were only seven new cases reported across the whole of Australia, four new cases in Victoria and three new cases in New South Wales. Mr President, as we know, on 8 May, the National Cabinet agreed to a three-step plan to gradually remove the COVID-19 restrictions and for all of us to move towards the new COVID-safe economy. While Australians can, of course, see that road back, it does not mean that we cannot remain vigilant. We need to, in particular in observing social distancing practices. We now have seen 1.6 million tests conducted across Australia. Of those, 7,276 Australians have been diagnosed with COVID-19 and, sadly, 102 have lost their lives. But the rate of positive returns has now dropped to 0.4 per cent across those 1.6 million Senator tests. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate why it is important to remain vigilant in following public health directions during the COVID-19 pandemic, and what are the risks of failing to remain vigilant? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, it is critical that we remain vigilant to ensure we do not risk further outbreaks. That just happens to be our reality as a country. As the Chief Medical Officer has said, make no mistake, this virus is still in our community. The OECD research today has made it abundantly clear. The risks of a second wave are real, and a second wave will have both profound health and economic impacts. The OECD does expect Australia to rebound, despite the global economy facing the deepest recession since the Great Depression. The OECD's outlook for Australia is the third best amongst all 36 OECD nations. But a second wave of COVID-19 infections would wipe out four years of economic growth in Australia and expose highly indebted mortgage holders to possible mass defaults. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, what steps can Australians take to minimise the risk of a second wave? Senator Cash. Mr President, we cannot throw away all of the sacrifices and hard work that we have made collectively as a nation together over the past few months to contain the virus. It is critical that all of us, every single one of us, continue to ensure we do not put the lives of others at risk and the livelihoods of our family, our friends, but most importantly, the most vulnerable Australians. We all need to ensure that we exercise an abundance of caution and follow the medical advice on the additional and practical steps that we all need to, to take, including staying 1.5 metres away from other people whenever and wherever possible, maintaining good hand washing, uh, coughing, sneezing, hygiene, staying at home if we're unwell and getting tested if respiratory systems um, we have them or a fever. We have shown what we can achieve together. Order. Senator Let's Cash, not time throw it has away. Expired. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. New South Wales and the Northern Territory have become the first jurisdictions to restart pokies. Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced gaming venues could possibly be allowed to open as part of Step 3 by July. Australians saved $3 billion since the pokies have shut with many gamblers forced to go cold turkey with their pokies addictions. The money saved had been spent in other areas of the economy rather than lost down poker machines. Advocates against gambling harm are concerned about the significant health risks of restarting the pokies during such a vulnerable time. Does the government share these concerns that a resumption of pokies will lead to a rise in gambling-related health and social harm? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator Griff, for your question. First and foremost, can I say the government takes um, the gambling harm that may be caused to Australians very, very seriously. Um, we are certainly aware of the recent um, reports that people might be um, going back to their pre-COVID uh, gambling habits despite the social distancing requirements that exist within uh, gambling venues. And we're also uh, aware of reports um, from analytics consultancy um, Alpha Beta and the credit firm Illion on changes to people's gambling habits during the first few months of the corona pandemic. It is for this very reason, uh, in the protection of Australians and, uh, and gambling, that the Australian government embarked on a program of reform within the gambling sector to put in place the National Consumer Protection Framework um, to make sure for, for online wagering. And it's very much the centrepiece of Australia's um, gambling reforms, because we want to help make sure that consumers are protected no matter where they are in Australia. And it also provides a framework that empowers Australians um, through the use of tools to make sure that they control their own behaviours with their online gambling habits. Um, so we take very, very seriously. Uh, making sure that Australians have got the tools that they can protect themselves. But what I uh, would say, um, Senator Griff, is that um, state and territory governments have the primary responsibility uh, for licensing and regulating land-based gambling establishments to which 
you are largely referring in your primary question. Obviously, um, as the federal government and through many of our agreements and, and the relationships that we continue to have and probably have, in, have been enhanced over recent times with our discussions with our state and territory counterparts, we are working to make sure that through this unprecedented time that we find ourselves in at the moment, that we are working together to put in place protections to make sure that we can assist Australians to get to the other side of this pandemic. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, the uncertainty caused by COVID-19 has triggered many mental health problems in our communities, particularly amongst at-risk gamblers. Now, last year, the Senate backed my motion asking the federal government to address gambling as a national public health issue, noting the links between gambling, family violence and mental ill health. Has the government given any further consideration to the motion that was passed by the Senate last year? And if not, why not? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, um, Senator Griff. Um, and, and of course, um, motions passed in this place, the government takes them all very seriously. Uh, but one of the things that has been, um, I think, very important in the delivery of your, um, your request and your desire to make sure that greater assistance was put in place for people um, who find themselves with a gambling addiction um, uh, has been twofold. One has been the recognition by this government through the COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic of the greater need for assistance and support and financial resourcing um, of our mental health services to make sure that those people that find themselves in a, a position where their mental health is being impacted on by how the coronavirus um, pandemic has been impacted them have got the research um, and the support that they are able to uh, they need to be able to help them. The other thing that we have done is also provide a significant um, increase in the amount of money that's been made available uh, to financial counselling services uh, and also making sure that people are aware where those services are available so that they can also assist Order. them through Senator this time. Rustin. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, the current GST distribution, and I know you, 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 you may uh, have to take this on notice, effectively penalises states which choose to take action against gambling interests by not recognising any change in their fiscal capacity. Will the government undertake to work with the National Cabinet to ensure that states are not penalised for public health and social services initiatives which address gambling harm and reduce taxation revenue? Senator Rustin. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Senator Griffin. Thank you very much for giving me uh, uh, the answer to my question during your, uh, the question that you were actually asking. Um, of course, um, matters in relation to GST are matters for the, for the Treasurer and the Finance Minister, and I am not going to uh, seek to make any commentary about that. But what I would say and reiterate is that this government takes very seriously our responsibilities to work with all jurisdictions to make sure that people who are impacted by gambling-related harm um, have the supports in place, first of all, to be able to assist them through things, uh, as you, we mentioned in the previous question, mental health, but also the support so they can deal with their addictions uh, and the harm that they are causing potentially to themselves and their families through their addiction. Uh, and we will continue to work with the states and territories. We will continue to work through the National Consumer Protection uh, Framework. We will continue to work through the National um, Exclusion Register to make sure that we continue to make advances in this area so that we can continue to protect Australians who are at risk of gambling-related harm. Senator Green. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Today, the member for Leichhardt called for Mr Morrison to extend JobKeeper, saying, and I quote, there is a very strong argument and the figures that were released today show you how important it is that we continue to have this support within our community. Will Mr Morrison give this support to communities in far north Queensland facing Australia's first recession in 29 years? Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President, and I thank Senator Green uh, for that question. Uh, our government uh, has made uh, responsible decisions right from the outset uh, of this uh, crisis. We've made decisions to save lives and to save livelihoods. And we'll continue to make those decisions. We'll continue to make responsible decisions moving forward. Uh, the Senator will be well aware of the Treasury review that has been well and truly uh, publicly canvassed. Uh, once the findings and recommendations of that review uh, are received, the government will be making further uh, responsible decisions. And I can reassure uh, the uh, people of North Queensland that our government is very, very focused on their best interests. And of course, the most important thing that the people of North Queensland would like to see right now is the removal of state borders. So that the planes can start flying again, so that the tourists can Order. go to North Queensland again. 
And if you were interested Order. in the people of, if you were interested in the best interest of the people of North Queensland, you would be calling on Premier Palaszczuk Order. to remove those state borders. Order on my right. Now on my left. I'll call Senator Green when there's silence. When there's silence, I'll call your colleague, Senator Watt. Senator Wong. Senator Colbeck. Senator. Order. I will call Senator. We are wasting time for non government senators with constant interjections. Senator Green. A survey of 2,300 Australian company directors found, and I quote, 81 per cent would prefer to see a cautious phasing out of stimulus policies such as JobKeeper rather than a rapid wind down. Why is the government refusing to give Australian businesses confidence that JobKeeper will continue past September where needed? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, businesses across Australia can have uh, confidence that our government will continue to make responsible decisions uh, to, put, to save lives, to protect Australians from the risk uh, of a second wave of infections, to, to, to minimise the, the risk of a second wave of infections, and to also ensure, to also ensure that we can Senator have the strongest Pratt. possible economic recovery on the other Senator side. Senator Pratt. As the OECD has uh, clearly uh, outlined in its report released overnight, uh, Australia is leading the developed world when it comes uh, to the economic recovery uh, in the context of this coronavirus crisis, and we'll continue to make the decisions that are required, and businesses around Australia overwhelmingly know that. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. The OECD, the RBA Governor, 2,300 company directors and the government's own backbench are calling for the JobKeeper program to be extended beyond September. How many Australians will lose their jobs because of Mr Morrison's stubborn insistence that JobKeeper snap back in September? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, the OECD has said that Australia is leading the developed world when it comes to the economic recovery in the wake of the coronavirus crisis. And, and the OECD has also predicted a bounce back in, uh, in economic growth in Australia in 2021. Uh, 2021, uh, which, 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 uh, and the, the OECD Watt. has also outlined that the comparative position of the Australian economy is uh, materially better uh, than the position of economies uh, in many other parts of the world. We'll continue to make the decisions that are required, uh, including decisions to minimise the risk uh, of a second wave of infections, because that is so important uh, to protect people's health, and it's also so important uh, to protect our economy and to protect jobs. Uh, and I say it again: if Senator uh, Green uh, is committed to the best interests of the people of Queensland, she will join the coalition in calling uh, on Premier Palaszczuk to uh, remove those state border restrictions in Queensland so that people from the great state of New South Wales can go on holidays in North Queensland, can Order. spend money in North Queensland. And Order. 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 Order on my left and my right, Senator Cormann, on a point uh, th of order. Th th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, President. Point of order. Point of order. I, I think, I think, I, I think um, you know, uh, interjections are always disorderly. But if interjections are made, they should at least be directly relevant. Uh, and I don't know how <laughs> South Australia would be directly order. relevant to a question about Queensland. Order. Well, I'll give. Um, that wasn't a point of order. And I might say. And I might say that the interjections were coming from across the two main sides of the chamber and not from the far end, so I call on those on my left and right. Senator Hanson Young. Th thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Senator, does art matter? S the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yes. Um, Senator Hanson Young. If art matters, uh, I've got a supplementary question, um, yep. Senator uh, Mr. President. Young. If art matters to this government and the Prime Minister, why has the PM not used the words art or artist since the COVID crisis started? How many times has the Prime Minister said the words art or artist since the crisis started? 
How many times has the Prime Minister uttered the words football, footy and construction? Senator Cormann. Um, th th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. Uh, I don't think it would surprise Senator Hanson Young uh, that uh, I uh, will uh, have to uh, take that very important question on notice so that I can provide uh, an accurate answer uh, to uh, that forensic uh, question about a very important matter of public policy. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr President. Is it true that the arts and recreation industry employs 50 per cent female workers, while the construction and building industry is only 14 per cent. Does this government believe arts jobs matter, and do they believe women's jobs matter? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Of course, we, uh, this government believes that uh, women's jobs uh, matter. Uh, before the COVID crisis hit, we had secured record, record female workforce participation in our economy, the best ever. Uh, and indeed, the gender pay gap was the lowest ever. The lowest ever. And that is on the back of, of course, uh, our uh, national economic plan for, uh, for growth, for stronger growth, and indeed because of the leadership provided by a number of distinguished and outstanding uh, senior uh, cabinet ministers, including, of course, uh, the Minister uh, for Women's Interests, Senator Payne, and, pre and her predecessors, who have, who have done outstanding work in promoting uh, the, uh, the cause and the women's economic interests in the context of our government. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Southeast Asian nations like Taiwan quickly learned with regard to COVID that they just had to isolate the sick and the vulnerable, and that allowed healthy and productive people and businesses to keep working and earning money. The result is that their economy in Taiwan and other Southeast Asian nations remained healthy and they had far fewer deaths than Australia. Minister, was there any consideration given in April, in April to changing Australia's COVID strategy when Taiwan and other Southeast Asian nations had already proved that their strategy worked and was far superior to your government's strategy? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, when the crisis hit, there's no question that we considered a whole range of alternative options on how best to respond to it, but uh, in making decisions and in making judgments, we were guided uh, by the advice of relevant experts and, uh, you know, in relation to how best to deal with the health threat, uh, we were guided, uh, you know, principally by the advice of the Australian uh, Health um, uh, Principles Protection Committee, uh, the chief uh, medical and chief health officers from around Australia and uh, the Commonwealth. And um, I think it's fair to say, and you know, for a range of reasons, but uh, you know, the early, the early decision to um, impose border restrictions in terms of uh, non-residents who'd spent uh, the, uh, any time over the previous 14 days in mainland China. Uh, not being able to come to Australia and imposing quarantine requirements on uh, Australians and permanent residents uh, having spent uh, time over the previous 14 days in mainland China has you know, demonstrably helped delay uh, the spread of the virus, giving us time to prepare uh, both in terms of the um, hospital capacity uh, to deal with the potential inflow of patients but also to prepare the risk management uh, processes that would best equip us uh, to save lives by suppressing, uh, slowing down and suppressing the spread of the virus and helping to put, of course, the economic support measures in place. Well, I mean, every single death uh, is, uh, is tragic and it's uh, one more than you would like to see. But uh, again, I mean, comparatively speaking, comparatively speaking, um, the number of deaths in Australia is uh, very low internationally. Uh, the number of infections is very low. Uh, the number of uh, community transmission is uh, extremely low right now. And uh, you know, we, we believe that, by and large, uh, our strategy has worked. Now, I mean, this is not a perfect environment. I mean, you know, you, you, you are presented with, we were presented with a rapidly evolving crisis situation. We made the best possible judgments in the circumstances, guided by the expert advice. On balance, I believe that Order, we, we have Coleman. made good decisions Sorry. as a country. Senator Roberts, supplementary Thank you, question. Mr. President. I acknowledge Senator, Senator Cormann's statement, uh, but he fails to acknowledge that the economy has been devastated as a result of the government's strategy when other economies have not been devastated. Minister, hasn't your government's COVID strategy put the Australian economy and many Australian small businesses and jobs at unnecessary risk and less, left us with a debt we had to have? Senator Cormann. 
Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. It is certainly true that we were forced to impose significant sacrifices on uh, many Australians. Um, you know, we put uh, we, the restrictions that we had to put in place as a country on the uh, economy uh, in order to save lives by slowing down and suppressing the spread of the virus uh, has imposed, of course, uh, significant burdens on many businesses and on many working Australians. That's why we put in place the uh, economic support package that we have in order pro to provide, to keep as many businesses in business through the transition as possible, to keep as many working Australians connected to their employer uh, during this transition as possible, and to provide enhanced support to those Australians who, through no fault of their own, lost their job because of the coronavirus crisis. Now, uh, you know, you can argue whether one decision or the other decision could have been uh, made differently, but if you look at the outcomes, if you look at the actual outcomes, both on the health front and on an economic front, I think that Australia is in a very good position, comparatively Order, speaking, to other countries around Senator the world. Roberts, a final supplementary Thank you, Mr. Question. President. Minister, every day Australians want to know how the Prime Minister will ensure that if businesses do close or go into liquidation, that receivers and administrators will ensure that Australian jobs are preserved and that affected businesses can only be sold to Australians first and not be cheaply flogged off to foreigners. Senator Cormann. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, um, you know, in relation to um, foreign investment, uh, you'd be aware that the Treasurer has put in place some temporary uh, measures to ensure uh, that uh, Australian businesses are dealing with the consequences and the impact of the coronavirus crisis uh, are protected as appropriate in the context of any attempted foreign takeover. Uh, but um, you know, in, in a broader sense, in a broader sense, when we are of course focused on doing everything we can to, to maximise the strength of the economic recovery on the other side, and let me also say that on the other side, in order to maximise the strength of the economic recovery, we will uh, need to rely uh, on uh, foreign investment uh, into the future to maximise uh, our economic uh, growth opportunities into the future. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yesterday, the Minister said, and I quote, I will not rule out adjustments at the end of the review. This morning, Mr. Morrison guaranteed that JobKeeper will remain until September for industries other than childcare. Who is correct? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, both those statements are correct. Uh, and, and in fact, I mean, like, they don't understand the English language, uh, seemingly, Mr. President. I mean, I've made this point over three and a half hours at the Senate uh, COVID committee the other day, and I've made the point yesterday. I mean, and I've said it in the media on I don't know how many occasions. Yes, the JobKeeper program is legislated. That's a statement of fact. The JobKeeper uh, program is legislated for six months. We've also said that uh, there is a review uh, which uh, was always scheduled to take place about halfway through. Uh, into the uh, operation of the JobKeeper program. Uh, I can't preempt uh, you know, what the findings of that review uh, will be, which I have not yet seen. I can't preempt what the recommendations may or may not be. Uh, indeed, whether there are any recommendations at all. But what I can tell you, what I, what I can tell you is that the JobKeeper program is legislated and will be in place for the six months, uh, which we've all said. And that statement, that statement you're attributing, the statement that I made about uh, adjustments that may be made, uh, is not inconsistent with the statement that the JobKeeper program will be in place for six months, which it will be. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Morrison also said this morning that the review was and I quote, about how you're implementing the program. There's a lot of administrative issues and things like that. Was the review directed to only consider implementation and administration, or is it open to the review to recommend that JobKeeper will end early for some industries? Senator uh, th Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, as I've also indicated publicly, uh, we don't have any uh, proposal in front of us. We're not considering any uh, proposal. We're not expecting any proposal to end the JobKeeper program uh, for any other sector. In relation to childcare, it was a, it was a specific. It was a specific. It was a specific. Uh, it was a specific proposal that was initiated by the sector itself because there was a better, fairer, more equitable way to provide transitional support uh, to that industry, given the uh, activity levels across childcare centres had significantly increased again. Uh, the reason the reason JobKeeper was uh, put in place for uh, the childcare sector was in the context of a drop in activity levels, the childcare subsidy was no longer generating revenue. With uh, activity levels going back up, there is, of course, now a capacity to generate revenue, government revenue, through childcare subsidies, 
as well as government, uh, as well as uh, parental contributions, as well as transitional, uh, uh, transitional payment of $708 million by the government. Uh, so, I mean, what we're doing here is entirely appropriate. I mean, Order. you are arguing Senator that we should Coleman, keep child, child care free forever. Expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Given it took only three days for Mr. Morrison to break his promise to keep JobKeeper until September for childcare workers, can Australians trust Mr. Morrison's promise today? And will Mr. Morrison rule out breaking his promise to other workers? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. I completely reject the premise of the question. Australians know that they can trust the Prime Minister and the Morrison government that we will do everything we can. We, Order. We, we, will, we will do everything we Order. can to avoid a second wave of infections and we will do everything we can to maximise the strength of the economic recovery on the other side. And, and, Senator Wong. and, and the Australian people know, the, the Australian people are relieved that they don't have a socialist, anti-business, anti-growth government in government right now to deal with this crisis. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Can the Minister update the Senate on the importance of Australia's relationship with India and how is the government strengthening our bilateral ties? Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Abetz both for his question and particularly his interest in this matter, given that he is the Australian patron of the Australia-India Alliance. What the Morrison government is doing is delivering on our commitment to deepen Australia's relationships with key partners in the Indo-Pacific. India is, of course, the world's most populous democracy and a rising economic and strategic power in our region. And last week, Prime Ministers Morrison and Modi held a virtual summit, India's first uh, indeed, a landmark moment in the ties between our nations. Australia and India agreed and announced that we will elevate our relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership, underpinned by democratic principles, the shared promotion of the rules-based international order and the preservation of an open and inclusive Indo-Pacific. In a time of what are great global challenges, it's more important than ever that countries such as Australia and India come together to reinforce our common values. A new joint declaration on maritime cooperation signals the commitment of Australia and India to a rules-based maritime order in the Indo-Pacific, which is founded on respect for the sovereignty of all nations and international law, particularly the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. The partnership will strengthen maritime domain awareness and increase cooperation on major transnational challenges such as people smuggling, arms and narcotics tra trafficking, uh, climate change, terrorism and illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing. Our partnership is grounded in strong people-to-people -people links and the invaluable contribution of Indian migrants to modern Australia. Uh, as a proud resident of Western Sydney, I can tell you that uh, Harris Park would never be the same without the contribution of our Western Sydney Indian community and so many vibrant parts of the Indian diaspora in Australia. Senator Betts, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that extensive answer and ask, can the minister advise the Senate of other key outcomes of the virtual summit between Prime Minister Morrison and India's Prime Minister Modi last week? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And the Australia-India Comprehensive Strategic Partner Partnership is a major and significant reflection of the relationship between our two countries. And it takes our relationship to a new level of practical cooperation, reflecting both the depth and the breadth of our mutual interests. In addition to the CSP text itself, we've signed eight substantive agreements that will strengthen technical cooperation and create new opportunities for Australian businesses. We'll work more closely than ever with India to build our ties in mining, in critical minerals, in vocational education, training, water resources, public administration, science and technology and defence. And with Minister Reynolds, Minister Reynolds, the Defence Minister, and I are very pleased that we've also agreed to Foreign and Defence Minister 2 plus 2 meetings at least every two years. And Australia is just the third country to join such meetings with India, along with Japan and the United States. Senator Abetz, a final supplementary question. 
Minister, how will further cooperation between Australia and India on cyber affairs and critical technologies advance our strategic interests and provide new opportunities for Australian businesses? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Last week, uh, Minister for External Affairs Jay Shankar and I signed a new landmark Australia-India framework agreement on cyber and cyber-enabled critical technologies cooperation. This arrangement will create opportunities to strengthen our technical and economic linkages with a technically aspirational India. A new Australia-India Cyber and Critical Technology Partnership will create a research and development fund for our businesses and researchers and support other countries to improve their cyber resilience. Australia and India have a shared vision for an open, free, rules-based and secure internet. And importantly, this will also ensure that cyber and technological cooperation will sit at the core of our new comprehensive strategic partnership as we forge a dynamic Australia-India 21st century relationship. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Last week, it was reported that only 4 per cent of Australians living in bushfire-affected communities have been able to access government support. Why? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you very much, Senator Watt, for his question and his obvious ongoing interest uh, in, in the bushfire-affected air areas of Australia. Uh, the specific question that he has asked me, um, I am going to have to take on notice uh, because I do not have uh, the necessary information in relation to the 3 per cent uh, number that he is quoting. However, um, it, while I have the opportunity to actually add something in relation to the government's response uh, to the bushfire-affected communities in Australia, and, and we recognise that it has been a very, very traumatic time for those people that have been affected by bushfires, because obviously on top of that they have had to endure the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic impacts that all Australians and all Australian communities have had to endure as well. So, uh, but what I would like to do is to assure all bushfire-affected communities that they have not been forgotten um, and that I acknowledge that the recovery in many areas has been hampered by the COVID pandemic. Um, but the government is focused on addressing bushfire relief and recovery needs with flexibility and, uh, and speed, and, and that is why the Prime Minister himself announced on the 11th of May this year a further $650 million Order. in assistance to, uh, in addition to the $2 billion bushfire recovery fund, which I might say has already been fully committed. A billion dollars of this fund has already been delivered and is working to support the locally led effort in response to the bushfire impacts on the ground in these communities, including in my home state of South Australia and particularly uh, in the Adelaide Hills and the Kangaroo Island area that were so particularly devastated by the two fires that uh, were in, uh, took uh, hold in South Australia over the Christmas New Year period. Um, and when you add that to the expenditure that, uh, from existing measures, this means around $1.4 billion is rolling out across our drought, uh, our bushfire affected communities and supporting individuals within those communities. Senator, what a supplementary question? Thank you, Mr. President. Stephanie Stanhope lost her home in the Bega Valley on the 4th of January 2020. Struggling to navigate the system, she said, and I quote, for all the assistance you were led to believe was going to be there, it isn't. Not long after it happened, there was a call from someone in the system saying that each person would be given a mentor to guide them through the process. I've had one phone call. How can we expect bushfire victims like Ms Stanhope to access the system when there's no one to help Order. them navigate Senator the system? Watt. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, um, Senator Watt. Um, as I've often said in this place, if you have individual examples of people who have concerns, whether it would be in my area of social services or whether it would be in other areas um, that I represent, order. I am more Senator than Watt, on a point of order? The, the question is not about an individual example. The question is why— there was order. An I, I'm going to hear the point of order and then I'll rule on the point of order. Senator Watt. So the point of order is relevance. The question was— about why bushfire victims, like the example, can't access the system. Senator, Senator Watt, I have repeatedly ruled 
that the part at the end of a question is not the only part of the question. The minister may be directly relevant by being directly relevant to any part of the question. The minister is being directly relevant in this case because you did quote a specific example. Senator Wong. Mr. President, uh, it is the case that you have, and I think correctly, indicated that. Order. I'll, let me hear the point of order. <laughs> Even when I'm being nice, you'll mean. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hard. Oh, wounded. I am wounded, Eric. All those years at the table. Um, <clears throat> it's, oh, now that's me. Um, we still got a day to go. You have correctly this week. ruled. Uh, you have you have ruled, and I, I would indicate we believe correctly that you know, direct relevance can pertain to different aspects of the question. But the, this minister can't get out of answering anything by simply saying, "Oh, you've mentioned an individual." No, the that is not the test oh, well, of direct relevance, and that is the way in which she is using this tactically. She should answer the policy point if she doesn't Senator, wish to talk about Senator the individual. Senator Wong, on, a point of, on the point of order, Senator Cormann. Th thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. On the, it was it was a, a very a broadly introduced question with a range of mothers uh, canvas, and the minister was clearly being directly relevant uh, to the question asked. And, and, and us, uh, us presidents of both political persuasions uh, have uh, ruled uh, during the time that I've been in this chamber. Order, the Senator president Wong. is not in a position to tell a minister how to answer a question. The president can only require direct relevance, and the, and the minister was being directly relevant to the question so, asked. On, on the point of order, several, several points. Firstly, I re reiterate without restating what I said earlier. Secondly, Senator Wong, the minister had only been speaking for 16 seconds, so I'm not in a position to rule on the entirety of her approach. Um, I have said before, and I restate again, that when very specific questions are asked requiring facts of ministers, the term directly relevant will be strictly applied, as I have done. However, I've also said before that to be directly relevant, a minister can directly refer to or address, including challenging material or assertions contained in any question or preamble. The minister was being directly relevant by addressing that part of the question in the 16 seconds for which she'd been speaking. Finally, there is a time after question time where the merits of answers can be freely debated. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, well, first of all, um, I would reject the premise that uh, if you're referring to an individual and then you move to talk about a particular action, um, that that I should think otherwise that you're actually referring to that individual and their, their experience. You were talking about people getting access to mentors, and you're referring to Stephanie. Now, I don't know whether the person you're referring to or other people um, have had access to these particular mentors. I assume they have. Uh, and I'm more than happy to find out for you, Senator Watt, um, as to the, the merit or otherwise of the accusation that you're making that because the person that you're referring to hadn't had access to a mentor, a mentor it meant that everybody didn't have access to a mentor. But what I would say is this government takes very Order, seriously— Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Watt, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Last week, Mr Andrew Colvin from the National Bushfire Recovery Agency admitted that there was too much confusion around the bushfire recovery system, and the current system was, and I quote, effectively re-traumatising individuals. Why is this government failing to deliver the promised help and instead re-traumatising individuals? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Senator Watt, for your supplementary question. Um, the government obviously um, is very focused on making sure that we protect all Australians during this particular time, and that includes those people that have been impacted by bushfires. And, uh, and I would say that the, uh, the programs that have been put in place, the substantial programs that have been put in place for the bushfire support measures, are in going a long way to assisting Australians who have been impacted by bushfires. But as I said to an answer to my previous question, we acknowledge that there has been um, the recovery has been hampered in some areas because of the impacts of COVID. Um, and, but that doesn't mean to say that the ex extensive programs that have been put in place uh, to take up uh, the bushfire recovery efforts uh, have not been very, very significant. I mean, the small business support that was put in place by Senator to cash, you know, grants up to $10,000 that people were able to get access. The small business grants of up to $50,000 uh, for many within the, the local government areas that have been designated. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister outline how the Australia-India Comprehensive Strategic Partnership will benefit Australia economically? 
especially regional agricultural and mining communities in their post-pandemic recovery. Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Canavan for the question and for his long-standing commitment to, uh, to the deepening of the Australia-India relationship. Um, can, I, uh, can I acknowledge with that that to his work, indeed, as uh, part of the many pieces of the puzzle that led, as Senator Payne has outlined to the chamber already, uh, to the successful signing of the comprehensive strategic partnership uh, between Prime Ministers Modi and Morrison last week, uh, and has helped to drive India to the point of being Australia's fifth largest export market. It is a significant relationship for us nowadays, and I was thrilled, Mr. President, earlier this year in February uh, to lead a delegation of some 60 businesses, 20 universities, and 10 peak industry and research organisations to India, focusing across different fields of food and wine, agribusiness, resources, education, infrastructure, and tourism, reflecting very much the fact that in uh, that in 2019, Australia's resources and energy exports to India uh, were worth almost $13 billion, with metallurgical coal feeding India's ambitious uh, steel manufacturing targets, as well as amounts of gas, gold and copper uh, helping to fuel India's development as well as supporting Australian industries. Uh, our government is equally delivering on growth strategies in the agricultural sector with training on biosecurity treatments to improve the flow of agricultural products between our two countries. The Australia-India Council has funded Pulse Australia to produce regular guidance notes to better forecast Indian demand for agricultural commodities, and we're developing a grains partnership. We've extended the Australia-India Strategic Research Fund with $15 million over the through to 23-24 to pursue deeper economic engagement through collaboration in science and innovation. This includes sharing our mining equipment, technology and services expertise into the Indian market, once again helping to grow our economy and India's economy as part of a strong, strategic and mutually beneficial partnership. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. How will, Minister, the partnership with India help grow our nation's rare earth industry? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. The coalition government takes very seriously the development of Australia's critical minerals industry, and, uh, and Senator Canavan, uh, more than anybody else, I'm sure, in, uh, in this place, uh, has contributed uh, to that focus, including the joint announcements that Senator Canavan made uh, in the development of Australia's critical mineral strategy uh, and the new financing measures to help build the critical mineral sector. Our comprehensive strategic partnership with India includes an MOU on cooperation in the field of mining and processing of critical and strategic minerals to increase the flow of trade, investment and R&D in critical minerals, including rare earths. We have taken a significant step towards establishing ourselves as a reliable supplier of the critical minerals needed to grow India's manufacturing sector and its defence and space capabilities as we seek to grow our own. The Critical Minerals Facilitation Office is regularly engaged with their Indian counterparts to highlight Australia's potential as a reliable supplier of rare earths elements, and the MOU will strengthen that ongoing dialogue and trade. Order. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr President. How, how will expanding our trade relationships with other markets help secure long-term and well-paying jobs for regional Australians? Right. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, the opening up of Australia and expansion of our trade relationships has uh, helped to fuel the very strong job and economic position that Australia was in going into the COVID-19 pandemic, and it will be crucial to our success and our rebuilding and coming out uh, of these circumstances. Around one in five Australian jobs now depends uh, on trade, and under our government uh, we have seen an increase of more than 18 per cent in the number of Australian businesses who export goods to the world strong growth equally in the services sector and in both of these areas we see real potential for stronger growth in the India relationship. Our grains industry, our red meat industry, our sugar industry all appreciate the importance of uh, the international rules-based system and the opening up uh, of those markets. And If we look uh, at Senator Canavan's home state, beef exports from Queensland have increased 40 per cent in the past five years. Fruit and nut exports from Queensland have gone up significantly, horticulture and elsewhere, all as a result of these stronger Order, trade Senator relationships. Birmingham. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Oh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, the minister, minister, Senator Cormann has, on I think six occasions uh, in a number of questions over the last two days, declined to indicate, express regret or offer an apology to people who are, have been the victims of the illegal robo-debt scheme, including Nadia Seafright, 
uh, including Kath Madrick and including Rachel, who was referred to today. Can the minister explain his refusal to offer regret or an apology when the Prime Minister has just now apologised in the House? The minister representing the Prime Minister, um, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Well, and that is appropriate for the Prime Minister to do so. Um, the <laughs> service, services, services Australia, Order. As, I've, as I've indicated, Services Australia makes $190 billion in payments a year. Uh, we received advice at the time as a government that the program was uh, put together that it was lawful, and many governments indeed have used ITO averaging uh, data over many years, Labor and Liberal, and indeed Ms. Plibersek and Mr. Shorten and Mr. Bowen uh, have um, previously indicated that it is, appropriate, uh, to, it is appropriate to seek to recover debts. But of course, it should be made uh, in a lawful, it should be done in a lawful fashion. And as I've indicated yesterday, as I've indicated uh, yesterday, uh, of, course it, uh, it should, of course it should not have happened in a way that was unlawful. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my supplementary is this. Can the minister explain why it has taken so long for the Prime Minister to offer this apology? And can the minister explain why he is refusing to repeat that apology in this chamber? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, no. Order. Mr. President. Well, I mean, as the Prime Minister has said, as I understand it, the government has great regrets about any pain or injury that has been caused here, and, and we're making it right. And that is, of course, exactly right. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Are you kidding? <laughs> Mr. President, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister explain why the Prime Minister failed until today to do the decent thing and offer an apology for those who are victims of a scheme he designed and implemented uh, as Minister, Treasurer and then Prime Minister? Why did it have to be dragged out of him in question time after a court has found against the government? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. The Prime Minister, of course, speaks for the government, and the Prime Minister has made the government's position perfectly clear, as have I in this chamber. Thank you. So, further questions, replies on the notice paper. Motions to take note of answers. Senator Pratt. Madam Deputy President, this afternoon I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Cormann and Rustin to the questions asked by Senators Keneally, Kitching and Wong. Well, on display today and ever since this scandalous robo debt was put in place back in 2016. We have seen the parlous state of this government's morals on display. No regret or apology from the government about this issue until today, and still none from the finance minister or none from uh, Senator Rushton, who has had to oversee this program. You know, every inch of the way, time and time again Order. in this place, this government came in and tried to justify uh, averaging, income averaging over the ATO and comparing that uh, to the properly reported details that people reported to um, Centrelink as a justifiable way of issuing and raising debt notices. Hundreds of thousands of these debt notices have been sent, and I, like many others, and I'm sure it happened to you opposite as well, have had people in tears about these debt notices calling our offices. People demonstrating profound mental health impacts because of these debt notices. And what did I hear back from the government? Well, if you don't owe a debt, you've got nothing to worry about. But that was far from the case. The onus of proof to prove you didn't owe a debt was on you. That is a breach of any debt policy and any debt law around this country where debt collectors aren't supposed to be able to come after you unless they've got legitimate proof that the debt is owed. Now, Centrelink, this government had no legitimate proof that these debts were owed. Why? because they calculated these debts on a completely spurious basis. 
Senator Cormann said, oh well, uh, the opposition went in government. They used to use uh, ATO information to issue debt notices, and indeed we did. But we had a pair of eyes, human engagement, to work out whether the debt was valid or not, whether it had been properly calculated. And even then, people had a proper process where they could have how their debt was calculated explained to them. Now, I myself sat on the phone with Centrelink officials asking them, how did you calculate this person's debt? And they refused to say how they had done it. They simply refused to say how they had calculated someone's debt. They refused to say that actually what we've done here is averaged out how much you earned that financial year and used it to calculate whether we think by averaging that out you would have been eligible for um, income support over that time. Now, the simple fact is someone is entirely entitled to income support. You say, for example, at the first half of the year uh, you're working, so say from July uh, to October you've got a reasonably well-paid job and then you lose your job. Maybe you get a little bit of casual work after that. And then for the rest of the financial year you're on income support. Now what Centrelink did is they took that money that you earned in the first half of the financial year, they averaged it out. And then they said, we think you might have been claiming payments. Uh, we think you've got a debt. Not that we think you might have been making payments. They said, here is your debt notice. Here is the notice that says you owe us money because you improperly uh, claimed payments from us. And if you think otherwise, please bring us your pay slips, bring us your bank statements and prove it to us that you don't owe the government money. This is spurious and outrageous, and it is absolutely incredible to me that it has taken until 2020, when this bad behaviour started back in 2016, for this government to be properly called out on it. And what? It took the courts to do it. Not the blatant unfairness, not the complete lack of morals in, in, and the mental health impacts of this policy on people. No, you had to have the, the issue go to court. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Your time has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, that was um, a wonderful exercise in rewriting history, near enough to fantasy, because as we try and paint recipients of the assistance of the Australian taxpayer in their time of need as victims, we forget something really important, and that is that assistance from the taxpayer comes with it a set of obligations. So when someone makes an application for income support, let's say it's for uh, or any kind of income support payment really, they're told two really important things. One is that you've got to report your income and you've got to do it every fortnight. You've got to report Order. your income Order. and Senator you've got Pratt. to do it every fortnight. And they're told if their circumstances change, they need to let Centrelink know. And they're told, and they're told that if they fail to do so and they end up overpaid, a debt will get raised. Now, the people who have received these notices weren't just sent a debt collector to go and knock on the door. Yes, there was a computerised exercise of matching ATO records to what people had reported by way of income, an observation by that process that they didn't match, and in doing so, a process of averaging through the year was used. It turns out that wasn't the world's most accurate process, but it remains the case that the income support recipient has the obligation to accurately report their income. And if they're doing that, they're not going to end up with a problem. If they get a notice through this data matching process, as occurred in this case, it asks them to provide evidence of their income. If they engage with that process, as is their obligation, then they're not going to end up with a debt. 
there's going to be an accurate assessment of these things. But if we're talking about people who stick their head in the sand, people who refuse to engage with their obligation to provide information to Centrelink so that the taxpayer can be um, supporting those people in the measure reflected by law, then there's going to be a problem. Obligation is a two-way street. And those who receive support from the Commonwealth have to do their best to make sure accurate information is reported, just as the Commonwealth has to do its best to make sure we're assessing these things accurately. Now, I won't have Senator Pratt stand up here and um, take note of the questions today and pretend that there is some moral objection from the Labor side to the use of a computer-based measure to match the income reporting data with employment data for Centrelink recipients, because it is false. And I can direct those opposite to so many examples from their own ministers when they were in government in which they expressed support for precisely the same thing. So let me direct Senator Pratt to a few examples. From Mr Shorten, the automation of this process will free up resources and result in more people being referred to the tax garnishing process, retrieving more outstanding debt on behalf of taxpayers. Mr Shorten didn't have a massive problem with the idea that we should recover debts using a computer-based matching program. How about Mr Bowen? Mr Bowen had some things to say about this. He says, when, when he had responsibility for this area, it is important that the government explores different means of debt recovery to ensure that those who have received more money than they are entitled to repay their debt. So Mr Bowen is OK with being responsible on this front. Mr Bowen is OK with people being required to repay excess benefits that they receive from the taxpayer because income hasn't been properly reported. And what about this from Ms Plibersek? If people fail to come to an arrangement to settle their debts, the government has a responsibility to taxpayers to recover that money. Again, an uncontroversial concept, but those opposites seem to forget that that is exactly what they argued for in government. Well, we're not ashamed to say that we're going to do the right thing by the Australian taxpayer. We're going to make sure we support those in need, but we're also going to make sure that those who are overpaid repay their debts. And all the bleating in the world doesn't Thank you, change Senator that Stoker. responsibility. Your time has expired. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, two points that seem to come through in Senator Stoker's uh, uh, five minutes is a set of obligations. Where was the government's obligations and where is the government's obligations in terms of dealing with this matter immediately? And heads in the sand, I, I would suggest uh, uh, that perhaps those opposite need to have a good look at what that actually means. It seems the inability to say sorry and mean it runs deep in the coalition's DNA. We've heard and continue to hear heartbreaking evidence about the impact of the government's damaging and, as it turns out, illegal scheme. So why not apologise to the people for imposing this terrible scheme on them? We've heard evidence that it has cost some people their livelihoods, homes, families, peace of mind and even their lives. It is, it is shameful, it's unconscionable that not a single person in the government's ranks can say the word sorry. You cannot admit you were wrong to hound the families of deceased people demanding payment. You cannot admit you were wrong to inflict a bureaucratic nightmare on people and try and force them into repaying money they didn't have for debts they did not incur. You expect people in trauma to answer the questions about circumstances from years ago and threaten them with debt recovery action straight away if they don't answer immediately. Yet this government, the minister and the prime minister will not even answer the most basic questions about how this illegal robo-debt scheme was designed and implemented. The minister has dodged and ducked thrown up flimsy claims of public interest immunity and just plain refuse to answer questions about robo-debt. Have a look 
at the transcripts during our Senate estimates how many times we have tried to pursue this line of questioning. Have a, lo have a look at the transcripts of our community affairs inquiry and how this line of questioning is never one that is answered. The Prime Minister does need to step up and answer the questions about how robo-debt came into being and when the government was first made aware that what they were doing was illegal. The Prime Minister does need to answer the question about how much this botched robo-debt scheme is going to cost Australians in reality. It's now been suggested that the true value of all the debt notices unlawfully issued under this scheme will exceed $1 billion, not the $720 million the government promised last month it would repay to the 373,000 welfare recipients that received the unlawful demands for money. Since 2015, a total of $2.1 billion is estimated to have been raised through the robo-debt program. So what about those gaps between what the government says it will repay, what we now learn it will probably end up repaying, and how much they've actually raked in under this unlawful scheme? What exactly is the government considering as lawful and unlawful debts and how are they deciding this? The government won't answer any of these questions and let's make it clear what is happening here. The government hounded and harassed Australians for debts that they had not lawfully incurred and they will now repay some of the money they gouged from people. They will spend hundreds of millions of dollars on this exercise. And I'm not talking about even the potential fees the legal fees and damages payments that may arise from ongoing legal action against robo-debt. I'm also not adding into this what the government's paid out to the debt collection firms for hounding and harassing Australians into paying these false debts. The previous senator speaks about how these debt collection firms weren't knocking on doors. Well, I would say there'd be different stories out there from Australians who've got their own way of telling what and how they were made to repay these debts. It has been a complete failure. We're introducing a fee cap as part of the transition package that commences on the 13th of July. It will support families that struggle with their fees by requiring childcare services to cap fees until the 27th of September. Our government will also ease the activity test until the 4th of October to support eligible families whose employment has been impacted as a result of COVID-19. These families will receive up to 100 hours per fortnight of subsidised care. This will assist parents to return to the level of work, study or training that they were undertaking prior to COVID-19 and ensure the continuity of care for their kids. For example, if a parent who was working full-time in February and today is working part-time because of a reduction in available shifts, then the family is eligible for 100 hours of subsidised care per fortnight. And because their family income has been reduced, they will receive a higher rate of subsidy for the days their children are in care. They will receive more childcare and they will pay less for their childcare this coming quarter. And if you're looking for more evidence that we're getting it right, the Early Learning and Care Council of Australia has said that the Child Care Subsidy Activity Test will mean those impacted by COVID-19 will be more able to access and afford early education. And we're calling on families who are experiencing reduced hours of activity or reduced income to update their details so they do receive a higher subsidy rate than they were previously. The child care package has a generous safety net that's designed to provide higher subsidies to families who are experiencing financial difficulty. The additional child, safety care, child care subsidy is available for families under temporary financial hardship and provides increased child care fee assistance to those families under financial stress. A loss of income or a loss of employment or the inability to pay child care fees are just some examples of circumstances for which families may be eligible for this support. Eligible families can receive free care for the maximum 100 hours per fortnight. 
the additional childcare subsidy is also available for families transitioning to work. For example, families on JobSeeker would be eligible for a subsidy of 95% up to the hourly rate cap fee. This would mean a family might be paying 60 cents per hour for care where the services charges a $12 per hour fee. How successful have we been in addressing challenges that parents are facing? Well, the Australian Child Care Alliance President, Paul Mondo, has said, and I quote, we would like to wholeheartedly thank Minister Tian, the Treasurer and the Prime Minister, for listening to our members and recognising the importance of ensuring that all Australian families have access to high quality learning services. More evidence that we are supporting Australian families and businesses with fair and equitable support during the transition back to business as usual. Our transition packages ensures government support is accessible to every childcare services. We are continuing to look after childcare workers. In a sector with approximately 200,000 employees, around 120,000 employees have been receiving JobKeeper payments. Our new transitional package will reach the additional 80,000 workers, most of whom are women. When we are replacing one type of support package with another type of support package, it's important to look at the combination of packages. From the 13th of July, childcare services would receive approximately $2 billion in childcare subsidy and $708 million in transition payments, along with the means-tested parent contributions. JobKeeper will cease for the childcare sector from 20 July, and the employment guarantee with the transition package will be in place from 13 July. When Labor says we're turning our backs on this sector, I can only suggest they need to do more homework. It's not just the organisations that represent childcare businesses that have praised the Morrison government's response. The praise has also come from business owners. But we should also look at government's record, the Labor government's record when they were last in office. Childcare fees increased by more than 53 per cent, and their compliance record was woeful. They did absolutely zero checks and failed to they did less than 500 checks and failed to cancel or suspend a single service, while ours record 3,900 important compliance checks with 307 counts, 17 cancelled and 34 su suspended services. Simply put, we care enough about this sector to pay attention. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, when I read this, what childcare costs in a normal year is approximately $8.3 billion, or about $2.07 billion over a three-month period. Now, I'm the older generation. I admit that. I had my kids in the 70s and 80s. I had four kids at that period of time. I was a single mum. Did I have childcare? No. Our responsibility was to... We had the kids. We looked after the kids. If you couldn't, your grandparents looked after the kids. And I worked part-time, so I really did need that help. But it was my responsibility. I brought the children into the world. They were my responsibility, and that's the older generation. And you work together as a family. But now it seems that the government just wants to open up, and it's happened, both sides of parliament, behind the votes, and you're encouraging people out there to have the kids. They can have them, lower social economic, can't support their own children, and rely on the taxpayer or the tax dollars given to them. And then on top of that, you're saying, well, you don't have to look after kids. We'll allow you to put them into the childcare centre. So it's not your responsibility. And that's where the, the cost is coming to, the $8.3 billion. And to hear Senator Carol Brown's comments today saying that it's unaffordable for families, particularly women. Well, that in itself, I know a lot of men who have responsibility of their children as well. And it's, it is a huge cost to them. And what we need investigation into, the childcare centres and what they actually charge. And I know that childcare centres charge on a holiday. They still get paid their money. On a holiday, they are still getting paid what it would have cost to put those children in. And the cost to families is outrageous. Some centres in Victoria are charging $150 a day. In Tasmania, you're looking at $90 a day. It is terribly unaffordable. And we've allowed that to escalate to that point where these childcare centres are making a fortune out of it because the federal government's picking up the bill. If we want to be free enterprise that people have to take on their own responsibilities, 
well, then they should be paying for their childcare more so than the taxpayer, and especially those taxpayers are footing the bill. <coughs> if you want to increase in what we're paying out, Gonski, $22 billion. You want NDIS, another $23 billion. You want the subs at $90 billion. And here you want to put more money in, which could blow out to $15 billion a year. I want to know who's going to pay for this, because I tell you what, the taxpayers out there have had a gutful of picking up the, the bill for all these people who actually are not facing their responsibilities. So I'll say it. You give a helping hand when you need it to give that helping hand. But people have to start making, taking responsibility for their own actions. You bring children in the world, they're your responsibility. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. <coughs> well, this government continues to make balls up after balls up in its terrible response to the COVID-19 crisis economically. They consistently misjudge and do not understand the financial and economic situation that people find themselves in day after day amid, ad, in the midst of this pandemic. We see that the Education Minister, Dan Tehan, announced that it, the government thinks it's justifiable to return to full fees uh, because uh, participation in early childhood and care has now returned to 74 per cent across the board. You know, that is a ridiculous premise on which to base this policy. That is a return to 74 per cent of previous participation in a system that has free fees. So you're now about to return a system that has 74 per cent participation based on free fees and use that to justify a return to full fee paying uh, system. Australia already has one of the most expensive childcare systems in the world. Families were already telling us in response to uh, the government's so-called new childcare package that the system was too expensive, that they could barely afford it before <laughs> the pandemic. And now you are asking them to return to these fee structures in an environment where many households have lost income and jobs. And in fact, many of those uh, households uh, that will be struggling with these fee increases uh, have indeed had dramatic drops in income. Indeed, this government made a complete balls up again of the interim arrangements. We saw, we saw some childcare centres uh, who were forced to offer child, uh, free childcare, for example, in the early um, in the family daycare cent, uh, sector, forced to offer free childcare, and have absolutely no way of meeting their basic expenses to cover the costs of that care. Why? Because they weren't eligible for things like JobKeeper. It was patently ridiculous. I saw other examples uh, in the uh, northwest of Western Australia, where indeed you had skilled people uh, who were still in employment, unable to get childcare because the government had offered free childcare. And again, the centres couldn't afford to open because they couldn't afford to open and meet their expenses under the government's free childcare model. And so, as a result, Working families who were prepared to pay fees then couldn't even get a place. So instead of thinking intelligently about how you respond to the needs of centres, the needs of working families and, most importantly, to the needs of children, the government has just announced snapback to a system that is intrinsically not built for the current post-COVID circumstances. In an environment where, it's more, uh, where women's working opportunities are more challenged because they've been the first to be casualised, you're now asking them to undertake an activity test to, to be eligible for their couple of days a week childcare if you've lost work. You've got to look for work two days a week. Well, you know, that sounds fair enough. Until you put the complexities of what it's like to look for work on the table, when you're trying to organise your life around childcare. 
What does it mean if you're suddenly offered uh, a full-time job and you can only secure two days' work? Many families would like to be able to say, right, I'm looking for a full-time job. That's my commitment. Uh, my child is three. They're going into um, school soon. So if we get organised, we can do um, three days a week and I can move up to four, four days and we can get our child ready to make that transition. In many cases, you can't just say, right, I'm doing my two days while I've, I'm looking for a job and now I want a full-time place. Now I want a full-time place because I've found a full-time job. This government is Thank simply you, not Pratt. listening to the needs of families in our Senator nation. Senator Rennick. Deputy President, uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge Play Group Australia. Play Group Australia is a volunteer organisation whose vision is to create a village through play by supporting and connecting parents and their children. Both my wife and I, when we stayed at home, volunteered at Play Group Australia, and it, is, and it is an excellent way to interact with other parents. I'd also like to acknowledge stay-at-home parents. They make an important contribution to early learning and in helping our teachers, especially in primary schools. And can I say that whilst at Playgroup uh, that I learnt a lot of mothers and fathers actually want to stay at home with their children for as long as possible. Yeah, well, you know, I'm getting there. So this idea that it's good to rush parents back into the workforce isn't always the view expressed by all parents. Many do want to go back to work eventually, but not until later in their children's life. And I'm committed to giving parents as much choice as possible as to when they choose to go back to work which is why the focus shouldn't be on getting parents back into the workforce, but about making it financially easier for parents to have greater choice as to how they raise their children. So if parents want to stay home longer, they can. But most of all, it should be about the welfare of the children. It's important that our children don't get left behind in today's rat race. Not that Labor care about the welfare of the child. And we know that because there's nothing in this MPI that mentions the welfare of the child. And not once today have I heard any Labor speaker mention the welfare of the child. They're just interested in subsidies so that it can, they can deduct union fees from them. That's all they care about is collecting money to fund their re-election campaigns. Now, I was pleased this morning to give a speak, speech uh, to the paid parental leave bill, which would give mothers more choice about going back to work. And I was shocked to be heckled by Senator Watt about such an important issue. Can you believe this? He was mocking me for speaking on a bill that was going to help mothers stay at home with their children for longer. Women go, a lot, go through a lot to bring our children into the world. Nine months of pregnancy, childbirth, breastfeeding. It takes a huge toll and some women aren't always physically or emotionally ready to go straight back to work, especially if there's more than one child to look after. Not that Labor would care about the welfare of the mother. They just want to clip the ticket. Now, you would think that being a member of the Queensland Labor Party, a party that has closed down over 30 maternity wards in regional Queensland, Senator Watt would show a bit more respect to mothers. And do you know why it's so important that children stay at home with their parents? Because no one can give their children the self-belief they so desperately need like their own mum and dad. As I said in my maiden speech, there is no substitute for mum and dad. And of course, we must teach them respect. Because can I tell you, Labor and their left-wing institutions won't. You've only got to look at Twitter to see how the left think. It's characterised by hatred, blaming, self-loathing, virtue signalling and, of course, the modern-day equivalent of bullying, the pylon. No respect whatsoever. Pure 1920s communism. Well, let me tell you that Lennon's useful idiots are not the role model that the Australian people want for their children. They want them to be strong, independent, and the best way to do this is to ensure that mum and dad are allowed to make the right choices for their families. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, the time for the discussion has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents, and the documents are listed on page five of today's order of business. No? No takers? Okay, I shall now move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Smith. Thank you, 
Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the report of the Committee on Referrals made November 2019 and February 2020, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Thank you, Senator Smith. Um, the question is that the Senate take note of the report. So, agreed. Senator Smith. Uh, thank you again, uh, Madam Deputy President. I present the report of the Joint Standing Committee on Trade and Investment Growth on Trade Transformation, and I move that the Senate take note of the report and seek leave to incorporate the tabling statement into Hansard. The question is that the uh, take note of the report. Those in favour? Aye. All those against? The ayes have it. Okay. Are there any ministerial statements? No ministerial statements. Committee memberships. Messages from the House of Representatives. Um, the President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the National Skills Commissioner Bill 2024 con concurrence. I call the Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. Uh, put the question that the uh, bill be now read a first time. All those in favour say aye. All, all those against, no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to provide for the appointment of a National Skills Commissioner and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, I move that this bill be now read a second time and seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the debate now be adjourned. The question is that the debate be... Oh, I don't need to put that question. No. I do. Thank you. Uh, the question is that the debate be now adjourned. All those in favour? Say aye. All those against? The ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Paid Parental Leave Amendment Flexibility Measures Bill 2020. Clark. Government Business Orders of the Day number two, Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Amendment Enhancing Australia's Anti-Doping Capability Bill 2019 Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Smith. Good progress this afternoon after the formal motion. Well, efficient, uh, perhaps that's efficient chairing. Uh, <laughs> we are. Senator Indeed, Smith. It is. Thank you very much, Madam Acting De Deputy President. Uh, I rise to make a contribution uh, late this afternoon to the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Amendment Enhancing Australia's Anti-Doping Capability Bill of 2019. As we know, Australians love their sport. It's a love shared across the world, with sport estimated to account for as much as 6 per cent of world trade. And just as we expect our international trade to be conducted fairly, based on globally accepted principles and governance, our involvement in competitive sport is regulated by international standards also. Australia has agreed to the United Nations Economic, Social and Cultural Organisation UNESCO International Convention against doping in sport because we support the principles of the World Anti-Doping Code. The legislation before the Senate today will improve our compliance with these principles and assist ASADA to adapt and harmonise its functions to combat the complex and evolving nature of doping in sport. The bill implements many of the recommendations of the 2017 review of Australia's sport integrity, integrity arrangements, known as the Wood Review. According to the explanatory memorandum for this bill, the Wood Review disturbingly found and I quote, doping is more prevalent and widespread than ever among athletes at all levels and is facilitated by the increasing availability of highly sophisticated techniques that make it harder to detect. The Wood Review also found serious and organised crime is involved in the supply of performance and image enhancing drugs and the current suite of statutory protections and powers under the ASADA Act is not sufficient to facilitate ASADA's increasing emphasis on intelligence-based investigations. 
Australians watching their favourite elite sports, men and women, expect their performance to have been developed through tireless training or natural talent. They do not expect to see athletes who have deliberately flouted rules on performance-enhancing techniques unfairly competing against those who have done the right thing. Australians hate cheating, something the Australian cricket team knows only too well, and doping is cheating. The Morrison government is committed to addressing the problem of drugs in sports to ensure that community expectations regarding the conduct of our elite sports people are met and exceeded. As stated again in the explanatory memorandum, the Wood Review made a number of recommendations, including legislative amendments principally to the ASADA Act to allow ASADA's existing regulatory functions to be carried out more effectively. These amendments provide for these recommendations, which the principal effects will include streamlining the administrative phase of the statutory anti-doping rule violation process, extending statutory protection against civil actions to cover other persons in their exercise of anti-doping rule violation functions, facilitating better information sharing between ASADA and national sporting organisations through enhancing statutory protections for information provided to a national sporting organisation by ASADA, and finally strengthening ASADA's disclosure notice regime. These legislative changes are vital to ensuring Australians can feel confident about the integrity of their favourite sports and sportsmen and women. Importantly, the legislative changes will ensure that ASTADA has the ability to investigate matters where it considers it has a reasonable suspicion rather than a reasonable belief. In its contribution to the Community Affairs Legislation inquiry into this bill, ASADA had a number of things to say. ASADA noted that in four significant cases in recent years, the inability to reach the reasonable belief threshold had delayed or otherwise prevented the progression of those matters, noting that in each of these cases the subjects of the investigations were facilitators, suppliers or third-party enablers of doping. And in response to questions taken on notice at the Community Affairs Legislation Inquiry, ASADA estimates and I quote now that there are at least ten instances, ten instances of organisations or businesses being involved in the supply of performance and in image enhancing drugs that ASADA has been unable, unable to fully investigate using disclosure notices due to the current reasonable belief threshold. This evidence underscores the importance of changing the threshold to combat the prevalence of doping in sport. While this change has concerned some, the Department of Health more than justified in its evidence to the committee the necessity of this modern approach. Acting on a hunch is not reasonable. As set out in the explanatory mem memorandum, reasonable suspicion is a threshold used for issuing search warrants in many jurisdictions in Australia. Search warrants authorise, amongst other things, the forced entry onto premises and seizure of items. The Department of Health went on to explain that while reasonable, reasonable belief is appropriate when ASADA is able to rely on adverse analytical findings following testing of urine and blood samples, this alone is increasingly ineffective in confronting doping. Disappointingly, but perhaps not surprisingly, the Australian Greens presented a dissenting report as part of the Community Affairs Committee process. I'll briefly make some comments in regards to their findings on this issue. Recommendation 1 of the dissenting report is largely based on commentary presented in the Parliamentary Library's Builds Digest. This digest referenced comments made by the head of the Australian Olympic Committee in an article from the Australian newspaper in 2006. We are, of course, debating amendments to a bill in 2020. Yes, 2006. The dissenting report extensively quotes from pages 28 and 29 of the Bill Digest, but deliberately excludes the following statement. And I quote, however, the Australian Olympic Committee does not oppose the proposed amendments. In politics, language is important, and the way this is phrased does not do justice to the Australian Olympic Committee's public position on the government's proposed amendments and their public position is easy to find. 
The Australian Olympic Committee made a submission to the Community Affairs Inquiry that the Greens could have quoted from to provide a more accurate description of their view. The submission executive summary clearly states the Australian Olympic Committee welcomes the introduction of the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Enhancing Australia's Anti-Doping Capability Bill 2019, this bill that we are debating this afternoon. It is paramount to the protection of clean athletes in an increasingly complex sporting environment that anti-doping authorities have the necessary powers to investigate allegations of doping violations. The Australian Olympic Committee is supportive of all proposed amendments to the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Act 2006 and the ability of the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority to carry out intelligence-based investigations. Without this protection, we cannot preserve the integrity and honesty of Australian sport for all clean athletes. So says the Australian Olympic Committee in its justification for its support of these amendments tonight. The Greens' dissenting report goes on to question why ASADA and the government has allowed individual sporting codes to implement contracts compelling sporting partic participants to cooperate with ASADA. These are individual contracts between elite sports people and individual national sporting organisations. If individual organisations such as the Olympic Committee, which provided a copy of their Tokyo Olympics contract to the Community Affairs Committee, feel that their elite participants should answer any questions about doping, then surely it is appropriate for them to ensure this occurs through contractual arrangements. These contractual arrangements help protect the national sporting organisation from damaging doping allegations, demonstrating to participants and spectators that the use of drugs in sports are inexcusable. It's perfectly reasonable that someone who has competed to represent our nation must comply and assist with any ASADA investigation. This inspires public confidence in sport and at the Olympic level, and at the Olympic level protects our natural, national reputation. Meaning that an Australian who wins a gold medal, an Australian who wins a silver medal, an Australian who wins a bronze medal can have done so in full confidence that they've done it fairly, openly, and that that is a victory worthy of clean competition and reward at the Olympic level. The dissenting report comprised of six recommendations, but does not acknowledge the problems identified by the Wood Review or provide any alternatives to address these serious issues of integrity in sport. The reality, as highlighted by the evidence to the committee, is that if no changes are made to ASADA's current processes, they will continue to have difficulties investigating doping cases. To conclude, I note the following from the Community Affairs Report. The committee recognises that the matters addressed in the bill have been, subject, have been the subject of extensive review and consultation, both through the Wood Review, the legislative scrutiny processes and subsequently following the introduction of a similar form of the bill during the previous parliament. The committee notes that refinements to the bill in response to this scrutiny and consultation. The report goes on to summarise that this bill this bill seeks to enhance ASADA's intelligence gathering capabilities by addressing inefficiencies, inconsistencies and gaps identified by the Wood Review. At the same time, the bill is intended to provide ASADA with the flexibility it needs to apply a more risk-based and nuanced approach to its work. Oversight is maintained through internal ASADA procedures as well as through judicial review, while appropriate safeguards remain in place for the protection of that information. These are important changes to ensure the integrity of sporting codes and national sporting representatives. The Wood Review has identified the need for legislative changes and the government is delivering on these recommendations. Sport is a vital element of our Australian culture and the community expects their sporting heroes to be free from performance enhancing drugs and free from the allegation of use of performance enhancing, enhancing drugs. The Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Amendment Enhancing Australia's Anti-Doping Capability Bill 2019 will enhance community confidence and ensure that our elite athletes are at peak performance due to their own efforts and skill, not because of, of performance-enhancing drugs and treatment. I commend the bill to the Senate. 
Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Amendment, Enhancing Australia's Anti-Doping Capability Bill 2019. As chair of the Senate Standing Legislation Committee on Community Affairs, I'm very pleased to make a contribution in relation to this bill. The 17th of September 2019, the House of Representatives introduced the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Amendment, Enhancing Australia's Anti-Doping Capability Bill 2019 to Parliament. It was referred to the Senate Standing Legislation Committee on the 28th of November and the committee tabled its report on the 24th of February this year. The bill was introduced to the Senate on 5 December last year. This bill seeks to improve the ability of the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority, ASADA, to perform its functions within an environment, both here in Australia and internationally, where doping has become increasingly more complex and sophisticated in recent times. This bill implements recommendations from the report of the Review of Australia's Sports Integrity Arrangements, which is also known as the Wood Review. This review was conducted in 2017 and chaired by the Honourable James Wood, AO, QC, as part of the Australian Government's work to develop a comprehensive national sport plan. The Wood Review report was delivered to the then Minister for Sport in March 2018 and published on 1 August 2018. The Wood Review has been the most comprehensive examination of sports integrity arrangements ever undertaken in Australia, if not the world. It found sports are tested by a range of growing integrity threats. Such threats include doping, sports wagering throughout the world, particularly through on illegal online gambling markets, organised crime infiltrating and exploiting the sports sector, corruption in sports administration and growing participant protection issues, which includes the sexual abuse of minors in sporting environments. As we heard in September last year, when this chamber debated the National Sports Tribunal Bill 2019, the creation of a National Sports Tribunal was one of the key recommendations that stemmed from the Wood Review. This review was conducted in response to the integrity of sport being threatened from all corners of the globe. The Wood Review recognised that a fair, safe and strong sports sector that is free from corruption is something highly valued in Australia particularly by the sporting organisations and the 14 million Australians who participate in sport annually. Now, more than ever, as we start to come out of the social distancing restrictions that were required over the past few months to stop the spread of coronavirus, the value of sport has been elevated even further. Sporting participants, organisations and viewers have been eagerly waiting for sports to be deemed safe again. In the coming weeks, we'll see participants joining sports at all levels and renewing their desire to be part of such activities, including the AFL tonight. However, there is no place in these activities for doping, and we deserve to protect ourselves from threats to the integrity of our much-loved sports. In examining doping, the Wood Review found this practice was more prevalent and widespread than ever among athletes at all levels. In addition, the review found doping in sport was enabled by an increasing availability of highly sophisticated techniques that make it harder to detect. Doping is becoming harder to detect by urine and blood sample analysis alone. We need intelligence and investigations to detect doping incidents and programs. Organised crime was involved in the supply of performance and image-enhancing drugs. The review found, with statutory protections and powers under the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Act 2006, the ASADA Act, not sufficient enough for the increasing need for the intelligence-based investigations. This review showed something needed to be done to clean up sport in Australia. The Wood Review made a number of recommendations, including making amendments to the ASADA Act to allow the authority's regulatory functions to be carried out more effectively. These amendments include streamlining the administrative phase of the statutory anti-doping rule violation process, extending statutory protection against civil actions to cover other persons in their ex exercise of anti-doping rule violation functions, facilitating better information sharing between ASADA and national sporting organisations through improving statutory protections for information provided to ASADA and strengthening ASADA's disclosure notice regime. One of the major recommendations of the Wood Review is to amend the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Act 2006 and Australian Sports Commission Act 1989 to abolish the anti-doping rule violation panel. 
The anti-doping rule violation process was noted in the reviews as being overly bureaucratic, inefficient and cumbersome, and one of the most complicated of any countries in the world. This bureaucratic process was confusing for anyone facing a violation allegation. Additionally, some of the steps in the process were duplicated, which led to delays in final determinations for those hearings. The, pro the proposed amendments in this bill seek to speed up this convoluted process while still allowing the athlete and relevant sporting body a fair hearing. The relevant amendment would remove the anti-doping rule violation panel from the process, giving full responsibility for the Asada Chief Executive Officer to manage it. While these amendments remove a participant's right to appeal to the Administration Appeals Tribunal, the participant would still have recourse against any decision handed down by ASADA through their ability to seek judicial review. The proposed simplified anti-doping rule violation process will take the following form. The ASADA CEO will review evidence and determine if there has been a possible violation. If the CEO determines there has been a possible violation, the person is notified and invited to provide a submission within 10 days. The ASADA CEO will review the submission and if they still think a possible violation has occurred, they will notify the relevant person and sporting body and make a recommendation to the sporting body as to consequences of the assertion. The person may then accept or contest the infraction in a tribunal. The anti-doping rule violation panel was intended to provide independent oversight of the violation process. However, submissions to the Wood Review from national sporting organisations and ASADA itself stated that the panel's involvement was time-consuming, overly complicated and duplicated procedures, thus creating inefficiencies in the process. Article 8 of the World Anti-Doping Code requires the rights and obligations of athletes or support persons to be determined by hearing bodies. The National Sports Tribunal, which was established in March this year, will serve as a hearing body for the purpose of Article 8 for a significant number of athletes and support persons. The tribunal will ensure members of the Australian sporting community have access to an efficient, e effective, transparent and independent specialist tribunal for the fair hearing and resolution of sporting disputes. The tribunal can require witnesses to attend an interview, answer questions, give information and produce documents, but will not be subject to direction from any party, so there is assurance that anyone appearing before it will receive an impartial and independent hearing. It's important to note that the proposed amendments maintain Australia's ongoing commitment under Article 3A of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation International Convention Against Doping in Sport to adopt appropriate measures at the national and international levels that are consistent with the principles of the World Anti-Doping Code. SADA was established in 2006 with a statutory investigations function, but the organisation had no ability to compel people to cooperate with its hearings. ASADA investigators could only request people to attend an interview, but they could decline the request or agree to attend an interview and then not show up. There was no recourse to compel them to appear. In addition, there was evidence that doping violations were being organised by people who were not subject to anti-doping policies of one sport or another. So the sporting authority could not use its contractual powers to require these people to cooperate with anti-doping investigations. The 2013 amendments were intended to address these problems. The Wood Review found that for ASADA to effectively execute its intelligence and investigative functions, the right to claim privilege against self-incrimination should be excluded. In the past, ASADA relied on the cooperation of national sporting organisations to require athletes and other relevant people to answer questions, but the proposed amendment means ASADA will not have to rely on cooperation through private contracts. Further, doping violations allegedly committed by an athlete or a support person are often facilitated by a third person who is not bound by the terms of a sport's anti-doping policy. ASADA could issue such a per person with a disclosure notice requiring them to attend an interview to answer questions, but has no ability to require them to answer questions or to answer them truthfully. Under the proposed amendments, answers, information or documents given by someone under a disclosure notice will not be admissible in any proceedings other than those proceedings in connection with the ASADA Act or the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Regulations 2006. This provision presents a reasonable and proportionate safeguard on the use of the information obtained. It's important to state here that a disclosure notice cannot be issued to a medical practitioner under the practitioner unless the ASADA CEO believes that the medical practitioner is involved in a possible violation of anti-doping rules. 
This limitation recognises the confidential nature of the doctor-patient relationship and the need to prevent arbitrary interferences with that relationship. This bill also seeks to amend the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Act 2006 to extend protection for ASADA and national sporting organisations and their staff against civil actions when exercising anti-doping rule violation functions. This protects ASADA and national sporting organisations in their role when presenting evidence or material against an athlete or support person at a hearing, issuing an infraction notice or making recommendations about a provisional suspension. The Wood Review identified that under the Sporting Administration Body, rule, body Rules, sporting organisations are required to perform similar anti-doping rule violation functions to ASADA. The ASADA Act protects the ASADA CEO and the body staff and engaged personnel from civil action in their role of performing such functions. But the sporting organisations and their staff do not have the same level of statutory protection against civil action when performing similar functions. Anti-doping matters are becoming more complex, so the role of these organisations is an integral part of the investigative process. However, a lack of protection has presented a potential barrier for the participation of these organisations in such investigations. The extension of the immunity is a reflection of the fact that a sport may be required to do things as a result of ASADA's exercise of its legislative functions. For example, consider a situation where the ASADA CEO advises a sporting organisation that there is evidence an athlete has committed a violation. The organisation suspends that athlete, pending a hearing by a sports tribunal, and the tribunal finds the evidence is not sufficient to prove a violation, the sporting organisation could be exposed to civil action for the suspension. Under the amendments, the organisation would be protected against such action. The Australian Government has always supported a fair, safe and healthy environment for athletes and we are committed to providing an environment for clean sport to flourish. Sport not only provides the physical activity our body needs, but the mental and social benefits are widespread too. Doping is a major threat to the health and well-being of our athletes, but also a threat to our sporting way of life because it sullies all the good that sport provides within our society. Liberal member for Bennelong and tennis player John Alexander, OAM, spoke on this bill in December last year in the House of Representatives. As a former professional sports person, Mr Alexander knows the value of sport. He also knows the value Australians place on sport. As he explained when speaking, Australians don't just expect our sports people to win, they expect them to do so fairly and within the rules. Where they don't do this, we expect them to face the music. We don't like unfair behaviour in sport and doping presents unfair behaviour of the worst kind. In commending this bill to the Senate, I ask you to consider Mr Alexander's words further. He said the amendments proposed, proposed in this bill would ensure that athletes can have confidence that they are playing on an even field and Australians can have faith not only that the sports that we're watching are fair, but that our Australian sports, men and women, are representing our country with the same ideals of fairness and equality that their forebears have had for over 100 years. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Askew. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And can I thank uh, all members and, uh, sorry, and all senators for their contributions to this piece of legislation, uh, a very important uh, piece of legislation in uh, this country's continued efforts to maintain a globally leading framework for the fight against doping in sport. Um, can I acknowledge the, the uh, opportunity to work with uh, senators across the chamber and acknowledge the um, discussions I've been able to have with uh, my counterpart, Senator Farrell. I'm sorry that you won't be able to be in Adelaide for the showdown on, uh, on Saturday night as we resume um, the Aussie rules around the country. Um, uh, I understand tickets are very, very highly sought after. Um, but uh, but you'll, you'll be like the rest of us. We'll all we'll all enjoy it uh, and enjoy the game on the on the television. But it is great to see uh, sport recommencing around the country, both uh, at a community level, importantly, but also on our television screens. It's been very um, very difficult being minister for sport without any sport happening. 
Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, the fight against doping in sport continues to get tougher. The key factor in addressing uh, doping across the world is the unrelenting commitment of the international sporting movement and governments to work together to implement harmonised programs that are robust, effective and fair. Australia continues to be at the front of the fight against doping in sport. To ensure that we remain there, Australia's anti-doping capability needs to be enhanced. We need to streamline the anti-doping violation law process and reinvest those efficiencies back into ASADA and sporting organisations to enhance intelligence and investigations capability and education resources, importantly education resources, to support athletes across all sports and at all levels. Madam Acting Deputy President, this bill amends the ASADA Act to enable key measures to be implemented so that Australia meets its obligations to contribute to a safe and fair sporting environment, safeguard athlete health and continue to protect the fundamental values of sport. Uh, and Madam Acting Deputy President, I will indicate at this point in time we will be supporting the amendments that have been proposed during this, um, st the committee stage proposed by the opposition. Uh, can I again thank uh, all senators for their contributions to the debate on this piece of legislation and commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Act 2006 and for related purposes. I believe there are um, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Uh, we now move to amendments. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I seek to uh, move um, <coughs> opposition amendment uh, number one on sheet 8953 and seek to uh, speak to that uh, amendment, if I may. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Um, uh, this um, uh, amendment relates to items uh, 43 and 44 of this bill in its current form and seek to lower the threshold for the issuing of a disclosure notice from reasonable belief to reasonable suspicion. That would be a very uh, significant change to the status quo and have a significant impact on the athlete's individual rights. Currently, the ASADA CEO can only issue a disclosure notice if they reasonably believe that a person uh, has information that, it, that may be relevant to the administration of the national anti-doping uh, scheme. <clears throat> the change proposed in items 43 and 44 were among uh, concerns raised with the opposition by stakeholders and identified by both the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights and the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills. Labor has sought to work with stakeholders uh, to address this issue and initiated a Senate referral of this bill to the Community Affairs Committee for an inquiry earlier this year to give stakeholders the chance to uh, detail their concerns with this bill. Uh, through that engagement, we have decided to move an amendment uh, to the bill that would retain the current threshold of reasonable belief. <coughs> Key stakeholders, including the Australian Athletes Alliance, have told us that this amendment would address their most significant concerns with the bill. The lower threshold proposed by this bill in this current form departs from the Attorney-General's Guide to Framing Offences, uh, which says that the document disclosure provision should, <coughs> firstly, impose a threshold of reasonable grounds to believe that a person uh, has a custody or control of documents, information or knowledge which would assist the administration of the legislative uh, scheme, and secondly, give a person 14 days to comply with the notice. In contrast, uh, in relation to anti-doping matters, this bill proposes, proposes a, firstly, <coughs> a threshold of reasonable suspicion the person has uh, information, documents or things that may be relevant to the administration of the uh, NAD scheme, and secondly, <coughs> no limit to the period uh, that the ASADA CEO may specify in the notice. Where draft provisions depart from the guide, the uh, um, Attorney General's Department website instructs departments to consult with the Criminal Law Division of the AGD before proceeding. 
The explanatory mem memorandum of this bill is silent as to whether there has been any consultation uh, with the AGD. <coughs> the uh, uh, explanatory memorandum suggests that some jurisdictions allow search warrants to be issued as at a threshold of suspicion and that the nature <coughs> of the disclosure notice is less intrusive because it does not permit entry into premises. However, <coughs> that analogy is flawed because the disclosure notices in the context of anti-doping investigations can also compel a person to attend for questioning. In other contexts, the person can generally only be compelled to attend for questioning if a court issues a warrant for their arrest or a person, usually a po police officer, arrests them without a warrant. <coughs> the general requirement for issues of a warrant uh, for the arrest without a warrant, uh, sorry, or the <coughs> for the arrest without a warrant is that the person issuing the warrant or making the arrest believes on reasonable grounds that the person has committed or is committing an offence. These issues are summarised very clearly, clearly in the Bill's Digest for this Bill. The section on the Digest dealing with these issues wraps up by saying, the broad responsibilities of the CEO <coughs> and the width of the phrase relevant to the administration of the National Anti-Doping Scheme are cause for considerable doubt about whether a change to the threshold for issues of disclosure notice is necessary. It may be sufficient for the ASADA CEO to fully utilise the current legislation, which would not have the same flow on impact in relation to other measures in this bill. Uh, Labor takes the integrity of the Australian sports extremely seriously. We understand, that, uh, support, <coughs> understand and support the need of Australian defences against sports integrity threats to be updated as the nature of those threats evolve. And we recognise that the bill, for the most part, seeks to implement recommendations for the Wood Review of Australia's sports integrity uh, arrangements. Labor is committed to continuing to work constructively with all stakeholders to ensure Australian sport is well protected against uh, these threats. The establishments of the, the uh, Sports integrity, integrity Australia and the National Sport Tribunal, which Labor supported in the parliament, are important steps. Labor believes stronger anti-doping measures can be achieved while maintaining the current disclosure notice threshold uh, would support the bill as amended, if the Senate sees fit to support Labor's amendment. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Farrell. Uh, Senator Di Natale. Just to indicate that the uh, just to indicate that the Australian Group. Am I Leon? Can you hear me? Okay. Great. Just to indicate that the Australian Greens will be supporting uh, that amendment. Uh, indeed, uh, we, uh, amendment number five uh, was an amendment to a similar effect, as I indicated in my second reading spe uh, speech. Uh, we do have concerns around lowering uh, the threshold. We think that where the standard sits at the moment is appropriate, and in light of the Labor Party moving their amendment, uh, we'll be withdrawing our amendment at number five. Thank you, Senator Di Natale. The question is that items 43 and 44 of Schedule 1 standards printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. No. I think. Uh, can I just clarify that those who want the items gone should vote no. <coughs> so we're all. Yep. Good. I just. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry to me. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think the ayes have it. Uh, we now move. Sorry, the noes have it. I beg your pardon. The noes have it. Right. The next. Uh, I think we now move to Senator Di Natale. Do you have other amendments? I, I've. Um, I just like uh, to move um, uh, amendments uh, one to four and uh, six to eight. Uh, uh, on sheets uh, 8966 and uh, 8953. I'll uh, move them uh, as a group, uh, if possible. Look, as I, I, You're second, seeking leave to move them Seeking together. leave to move those. Is leave granted? Together. Leave is granted. Uh, as, as I indicated in our second reading speech, we have a number of concerns about the other elements of this bill. Um, I won't uh, repeat those concerns. Suffice to say that uh, we believe that uh, these amendments uh, improve this legislation. We're supportive of the uh, broad thrust of the bill. Uh, we're pleased that the disclosure threshold uh, hasn't uh, been uh, lowered, uh, and we believe these uh, other amendments um, uh, would improve the bill significantly 
um, they, uh, uh, I, I think, um, would allow a strengthening of the uh, anti-doping uh, framework uh, without compromising uh, the rights uh, of athletes, the fundamental rights of athletes, including uh, the right not to uh, self-incriminate. Thank you, Senator Di Natale. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting. Uh, sorry, Chair. Um, just a couple of quick comments on the Greens' amendments, which um, uh, the government won't be supporting, and I'll just put a couple of points on the record to, um, in the context of uh, that position. Um, uh, with respect to uh, retaining access to the AAT, which is one of the um, provisions that uh, the Greens are looking for, uh, the government does agree that it's right that there is an appeal process for anti-doping decisions. Uh, and, and, and that is why the government's established the National Sports Tribunal, which has commenced its operations. And so there is a process for athletes to uh, have an appeal process. Uh, and they also uh, do retain access to both the Federal Court uh, and also the Commonwealth Ombudsman. So there are processes that um, uh, can, be obtain can be obtained by athletes. The Greens uh, also make some comments with respect to cost, and there is some provision within the National Sporting Tribunal process for um, the CEO to assist in that circumstance, although uh, employing your own lawyers uh, will obviously come at some cost to anyone involved in those processes. Um, So, so we won't be supporting the Greens amendment in that context. Um, there's some discussion in the Greens amendments with respect to access to documentation and the, uh, the, the pr processes proposed within the bill uh, don't actually prevent athletes or parties from having access to documents. It's, it's basically about a time and place and availability of those docu documents. So we're not removing the right to access information and documents is, is part of the way that the legislation works. Um, for example, information or documents may not physically be in the possession of the CEO of ASADA or Sport Integrity Australia as it will become at the time. So it's about determining a time when they are able to be produced. Um, and so uh, we agree that it's parties should have access to the appropriate documentation. This is about organising and determining a time and place for those, uh, for those elements. Um, the points that the Greens raise with respect to uh, self-incrimination, um, given that these are civil pr proceedings, not criminal proceedings, there is a difference in how those, um, uh, the right to self-incrimination does or does not apply. Um, the common law right to self-incrimination does not apply in civil pr proceedings in the same way that it does. Um, uh, it does only in criminal matters, not civil matters. And so there is a there is a difference there. And and um, proceedings under this act are civil pr provisions, not criminal. Um, and one of the really important points that I think has been raised by a couple of colleagues in the debate is the capacity to um, deal with third parties, not necessarily contracted parties. And if we consider the circumstance of some of the most infamous uh, events in recent times with respect to doping, um, some of those parties have not been um, subject to uh, any processes of our anti-doping process because the anti-doping process does not have reach. And it's important that the facilitators of doping uh, can be captured as a part of uh, our anti-doping measures. And we, th we think that's a really important change in the way that our anti-doping system um, operates. Um, I've made some comments about the importance of the National Sporting Tribunal. We think that that's uh, an important um, uh, important 
addition to the overall framework of sport integrity in Australia. Uh, it's designed to be cost effective for athletes and um, provide support um, to athletes as part of that process. And I've already mentioned the fact that the, the CEO of the National, National Sporting Tribunal has an obligation to um, uh, provide support to athletes, including through the establishment and maintenance of a free legal advice panel. Um, uh, so th there are supports for athletes to get access to uh, support uh, at reasonable cost. Um, the Greens also in their amendments talk about the opportunities for uh, the establishment of a, an athlete, a specific athlete ombudsman. Uh, the World Anti-Doping Authority, WADA, is doing some work and has formed a working group to examine that concept. Um, the government would like to wait for that um, uh, working group to report back. Uh, it's not something that we complete, uh, completely rule out, uh, but we want to make sure that Australia remains compliant with the World Anti-Doping um, Code. Uh, and uh, we will refer the outcomes from the deliberation of the wider um, working group to the soon to be formed Sport Integrity Australia Advisory, Advisory Council on how to proceed. So uh, that provision that the Greens are seeking in their amendment is not completely shut off. It's something we will consider as that um, piece of work continues through the world anti-doping process. Um, I would note in that sense, though, that athletes do retain access to the Commonwealth Ombudsman. So the government won't be supporting the Greens amendments, but I think uh, we acknowledge some of the concerns that the Greens have raised as a part of um, their contribution to the de debate, uh, and there are some things that we'll consider as the anti-doping system in this country continues to evolve. Uh, so the question before the chair is that the amendments one, three, four, and eight on sheet eight nine double six be agreed to. All those in favour? All those against? The noes have it. The noes have it. So the second question before the chair is that items fourteen, forty five, forty seven of schedule one stand as Printed. All those in favour? Anyone in favour? Aye. Oh, aye. Thank you. Uh, anyone against? The ayes have it. The ayes have it. So the question is that the bill, as amended, be agreed to. Aye. Aye. Excellent. Uh, anyone against? Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister. Oh, the question is the bill be reported. Those in favour say aye. aye. No one against. So um, the committee has considered the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Amendment enhancing Australia's anti-doping capability, Bill 2019, and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of those opinions say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister. I move the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of those opinions say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority Act 2006 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number three, Commonwealth Registers Bill 2019 and four related bills. Resumption of second reading debate. Who am I? I don't know. Senator McAllister, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on the Commonwealth Registers Bill 2019 and the four related bills being considered together as a package by the Senate this evening. Together, these bills are for an act relating to a government registry regime and for related purposes, an act to amend the law relating to corporations, business names, registration and consumer credit and to deal with consequential matters relating to the enactment of the Commonwealth Registers Act 2019, 
an act to amend the Business Names Registration Fees Act, an act to amend the Corporations Fees Act and an act to amend the National Consumer Credit Protection Fees Act 2009. Taken together, these bills have two primary aims. They create a new Commonwealth businesses, Business Registries regime which will allow ASIC and other business registers to be updated to provide a more user-friendly and streamlined registry service. They also introduce a new director identification number which will make it compulsory for company directors to provide proof of identification before registering their companies. This will improve the ability of regulators to combat illegal phoenixing, which costs the Australian economy billions of dollars every year and causes enormous pain to the people affected within the supply chain. Labor has led the advocacy for both of these reforms and we will support this bill. And I am pleased that these bills have been brought before the Senate. For many years, many years, Labor and allies in the community have been raising the issue of illegal phoenixing. But very little has happened. The Senate inquiry led by Doug Cameron, reported in December 2015, making a recommendation about director identification numbers. Nearly five years ago, that Senate committee concluded its work, having taken evidence about the harms that were being done by illegal phoenixing, and yet only now, only now are any practical measures being brought before the Senate. But delay is a consistent theme, a consistent theme with this do-nothing government. After receiving the Banking Royal Commission final report, Prime Minister Morrison and Treasurer Frydenberg took six months not to do anything but to release an implementation timetable. One year after the report was on their desks, the government had only completed six out of the 76 recommendations made by Commissioner Hain. Now the government has announced a further delay. We are calling for the, Labor, the Royal Commission implementation delays to be limited to no more than six months. It's pretty reasonable under the circumstances. We acknowledge the role that the banks are playing in the crisis. We support a strong banking system and the recent measures that have added needed liquidity and financial support during COVID-19. But the Australian public rightly have an expectation that these recommendations will be implemented. The government cannot continually delay important and essential reforms, like implementation of the Commission's recommendations, and in the same way that it has delayed these reforms, associated with business registries modernisation. Equally disturbing are the reforms, the delay in the reforms to payday lending. One of the bills before us is an act to amend the National Consumer Credit Protection Fees Act 2009. Well, Labor has consistently advocated for greater protection for consumers in these areas in response to ongoing concern about improper behaviour. And we've backed up our advocacy with action. In government, we enacted the National Consumer Protection Credit Protection Act 2009, and that created a national regime for the regulation of consumer credit for the first time. In 2012, we made further enhancements, including additional protections regarding small amount credit contracts and consumer leases. And despite the sound groundwork laid in this area, once again, the government has failed to act in a timely way, and it's neglected the other reforms that are necessary to enhance protections for consumers under this act. The government started a review of the small amount credit contract sector in August 2014, about the same time that the Senate inquiry into phoenixing was wrapping up its work. It was the same year, incidentally, that it started the wheels turning on a business register's modernisation regime. In 2017, the exposure draft on payday lending was released and after a three-month consultation period, that all wrapped up in November 2017. But despite having the legislation ready to go, an exposure draft in place, nothing has happened. And so with Senator Griff late last year, I introduced the National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment, uh, Small Amount Credit Contract and Consumer Lease Reforms Bill 2019. And we've introduced it here as a private senator's bill, a bill that embarrassingly seeks to legislate the government's own legislation that's been sitting on for years. With the support of Senator Griff, We've been working through the provisions of that act in an inquiry on the bill in the Senate Economics Legislation Committee. Now, I look forward to that committee reporting, and I'm confident it will add to the body of evidence about the need for enhanced consumer protection here. 
But if the government had any idea what was going on in the community, they wouldn't need an inquiry. They wouldn't need additional evidence. They would have acted. But typical in this area, as so many other areas, all we get is delay. So now we turn to the modernisation of business registers. Well, our business registers are in need of modernisation. Currently, they operate on severely outdated and inefficient information technology infrastructure. This infrastructure has not evolved with changes in technology or with the needs of business over time. But again, the story here is delay. The government first committed to modernising business registers back in 2016. And back then, it was part of an attractively named National Business Simplification Initiative. And the intention of that initiative was to reduce the time businesses spent interacting with government so they can get on with the business of keeping the economy moving. Well, in its most recent budget update, the 2019-20 Mid-Year Economic and Fiscal Outlook, only $60 million was allocated to the project. And this is a big project. As we've been told time and time again in estimates when we've asked about it, it's a very complex project. The scope is substantial, but the government's track record in implementing Infotech projects is really, really poor. And the government needs to ensure and provide some guarantees in this place that it is going to invest what is necessary to complete this project successfully. Similarly, director identification numbers have been on foot for a long time. They're important. The implementation of a legal framework for director identification numbers will provide a unique identifier for directors of Australian companies and it will provide traceability for those directors over time. Labor has advocated this for a very long time. Without Labor's work on this issue, the Liberals would continue to allow fraudsters to rip off small businesses and their employees. Every year, illegal phoenixing costs Australian workers and businesses billions of dollars. It sees company directors strip businesses of their assets when times get tough, not pay their debts to workers and then vanish completely, only to start a new business later on. And in many cases, directors do this numerous times. In 2018, a report by PwC estimated that the annual direct cost of phoenix activity to the Australian economy could be between $2.9 billion and $5.1 billion. And this includes up to $3.2 billion worth of unpaid invoices for services provided and up to $300 million of unpaid entitlements for Australian workers. I return again to the fact that these issues were canvassed extensively by a Senate inquiry spearheaded by my friend Senator Doug Cameron. This place is only now coming to grips with the recommendations made in that report about director identification numbers. We have long urged the government to act on illegal phoenixing and we commend the government for finally getting around to doing something. We will support this bill and we encourage the government to implement their long overdue measures as soon as possible and to properly resource their implementation. Thank you, Senator. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I know you're a, you're a pretty funky guy, so you're going to be very interested in what I've got to say. Uh, and that That's is that El Elvis, here, Elvis Presley and Bob Marley are alive and well and living in the Australian business registry. Indeed, they are registered as company directors uh, in, in Australia, uh, as, by the way, is Homer Simpson and many other uh, colourful characters. The point I'm making is that this reform that we've got in this bill before us tonight uh, is long overdue because we have had a system that is all about easy registration, but it's never been about identity checking. And ASIC themselves have uh, not pulled the wool over anyone's eyes in this respect. They've been totally open and honest that the system was set up to allow easy registrations online with no verification, no authentication at all as to who is being registered as a company director in Australia. So there's quite a few interesting aspects of the changes here, but uh, I just wanted to make a quick comment in, in my few minutes tonight before we go into adjournment. Um, ASIC made it very clear that the process to change the business registrations online for company directors has been underway for nearly 16 years. 16 years it's been talked about by parliamentary committees. 16 years it's been discussed at Senate estimates. 16 years it's been raised by parliamentarians. And I would point out to Senator McAllister that it's not just 
the uh, coalition government that haven't acted on this. If what Asik has said is true, this has been going on for a very long time. And it wasn't until the Phoenix Task Force actually looked at this, which of course brought together stakeholders like ASIC, uh, the, the Federal Police, uh, AUSTRAC, the Australian Tax Office and others, before the issue finally got enough momentum to get to a point where we've actually got some legislation uh, before us. Now, there's 2.7 million company directors listed in this registry. And I'm sure many of them are genuine, but there we know for a fact that many of them aren't. We also, and it's been well reported by the ABC and Guardian and other media outlets, that uh, vulnerable people have been approached and been paid to go and register as company directors for front groups, for, for dodgy companies, especially companies that go into liquidation without paying their PAYG tax. This has been going on for some time, and I suspect that ASIC are very glad to be hand-passing uh, this registry to the ATO and the whole process of modernising this registry. Uh, there's very few regulators anywhere in the world that also look after the business registry. In fact, I think uh, Mr. Ship Mr Shipton said that there was only two other countries in the world where the regulators are responsible for maintaining uh, the registry. So uh, this bill uh, is important not just because we are going to get a, uh, a much more uh, robust and authentic system for establishing company director IDs uh, by issuing a number uh, with an authentic authentication process, and that number will be with company directors for life. Uh, so you can't you can't just uh, re-register for each business that you may be wanting to set up. That number will stay with you for life, and that is going to occur at the same time that the uh, registry modernisation project uh, is underway. Um, and I believe that the ATO is a good place to have the registry. Uh, there's a number of other initiatives that the Greens have been pushing for years to get um, much better transparency in place uh, to avoid illegal and unethical behaviour, phoenixing being just uh, one, one example of that. Um, so this has been a 16-year journey um, and we know it's going to make a difference to things, uh, issues that we've dealt with uh, in committee. We know a real problem uh, such as um, a, a whole range of uh, misconduct, but particularly around, uh, particularly around liquidation. And I've got one second left now. You've got, and, and on that point, Senator Wish Wilson, I, I will interrupt you and you'll be in, in continuation. But being 7.20, I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn and I call Senator Sazelja. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, you know, at, um, during times of crisis, Australians, of course, come together. And I want to take the opportunity uh, to uh, pay tribute to some of the local heroes here in Canberra who have done great things uh, during the COVID crisis, as people right around the nation uh, have been doing. But I wanted to honour some great Canberrans. Um, so I wanted to draw the Senate's attention to some of these outstanding Canberrans. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Dr Toby Angstman. So he's a doctor here in Canberra and he's founder of Canberra Distillery Underground Spirits. Now, for several years now, Toby and the team at Underground Spirits have produced some of the finest gin and vodka in the country. Uh, and when COVID-19 restrictions saw the closure of pubs and clubs, Underground Spirits switched production to hand sanitizer and produced more than 40,000 litres of hand sanitizer, which has been distributed to doctors, nurses, paramedics, pharmacists, dentists, and to those most in need. Among the customers were those on the front lines at Services Australia, uh, who faced the serious prospect of being unable to open their offices up and down the east coast of our country. Underground Spirits were able to supply 1,200 litres of hand sanitizer within 24 hours to enable Centrelink officers to continue their work. I want to commend Toby and his entire team for the work they've done and continue to do. And underground spirits are not alone in changing rapidly uh, from the production of alcohol for consumption to the production of hand sanitizer. I want to recognise Unicorn Spirits, Big River, Canberra Distillery and Capital Brewing Co as well for their excellent work. 
Uh, then there's Glenn Keyes uh, and his excellent team at Aspen Medical. Now, Aspen uh, is a Canberra-based company, uh, more than 200 Canberra-based staff, and they've been working to deliver pop-up emergency departments and additional testing facilities, uh, not just here in Canberra but right around the country, a really important part of our response in uh, dealing uh, with this health crisis and that insurance policy uh, for if we had seen uh, those numbers uh, grow significantly, which thankfully to date we have not. I'd also like to recognise John and Lynn Anderson, the owners of Federation Square, a small shopping centre precinct in Gold Creek Village. Now, John and Lynn, Lynn consider their tenants family, and when times get tough, family members pull together to make sure everyone gets through, and that's exactly what John and Lynn did. In an extraordinary demonstration of the Australian spirit, John and Lynn told each of their 30 tenants that they wouldn't need to pay rent at all for the month of April. Uh, very generous. So there's Tamara Kurtz who set up the Canberra Region Coronavirus Mutual Aid Facebook group in order to connect those in need with those who can lend a hand. Uh, members help others with grocery runs and supplying essential goods to those unable to do so themselves or have been socially isolating. Uh, we've seen people at the Australian National University, my old uni and the greatest university in Australia on the latest rankings, and uh, in their own homes, uh, these people from the ANU have come together to crash print batches of face shields for frontline health workers to ensure they get the PPE they need uh, where there may have been shortages. And it's good to see that Despite everything, the Turner Ruck is continuing, has been continuing with the virtual meat raffle on Fridays to well done to the team there. There's also, there are also the unsung heroes, of course, of the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, like in other parts of the country, the supermarket workers putting in overtime to keep our shelves stocked, going above and beyond. Uh, there are the cleaners working to ensure that our workplaces and public transport are as safe as they possibly can be. And I wanted to pay tribute to uh, the Australian Public Service, of course, many of whom are based here in Canberra. Now, uh, there are a lot of people uh, in Australia who like to bash the Australian Public Service, and some of them come into this place uh, from time to time. Uh, but I think it's fair to say, and, and I would say on behalf of Canberrans and on, a, on behalf of Australians more broadly, uh, there has been some extraordinary work done during this crisis uh, by some of our uh, Australian public servants, whether that's uh, frontline workers at Services Australia, uh, who, which really geared up to make sure that people could get the payments they need, whether it's the chief medical officers, the other uh, health officials, whether it's those in Treasury and Finance doing the economic response, whether it's in the Department of Industry uh, looking at some of those supply lines and, of course, in the Department of Infrastructure and so many other areas. Is, uh, whether it's other frontline workers. Uh, to those Canberrans in particular, tonight I just wanted to say thank you. I want to say thank you for your outstanding work. Thank you for your service to our city. Uh, and for those going beyond, thank you for your service to our nation uh, during this very difficult time. Uh, thank you, Senator Seselja. Senator Billick. Thank you. One of the first Australian industries to be hit by the restrictions that came into place in response to the COVID-19 crisis was arts and entertainment. While the restrictions on public gatherings were vital for stopping the spread, they sadly also put a stop to the many events which the arts and entertainment industry relies on for much of its income. Museums, galleries, theatres, live music venues and TV and movie production sets were closed. Concerts, festivals and exhibitions were cancelled. This has led to an uncertain future for many of Australia's 50,000 professional artists and the 600,000 workers who support them. While the JobKeeper wage subsidy scheme has helped some artists and arts organisations, many are ineligible despite having lost 100 per cent of their revenue. And this is why Labor has been calling and continues to call for a targeted and tailored package of support for the arts and entertainment industry. That package needs to be developed in consultation with the industry, and it needs to be substantial enough to make a real difference. Targeted support for the arts and entertainment sector from the government so far includes a $27 million support package, $7 million for Indigenous arts, $10 million to the Charity Support Act, and $5 million Relief and Recovery Fund. Now, when you add these initiative ups up, that's just shy of $50 million. 
And this financial support is welcome, but it's a drop in the ocean for a $111 billion industry which has lost about a quarter of its workforce. Life Performance Australia estimates that its segment of the industry alone needs $850 million in support to get through the crisis. That's more than 15 times what Mr Morrison's government is offering the entire industry. Just to give some context, this government gave $100 million in support to zoos. That support was no doubt necessary and welcome. But when a major industry receives half as much funding as that going to zoos, it really calls the government's priorities into question. For those who know the history of the government's treatment of the arts, it should come as no surprise that they would abandon the industry in time of need. People in the arts industry have long memories. They remember that those opposite cut nearly $90 million from the arts in their horror 2014 budget and withdrew $105 million from the Independent Australia Council in 2015 and directed it to the Catalyst Slush Fund. To add insult to injury, they axed the Federal Arts Department in December 2019. Australia's screen industry is facing a crisis because the government has suspended key local content quotas for new Australian drama, documentary and children's programs. In early April this year, when the last round of Australia Council grants were announced, 49 small to medium organisations lost their funding. This included several in my home state of Tasmania, such as Tasdance, Kick Arts, Kickstart Arts, the Salamanca Arts Centre and Australian Plays. Some of these organisations have lost a large chunk of their revenue and are now facing an uncertain future. For Taz, Taz Dance, it has put a dampener on next year's celebration of their 40th anniversary. And the cut to the digital publishing services of Australia Plays has national implications for the ability of playwrights throughout Australia to earn a living. The Liberals' history of neglect and even apparent contempt for this industry clearly demonstrates that those opposite are not friends of the arts. But we, on this side of the chamber, understand the value of arts. We know that Australia owes it to the arts industry to help them through the crisis. Throughout the pandemic, they have given us a means, while confined in our homes, of keeping our minds active and engaged, of allowing our imagination to escape to the outside world. During this period of self-isolation, many of us have found comfort in Australian books, music, films and television. And the arts industry has helped us through previous crises, including raising funds for relief during the recent fires. In my home state of Tasmania, the arts do much more than just provide entertainment. They underpin our $3 billion tourism industry with attractions like Mona and festivals like Ten Days on the Island and Dark Mofo, drawing visitors from around the world. And we must remember there are many community arts organisations which run the program promoting mental health wellbeing and social inclusion through the arts. Surely, after discovering their $60 billion JobKeeper bungle, this government can afford to provide serious funding to an important Australian industry which is gasping for breath. I urge those opposite to come up with a serious plan to save the arts. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on a very important manufacturing opportunity that we cannot, I repeat, we cannot let slip by. Electronet and Transgrid are in the process of seeking approvals to build a 900 kilometre interconnector between Robinson, oh, sorry, Robertstown in South Australia and Wagga Wagga in New South Wales. It's a 330 kilovolt above ground transmission line with a transfer capacity of about 800 megawatts. It'll help stabilise power and reduce electricity prices in South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales. It will also provide connection points uh, along the way to tap into renewable projects which will be given the opportunity to, to connect to, to the grid through the interconnector. Now, if we do nothing, the steel for that 900 kilometre interconnector will come from overseas, despite having ample ability in this country to build raw steel. Last year, 
Centre Alliance lobbied the government, and the government, uh, and I'm very appreciative of, uh, of, uh, of their support, provided a whaler company, Ferretti, a $600,000 grant to look at the feasibility of actually building transmission towers here in Australia. Here in Australia, in Whaler, using steel from the Whaler Steelworks. Now, the feasibility study has been completed, and basically it stacks up. It is feasible for us to build transmission towers here in Australia at a competitive price. Not only that, it will create about 150 jobs in Whaler. It will create $500 million in economic stimulus over eight years. It will also place greater demand on the Wireless Steelworks to help the steelworks uh, uh, in their expansion efforts and making sure that we retain a steel capability here in this country. Because you know what? If you can't uh, produce steel, you, you, you pretty much have to give up. It's necessary for manufacturing right across Australia. It's necessary for construction. It's necessary for the defence of this country in times of conflict. It's a strategic capability. So we need to support that. <clears throat> and it builds, if we were to have a, uh, a plant in Wyala that Freddie is hoping to build, uh, we would build a capability. We would build a capability that value adds, and that's exactly the sort of thing we need to be doing here uh, in Australia post COVID 19. There are huge opportunities. There's a 60 kilometre transmission line in the Pilbara that needs to be built. There's a Coltana to Port Lincoln power line in, uh, on the Eyre Peninsula to be built. Uh, there's Snowy 2.0, which will require transmission lines. And that's just to name a few. We want to have a situation where transmission lines uh, across Australia are built from Australian steel, Australian quality steel. Now, the government needs to help make this happen. The government needs to impress upon uh, uh, the, the, the companies that are building, uh, intending to build this interconnector that it must be Australian steel. Because you know what? We've got to stop just exporting rocks. We have to stop just exporting rocks. We need to be value adding. Now, of course, when we build steel, we are value adding, but we need to go up the value chain and we need to be looking at building, in this instance, uh, transmission towers. And uh, if we're able to do this, if we're able to get a commitment or uh, having the government uh, 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 apply pressure uh, through whatever means, and I will be writing uh, to uh, Minister Taylor uh, about this next week, we need to make sure that uh, this, uh, this work goes to Ferretti in South Australia. That will make Wyala a winner, that will make South Australia a winner but it will also make Australia a winner. And that's what we must do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to address this chamber about very important Indigenous issues which have been uh, profiled at large over the last week or so. I believe that one of the most important issues that faces our country is uh, the disadvantage which has applied to Indigenous people for the last couple of hundred years in this country. Now, when you look at the key stats, and we hear them regularly in this place, uh, they do, uh, we do look at incarceration rates, we do look at mortality rates, we do look at the uh, level of education attained. Now, th these are uh, real bread and butter issues, uh, which you'd have to say that for a country as wealthy and as successful as Australia that we have not performed well on. In fact, I would say that we have failed Indigenous Australians. Now, the framework that was put forward in 2017, which is known as the Uluru Statement, I believe does offer um, some significant opportunities for us to address these issues in a structural way. The, the statement itself, itself calls for structural reform. Uh, it does seek uh, a voice 
uh, for Indigenous Australians, uh, which would provide the capacity for uh, Indigenous people to have a say on policies and laws which affect them, which I believe is a good and a fair idea. There is, of course, a component in the Uluru Statement around truth-telling, and the Minister, Ken White, uh, has said this week that that is an important component. It is an compo important component. Uh, we have seen statues pulled down in other countries. Uh, there is a discussion about pulling down statues in this country. I think it would be a huge mistake to try and rewrite our history, and we should take this opportunity to uh, be honest with ourselves about what has been good and what has been bad. Uh, Minister White himself, the first Indigenous person to occupy the position of Minister for Indigenous Australians, has said, quote, these statues should remain as a reminder of a point in time in our lives, even when detrimental. They serve as prompts to encourage people to talk about our history, end quote. In schools today in Australia, people are, are told about our past. And that is important, and that should continue. The other practical measures that I think we should continue working on uh, include uh, changing with the agreement of the Indigenous communities the Closing the Gap targets. And of course, there is very practical things that can happen at the local level. Uh, I have tried to spend the first year I've had in public office uh, meeting with people in communities in my state of New South Wales, in places like uh, the Central Coast and Kempsey. And, and Redfern, where there are large Indigenous communities, and asking them what was important to them. Now, uh, often it is, especially in more remote parts of the state, it is the, the way that policing is done. Uh, and there are you know, significant changes, I think, which could improve uh, relations and engagement between uh, community and, and law enforcement. Now, in places like Redfern, where there have been significant troubles uh, going back uh, with riots and even in the last few years, uh, many of the elders today would say to me, well, we have broken down barriers between uh, uh, Indigenous groups and the police, uh, and that has really improved things on the ground. Now, comparisons, I think, are often unhelpful between jurisdictions and between countries. Uh, I think in this case, uh, at the issues that we have in this country uh, predate any of the activity over the last few weeks. We should own the, own the, the mistakes and we should press on with this framework we've been given by the Indigenous uh, community, which is this, this Uluru Statement, as a way, a practical way to address some of the, the challenges. So I, I mean, my sense is we should, uh, we should not fail in this task. If we, were, if we were to fail on the commitments we've given Indigenous people, which have been uh, enunciated very clearly and very well in the PM's Closing the Gap framework, then we would risk the cohesion of our country. Uh, so we can't afford to fail on Uluru. Finally, uh, today is 49 years since uh, Neville Bonner was pre-selected as an LNP uh, Senate, uh, senator, and uh, he he was a uh, obviously a trailblazer for uh, everyone. And he did say, uh, "I've seen more dinner times than I've seen dinners. I've known discrimination. I've known prejudice. I've known all of these things, but some of that is still with us, and it's got to be changed." End quote. I think uh, we still have much work to do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. We all remember the horrific scenes last summer when bushfires tore through so much of our country. 33 lives were lost, thousands of homes were destroyed, millions of hectares were burned, and it's estimated that one billion animals were killed. Sadly, for too many bushfire victims, the pain is ongoing several months on. Last week, it was reported that only 4 per cent of people in bushfire-affected areas have managed to access government support—4 per cent. 96 per cent of people have received nothing. One in 10 bushfire victims who applied for the government's disaster recovery payment has been rejected. One in three who applied for the disaster recovery allowance have been rejected. It's no wonder that so few people in bushfire-affected regions have received the support that they need when you look at those figures. The disaster recovery assistance process has been slammed by individuals, farmers and small businesses as confusing, stressful and too complicated to navigate, 
These are people who, who have already been through bushfires, have literally feared for their lives, have lost property, have in some cases lost loved ones, and now they face a system of payments that is just too complicated to navigate to the point where many, many give up. I've met so many of these people over the last few months in different parts of the country. Uh, after the last sitting week, Senator Ayres and I travelled to Cabago uh, uh, on the New South Wales south coast uh, and witnessed firsthand the trauma that is still being experienced by people uh, and the lack of support they feel they are getting from this government. Even the coordinator of the National Bushfire Recovery Agency has admitted that there are significant problems. While giving evidence to the Bushfire Royal Commission last week, Mr Colvin, the coordinator, acknowledged that to obtain support, victims have to tell their horrific stories over and over again. He acknowledged that, and I quote, every time they have to tell their story, we are effectively re-traumatising that individual. Why can't this government make the changes that are necessary to ensure that bushfire victims receive the support they deserve without being re-traumatised. Is that really too much to ask when you think about what these people have been through? It doesn't have to be this way. For months, Labor has been pointing out the need for case managers to help people navigate the grants process. Sadly, the government has not taken up this suggestion, and it's bushfire victims who are the poorer for it. And of course, quite apart from the issues around accessing grants and loans, we still have people living in tents, in caravans and in buses, including brave firefighters who put their own lives on the line to protect others. Now, some of the places that these bushfires hit are some of the coldest parts of our country. We are now in winter and people are still living in tents, in caravans, and buses waiting, in some cases, for their burnt down homes to be removed so that they can just start rebuilding. That is not acceptable in this country. I'll give you a couple of examples. Mr Roy Annesley survived severe, severe burn, burns to 55 per cent of his body and his house burnt down. He's now living in a bus fundraised by his son. Now, Mr Annesley says, I just can't do all the groundwork to try and do all this stuff. I can't even do anything. I don't want to get out of bed in the morning. They should contact you. You shouldn't have to chase them. I 100 per cent agree with Mr Annesley. He's been through a lot. He's living in a bus that his son had to fundraise for him. Should he really be expected to navigate an incredibly complicated grants process and tell his story over and over again to receive the support that he needs? And Ms Stephanie Stanhope, says that for all the assistance you were led to believe was going to be there, it isn't. Not long after it happened, there was a call from someone in the system saying that each person would be given a mentor to guide them through the process. I've had one phone call. That's what she says. Now, it is not good enough that these people have been forgotten. It is not good enough that we have a Prime Minister who promised these people immediate support and the minute the news cameras went, they were forgotten. We've got to do better. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair, or President. I rise tonight to speak on the irreplaceable lo loss of junk and gorge rock shelters in the Pilbara of Western Australia. These were willfully destroyed. On Sunday, 24th of May, at the beginning of Reconciliation Week, Rio Tinto blasted the junk and gorge rock shelters to smithereens. The rock shelters showed 46,000 years' worth of continual occupation and provided a 4,000-year-old genetic link to today's traditional owners. The Puntu, Kunti, Kinamara and, and Pinikara peoples, the traditional owners of this land that was blasted, did not want this heritage destroyed, but now they are gone. People around the world rightly condemned the destruction of ancient statues and sites by the Taliban and, IS, and the ISIS. 
what was blasted in the Pilbara in Western Australia is irreplaceable 46,000 years and is rightly being condemned around the world. Rio Tinto knew the cultural significance of the site to the traditional owners. They even helped make a documentary about it. They can't deny that this was willful destruction of a heritage site. It is morally and ethically wrong, and they did not have a social licence to do that. But it's not just Rio Tinto in my home state of Western Australia. We have, unfortunately, a long and tragic issue, issue and history of destroying First Nations cultural heritage in our country. That does not have the consent of the traditional owners. In fact, in Western Australia, traditional owners are being required, if they want to get some sort of compensation or payment at a very early stage, to sign agreements, which means they cannot actually then complain. And they're signing agreements before some of the archaeological work is done. There are a whole host of mining companies in WA, including BHP, uh, Fortescue Metals Group, and, and quite frankly, they are taking advantage of the archaic heritage laws, Aboriginal Heritage Act in Western Australia, which over the decades mining companies in Western Australia have directly influenced to make sure they are weak and weakened when they didn't get their way and if they thought that First Nations heritage and culture would stand in the way. And today, of course, we heard that BHP was also just granted permission only days, it is reported, only days after the destruction wrought by Rio Tinto. They received permission to then also destroy. It's reported between 40 to 70 significant First Nations sites in the, central Pil in the Central Pilbara. They have fortunately now called a halt to that potential destruction, and I hope the next thing they do is pick up the phone to the traditional owners and say, let's talk about which sites you want to make sure are protected. It is crystal clear that our state and federal laws are fundamentally flawed. They fundamentally fail to protect and preserve cultural and uh, heritage values in Western Australia. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act has been a joke for years. My question is, why didn't the Minister for Indigenous Affairs in Western Australia take action? Why didn't the Minister for Indigenous Australians take action? Why didn't Minister Lay take action to stop this destruction? This has gone on too long. The clear message is to mining companies, you do not have a social licence to do this anymore, and to state and federal governments, get your act together and fix these laws. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise in this adjournment debate to place on the record in the Australian Senate my profound concern about the Victorian Labor government's treacherous decision to enter into a Belt and Road Initiative Agreement, or BRI, with the Chinese Communist government. I say treacherous, and that's a strong word, because that's exactly what it is. This is not just an agreement contrary to the foreign policy of the Australian government. It's contrary to the national interest, including on national security grounds. On the 30th of April, I was the first parliamentarian, state or federal, to call on Premier Daniel Andrews to cancel this agreement. And once again, in this place, I call on the Premier to rip it up and to put Victoria's interests ahead of China's. Today, Prime Minister Morrison told Neil Mitchell on Radio 3AW that Daniel Andrews has done the wrong thing. He should admit it and he should withdraw Victoria today from the BRI. 
We've got a mutual interest in making sure that we sing with one voice as a country when it comes to dealing with foreign nations and geopolitics. The Victorian Liberal National Opposition will axe this deal if elected in 2022, I'm very pleased to report. Last week, Premier Andrews made one of the most extraordinary statements in the Victorian Parliament. He said, I wouldn't agree with the notion that I might provide a lecture on a whole range of these matters whilst at the same time encouraging the Chinese to buy Victorian product. I don't think that that would be particularly conducive to more jobs or a stronger relationship. And if that is the mission of those opposite, to see less goods to less customers, well, we don't agree with that approach. And if the Leader of the Opposition wants to lead a human rights delegation to China or any other country and then try and do a trade deal at the same time, I wish him luck because I reckon he'll need it. So it very much appears that this Belt and Road Agreement has bought the Premier's silence on issues as important as human rights in China, including the terrible situation in Hong Kong with the imposition of Chinese security laws and the detention of more than one million Uyghur Muslims in so-called re-education camps, or more correctly, forced labour camps. But the irony, of course, of the Premier's human rights trade-off is that it has done nothing to deliver more exports to China. The shocking tariff hit on Bali exports is, in fact, a so-called breach of the BRI and, of course, causes enormous damage to Victorian farmers. The BRI has also done nothing to stop the messages that we are receiving that have been delivered to Chinese students and Chinese tourists that Australia should be avoided. And of course, our government has very strongly rejected that notion. That's because the BRI is all about financing the Victorian government's projects in exchange for ensuring that Chinese companies and Chinese workers are given priority access into Victoria. This will hurt Victorian workers. But what's so concerning is that we have no details of these deals and the impact that this will have on the Victorian economy. As we grapple with the massive economic and health challenges of recovering from the coronavirus pandemic, our economic sovereignty has never been more important. Our trading relationship with China is incredibly important. But as the Prime Minister says, we won't bow or trade away our values when it comes to being an open trading economy, including our position on our telecommunications networks, on foreign interference, on how we stand up on issues on human rights, on our positions on freedom of navigation. And we won't avoid asking the hard questions, such as leading the charge on an international inquiry into the cause and spread of the coronavirus. Make no mistake about it, the BRI is a foreign policy and economic strategy of the CCP designed to grow its power and influence across the globe. Even if Victoria can avoid debt trap diplomacy, as has occurred in other parts of the world, there will be a price to pay. China's Belt and Road Initiative is the wrong road for Victoria, and it's a pity that Victorian Federal Labor MPs, such as the member for Karangamite, do not have the guts to stand up to Daniel Andrews on this issue. They are happy to sell Victorian workers up the river, and I condemn this deal in the strongest possible terms. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Last but not least, I hope, the government's scheme to allow emergency access to superannuation is perhaps one of the worst public policy decisions in their sordid history. The emergency access scheme has been a disaster. 1.63 million Australians have withdrawn a total of $12 billion from their accounts, encouraged by the government, doing tens of thousands of dollars damage to their future retirement incomes. Research from the firms Alpha Beta and Ilion has found that Rather than a measure of last resort, 40 per cent of the people who applied for the scheme did not see their income drop over the course of the crisis. 64 per cent of the money withdrawn went to entirely discretionary items. 11 per cent of the emergency super release went straight into gambling. The government's haste in opening up workers' savings meant that they failed to consider 
that their program opened up the gates for organised crime. On the same day that the Australian Tax Office alerted the AFP to this fraud, what passes for the Minister for Superannuation claimed that the ATO has substantial checks in place to guard against fraud. Well, every Australian super account holder who has not checked their account should do it tomorrow. We have no idea what the real extent of fraud in this botched, ill-conceived, poorly executed catastrophe of a policy is. The harm done by the government to super already brings me to the Senator for New South Wales, Senator Bragg. His first speech to the chamber included a call to make superannuation optional for low-income workers. It would have done immeasurable damage to the retirement incomes for women. I note that Senator Bragg has released an entire book of his critique of the superannuation system. It's unwise to make predictions about the year 2020, but I predict this. It will be remainded before the year is out. It won't be on anybody's Christmas book list. It won't be read on beaches uh, across Australia. It will be lining budgie cages all over Wallara. Even his mates won't be able to credibly pretend that they've read it. It's one dis dishonest claim that's made in that book that deserves special attention. And it undermines any authority or credibility that he might have or that people who push the argument that he does might have. Senator Bragg is so determined to paint the union movement as an illegitimate vested interest that he goes as far as publishing these lines. Make no mistake, he says, industry super funds are on track to be the biggest political donors in Australia. They will be bigger than the CFMMEU and co. Except they're not. And Senator Bragg knows that they're not. He makes the claim over and over and over again. He's been provided with the returns from the Electoral Commission. The funds have written to him, setting out the truth of the matter. When I saw him make this outrageous, baseless and pathetic claim, I asked for research to be done to check. Industry super funds have made only two donations to the Labor Party in their history, a total of less than $25,000, mostly to attend events. These are a tiny fraction of a percentage of the donations that are made to political organisations. He knows this. He continues to make the claim. Um, what do you call a claim that is repeatedly made, where the maker of the claim knows it to be false, misleading, a dishonest attempt to pervert the public debate and to stigmatise honest people performing their work for not-for-profit funds dedicated to only one thing? building the retirement savings of their members. It is, of course, a lie. A lie, lie is not a big enough word to describe what Senator Bragg perpetuates in his book and in all the breathless accounting uh, in the newspaper of that book, and he should withdraw it, and he should not be taken seriously when he makes Thank contributions you to this debate. Thank you for your Senate stands adjourned, and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Oh, that morning you got